Arc 5, Stars What Make History Chapter 74, Fruits of the Battle for Pristella 1. The heinous witch cult, who captured the four control towers and threatened the city, have been thrown back. With this, the safety of the city is affirmed, the triumph is that of the Watergate city Pristella. Subaru heard the broadcast that resonated in the city along with Emilia as they hurried to the city hall. The cheerful announcement was transmitted through a magical device that conveyed the voice to the city. Although there were parts where the sound broke, it was only the fluctuation of the voice of the person making the broadcast. There was no reason to doubt the contents of the welcoming announcement. Amelia, Subaru. Just now they said. Subaru, so it seems. Somehow or other, it feels like it's over. In front of the bright-faced Amelia, Subaru relaxed his cheeks as he dropped his shoulders. The reason for his listlessness was out of relief, and a little bit of anxiety. Subaru, at any rate, it's cause the enemies are who they are. There was Capella of Lust, who possessed the authority of variation and change, in the worst-case scenario, there was the possibility of the broadcast voice being a ploy to cast false hope over the citizens. There was no guarantee they wouldn't go that far, and that malice was what made the Sin Archbishop so frightening. However, the voice of the broadcast, which appeared to be that of Kiritaka Muse, his statement was consciously respectful, he wasn't able to conceal his faint emotions and joy. Upon hearing that voice, one didn't have any reason to worry about being fooled by such wicked trickery. Subaru, that means, that everyone did it. The broadcast stated that the four control towers occupied by the Sin Archbishops had been recaptured. At least with this, it was safe to assume that the END where all the water gates would end up being opened, and the city would end up being both flooded and annihilated, had been avoided. On that point, they could be sincerely relieved. If there was one problem which made Subaru concerned, it would be the victims. Subaru, miraculously, Regulus didn't end up causing any casualties. Although they had a somewhat powerful lineup as well, their enemies were the Sin Archbishops with one or two peculiarities to them. The only reason they overcame the crusade against the invincible Regulus, was because he himself was lousy in battle. The cunning lust and wrath whose defeat he could not witness. And gluttony with whom he was connected by fate, calling them difficult enemies or threats was simply not enough. Even though they'd won, their damage, was frightful. Emilia, according to what Subaru said, there were also Sin Archbishops in the other control towers. All the others, I wonder if they're okay? It was Emilia's words that were accompanied by the same unease Subaru felt, who couldn't put on a joyful face. Subaru shook his head, biting his lip, in front of Emilia who had cast her gaze down. Subaru, I also feel troubled about that, but. All we can do is trust in the others. I want to confirm that they are fine as quickly as possible. Emilia, yeah, that's right. With such simple words of comfort, he couldn't dispel Emilia's distress. If they considered how powerful the enemies had been this time around, they couldn't avoid the possibility that there were victims among their allies. Still, it couldn't be said that the massive destruction to save the city was the result they had desired. Thus, although it depended on the circumstances, Taking into account using return by death as one of his options was a determination which Subaru had held ever since the start of this operation. Personally, Subaru did not like the strategy of incorporating his return by death. Of course, he was opposed to choosing his own death, but it was also related to the trial he had witnessed at the sanctuary, the world after Subaru's death. In fact, it wasn't known whether or not the world continued after Subaru's death, but the trials revealed that such a possibility existed, so Subaru had firmly decided that he would not use return by death to increase the number of attempts. Even so, if Subaru willingly chose return by death, it would be when the unacceptable result of having to continue with a loss awaited him. And this time, Subaru was considering such a possibility. Those who swore to recapture the city and challenged the Sin Archbishops, the royal candidates, their knights, and their allies. In order not to lose those he did not want to lose, he was prepared to repeat the pain and suffering. Emilia, Subaru, your brow is very wrinkled. Subaru, hair? Emilia was gazing straight ahead at Subaru who had a grim and serious expression on his face. 
she'd shot Subaru a look at his wrinkled brow, causing him to reflexively open his eyes up wide. As her amethyst eyes filled with gloom, Emilia spoke to him. Emilia, after all, no matter what you do, you still care. I'm sorry. Although it's a difficult time, thanks to those who captured me. Subaru, no, it's not Emilia Tan's fault. Even without Emilia Tan, it was necessary to defeat Regulus. If Emilia Tan hadn't been there, I don't know if we could have saved the brides. To save the brides from greed, they had to temporarily stop their hearts which carried the lion's heart. Emilia was probably the only one who could have done it from their existing lineup. Ferris perhaps could also have been an possibility. Without her, in the worst-case scenario, it would have been necessary for the brides to become sacrifices to defeat Regulus. Subaru, well, I didn't want to make that choice either, and Reinhardt wouldn't have allowed it. Even if it was a necessary sacrifice to face such great evil, he couldn't accept that. That young man, who was a bundle of justice, could never allow even a few sacrifices. In that situation, the affair with Regulus might not have been resolved so quickly. Subaru, or, I may have ended up dying halfway through if only I ended up getting involved. First of all, if Emilia had not been kidnapped, there was the chance that the formations of the teams to defeat the Sin Archbishops would have been very different, since no one knew what the right answer was, it was useless to think about. But, hopefully. Subaru, after we split up, Reinhardt went to the others. That will lessen the damage. That is what I want to believe. Emilia, yes, that's true. We have to make sure of that as soon as possible. In response to Subaru's reply, Emilia nodded with a serious look on her face. And, as he resumed his step towards the city hall next to her, Subaru gently placed his hand on his own chest. He felt that his heart was beating slightly faster, there, another concern that Subaru had apart from his preparation for return by death. The sensation of a strange black force callously curling next to his heart. It was a perverse impurity that slipped into Subaru at the same time that the death of Regulus was confirmed. Subaru vaguely knew the identity of that impurity. The witch factor. That so-called thing was probably the identity of the impurity that connected Subaru and the witch cult. Just after defeating Petelger's Roman A. Conti of Sloth, Subaru felt the same discomfort inside his body. The identity of the foreign force he felt was the witch factor, and the first person who had told him that was the witch Echidna. The witch factor had a profound connection to the Sin archbishops and the witches of Sin. And for some reason, it also affected Subaru, as if it was consuming him. If so, this was surely related to the witch of envy who induced his return by death. It wasn't something that could be considered positive. Subaru, no matter how many creepy things possess me, I'm me. That should be fine. No matter how much the influence of the witch factor increased, he would never let it affect him. Even if the witch factor consumed Subaru every time he took down a sin archbishop. Plus. Subaru, if Biko wakes up, she'll get mad at me for not having told her. No matter what the witch factor was, there was no need for Subaru to worry about it alone. He had companions who would work together with him to try to solve the problem when he confessed his concerns to them. He was sure he'd find a way to get over it. Emilia, Subaru? Did something happen? Worried about Subaru who spoke awkwardly, Emilia turned her glance to him. Subaru said no and shook his head, and after thinking a little. Subaru, by the way, while listening to the broadcast before, I think Kiritaka's doing all right. If she knew, Liliana surely would be glad. Emilia, Kiritaka-san disappeared? Subaru, he protected Otto and it was unknown whether he was dead or alive. For some reason it didn't feel like he was dead, so I wasn't that worried. Emilia, then cheer up more, or I'm going to end up feeling sorry for you. As if she were casting away the anxiety that hung over her, Emilia pouted at Subaru. Instead of being anxious about the possibility that someone had been hurt, he should have been glad that someone had been saved. Perhaps that was also a necessary attitude for his current state of mind. And so, 
The two of them rushed on trying to avoid triggering each other's anxieties as much as possible, but the scene that awaited them wasn't something optimistic. Subaru, this is. Terrible. Subaru was stunned to see that the city hall had collapsed and turned into a mountain of rubble in front of his eyes. The words that came from his dry lips gave off a candid impression of that scene. The city hall was a five-story tall building that was rare to see in the buildings of this world, but its greatness had crumbled without a trace. The marks of destruction extended as far as the foundations of the building, the center of the plot of land where the city hall had been located had been crushed enormously, the large sunken hole looked like an open mouth. This collapse likely wouldn't have happened unless the foundations of the buildings had received a major blow, Subaru made this assumption from the remains of the building, Emilia, who witnessed the same thing, gazed around with a restless expression on her face. Emilia, the broadcast from before, it should have used the magical device that is in that building, no? Yet, with the building in this state. Subaru, dash. Now that you say it, that's true. Faced with Emilia's concern, Subaru looked around his surroundings in a hurry. The collapse of the city hall was not an unimportant matter. It was undoubtedly the result of having been breached by the evil grasp of the witch cult. In addition to that, in the city hall there wasn't only the magical device, Otto and the others who did not participate in the groups to recover the control towers, and the victims of Capella's authority also remained. Since the city hall suffered so much damage, it meant that there had been a battle. If so, what had happened in the city hall where only the non-combatants had stayed behind? Kiritaka's transmission, even the fact of that matter had become suspicious, but, Subaru's concerns. Question mark colon R, the moment I think there's someone coming, it finally ends up being Subaru and Emilia, in fact. Subaru, Beatrice? The girl's familiar voice reached Subaru and Emilia who had frozen in their tracks. When he looked up, Beatrice was at the top of the rubble looking at the two of them as she walked down holding the hem of her fluffy dress. She went down to Subaru's side who opened his eyes in surprise, and looked at him from top to bottom to check the condition he was in. Beatrice, hmm, you don't seem to be injured, I'm relieved I suppose. If you'd been hurt while Betty was absent, I wouldn't have been able to leave you alone even to go to the bathroom. Subaru, I'm not a child who needs this much care. Or rather what I should be saying is, Biko, why are you here? Subaru was surprised by Beatrice who had crossed her short arms and held her head high with an aloof expression of composure on her face. That flippant attitude was exactly the same as always. Subaru, weren't you supposed to have spent all your mana and left the front lines? At least you shouldn't have been able to participate in this battle. Beatrice, spent sounds like you're blaming Betty, so stop, I suppose. If it wasn't for Betty's devotion, your leg would be a little thinner now, in fact. Your thanks, your appreciation, and your hugs aren't going to be enough, I suppose. Subaru, I know, I know. Subaru gently stroked the furious Beatrice's head the way he always did. Beatrice puffed her cheeks in dissatisfaction, but even so, she took a step closer to Subaru, quietly enjoying his caresses. And, following this interaction between contractor and spirit, Emilia gently butted in. Emilia, Beatrice. Beatrice, thank goodness, Emilia seems to be fine too, in fact. If something had happened to you, Bubby would have been distraught, I suppose. Thanks to that, Subaru risked fighting without Betty, in fact, if you've learnt anything out of this, don't let yourself be captured again, I suppose. Emilia, MHM, thank you. I'm sorry for making you worried. Beatrice, in particular, Betty was only a little bit worried for you, in fact. Emilia looked at Beatrice, who had moodily turned her face away, with a smile on her face. Then, Emilia gazed over Beatrice's entire body, and gently narrowed her widened eyes. An ornate dress, and carefully manicured curled hair. Both were slightly stained with mud and blood. This was the proof that this spirit girl hadn't just woken up from her peaceful dreams. Subaru's absence, and the collapse of the city hall. These unexpected events were surely related to Beatrice waking up. Emilia, dash. Emilia directed her gaze, 
which was full of such thoughts, and Subaru tucked his chin in. And, whilst looking down at Beatrice, whom he was still stroking, he said. Subaru, thank you, it seems like you were hard at work during my absence. I'm sorry about everything. I only ever cause you problems. Beatrice, I'm pretty used to you causing me problems, so you don't have to worry about that, I suppose. No, still do worry a bit about it, in fact. Worry about it, and give me your thanks, I suppose. Subaru, yeah, yeah. But, even if you were hard at work, it was a bit over the top. Crushing the entire building is a bit too much. Emilia, ha, huh, Beatrice did this. Emilia looked at Beatrice in bemusement whilst she pointed at the mountain of rubble. Emilia, do you know how much it'll take to repair a building like this? Subaru? Subaru, with Beatrice's pocket money, I know it'll be a big project that'll take a few decades. Beatrice, what are you two saying with those serious faces, in fact? What Betty did is different, I suppose. Betty saw this building only after it became rubble, in fact. Subaru, I said I know. If you'd struck it, we'd be able to hear it from really far away, such a cute girl. Subaru cackled as Beatrice tried to defend herself from the false accusations. To this exchange, Emilia said, A, A, which one is it? For now. If they'd encountered Beatrice near the remains of the city hall, then. Subaru, at least, it seems like we won't have to worry about the witch cult trying to get up to no good around here. So, what happened to Otto and the others who were supposed to be in the city hall? Beatrice, hmm, explaining that will be complicated, I suppose. But, those who were in the city hall are. Question mark colon we were able to escape as well, so ya needn't worry. A voice with a Kansai accent, or rather more accurately, a Kararagai accent jutted in between Beatrice's reply. As they turned around in response to that, they saw a petite figure which was walking around the mountain of rubble. For a moment, they felt something peculiar about that person's appearance, as the color of their hair that she was adjusting with a hand comb was of a different color than the one they were used to. Subaru, is that you, Anastasia-san? Anastasia, What's up with the doubt in the way you're calling me? A, ah, moose be this, right? It's cause now my hair color is different. Her soft light purple hair was now dyed dark green. Only with Anastasia and her kimono, did their impression change a bunch. She looked at Subaru and Beatrice, and then, when she looked at Amelia, she gracefully nodded in satisfaction. Anastasia, Seems like you were able to get Emilia san back without any problems, Natsuki kun. The sword saint told me, so I wasn't worried about that. Subaru, so Reinhardt was able to rendezvous with the others without any issues. Anastasia, he came whooshing out of the sky. Right now, he's looking for any stragglers from the witch cult. Or rather, I should say that he took Ferris san to visit the evacuation shelters. Subaru visiting the shelters. That sure is the duty of a healing arts user. Even if they'd repelled the Sin Archbishops, considerable efforts would be needed to repair the damages, which the city had received. Ferris' role would be quintessential for the quick recovery of the functions of the city. It looked like Reinhardt now was being used in place of Ferris' own feet to get about. Emilia, I'm sorry, I also caused him a lot of trouble. But, what happened to you, Anastasia-san? Like, with the color of your hair, or with this building? Subaru, indeed, indeed. Did you have a makeover to change your hair to a color which is more pleasing to the eye? I think it suits you as well, but when you know the original Anastasia-san, it feels strange after all. Anastasia, Natsuki-kun, you're pretty skilled at spewing out nonsense. However, I only dyed it for a lil strategy. Besides, it didn't pay off. On the contrary, it went bad as far as I could see. Anastasia sighed as she twirled her hair around her finger, and looked on at the remains of the city hall. From the words she was saying, it seemed like she was involved in the collapse of the city hall. Subaru, Ferris is fine, right? What happened, and what happened with the others? Anastasia, the story is simple, 
Not after everyone left to defeat the Sin archbishops, and even attack taken advantage of your absence. They screwed things up a bit. Subaru, it doesn't look like they screwed things up only a bit. It was clear that it had been a ferocious battle quite in contrast to Anastasia's lackadaisical tone. The attack on the city hall, a malignant trick that took advantage of the departure of the combatants, he felt like it was probably Lust or Wrath who had been behind this, however, the one he felt was most likely was. Subaru, was the one who came here Lust? Anastasia, it's as I'd heard, their personality was the worst. My encounter with them gave me the willies. Her opponent shouldn't have been so frivolous tantamount to only giving someone the willies, but Anastasia's attitude didn't show any signs of fear or shock. It took real guts to have encountered a sin archbishop. He wanted to flatter her with an as expected of you but more pressing than that, Subaru had something gnawing at his mind. Subaru, I'm sorry. We left the control tower, and after that there was a surprise attack on the city hall. I should have taken more care. Anastasia, don't worry about it. We Zhu did as we fancied whilst Natsuki Kun was missing. Moreover, it's embarrassing that we didn't get anything out of it. According to Anastasia's words, it seemed like she was expecting a surprise attack, that was what Subaru felt. She'd probably dyed her hair green as a strategy for that. When he thought to the relation between dark green hair and the person that Capella was likely interested in, he could vaguely understand the strategy they had devised. Subaru, Anastasia San, you dressed as Crush San and dangled them the bait, is that what you mean? If you turned back lust with just you and Ferris with that, then that'd leave us in a fix. Anastasia, it would have been cool if we did that, but we had someone else there. Priscilla San's esteemed knight. Subaru, Al. On hearing the unexpected name come out from her, Subaru widened his eyes in surprise. Al was the one who had been least interested in the battle to recapture the city. And to begin with, he was supposed to have gone with Priscilla and Liliana to defeat Roth. If he'd stayed to defend the city hall, the Roth capture team would be in a state which invited uncertainty and anxiety about their combat force and combination. Anastasia, just so you know, the team that faced Roth came back safely. Anastasia explained this to Subaru, who had doubt edged all over his face. Whilst giving a wry smile, she looked over in the direction of the control tower that Roth had occupied, and said. Anastasia, Priscilla San came back unharmed. The songstress Liliana came back along with her prince, to everyone's surprise. Subaru, her prince. Do you mean Kiritaka? Those two went to battle, and came back with a guy who we didn't know whether he was dead or alive, what happened? There were too many mysteries, like Priscilla coming back unharmed from the battle with Roth, and Kiritaka and Liliana reuniting. He would have liked to hear more details about that story, but he had to prioritize the general gist of things more than that. Subaru, can I believe in the broadcast from Kiritaka before? Anastasia, dash. Subaru, the recovery of the control towers were a success. What follows that is the status of everyone who fought? What happened to them? The city hall had collapsed, but they'd probably taken the magical device out from it. So, it didn't mean that he had to doubt the possibility that the broadcast was a trap. The other problem was that in the end, they'd only considered the damage to things from the start. And, to Subaru's question, Anastasia said. Anastasia, you needn't worry. Natsuki-kun, you and Yul were the last to come back. Subaru, we were the last ones, and what about the others? Anastasia, don't worry. Emilia and Beatrice anxiously watched along with Subaru, who was showing slight traces of impatience. In front of those three, Anastasia nodded her head whilst smiling, and said. Anastasia, everyone came back safely, not a single person was missing. And that was her response. Garfield, Captain. Ye yeah, came back safe. The nearest evacuation shelter had become the new rally point, in place of the city hall that had collapsed. A blonde boy came running and called out with a cheerful voice as he looked at Subaru and the others who had joined him. It was Garfield. Subaru, oh. Garfield. A. When he tried to raise his hand, 
he was surprised by the figure that came running. Though Garfield's upper body was naked, his whole body was covered in blood. Nonetheless, his expression was radiant, it seemed that he'd had a rather difficult battle, but it seemed that he had fulfilled his duty. Just by seeing that, Subaru immediately changed his expression from surprise to a smile. Subaru, Heya, it's you who doesn't seem well. Your face looks terrible. Garfield, I don't want to hear that from ya, Captain. I don't think that I can say that. But, it's ya Captain who showed his guts. Ye rescued Emilia Summer without any problems. Subaru, of course. When Subaru proffered out his fist, Garfield bumped his fist with his own. That was enough to honor each other's good fight. Subaru, but, I heard Lust showed up at the city hall. You, where and with whom were you fighting? Garfield, tis obvious, with the eight arms Kurgan. Although, I don't know to what extent he can be called by that name. Subaru, dash? What do you mean? Garfield, Ma Amazin self was fighting only with a dead body. Surely when he was alive he wasn't like Thar. That's why I don't feel like I won. It was a secret technique to manipulate the bodies of the dead and use them as warriors. There was no doubt that this time this secret technique was used in the secret maneuvers of the witch cult. However, it seemed that the warrior's capacity deteriorated compared to when they were alive. If he had been a warrior like Kvafiel, he may have been able to perceive that difference. Whether that had caught his attention, apart from the victory itself, it somewhat seemed like Garfield felt as if he'd failed to obtain the result he'd desired. That feeling, it was not something Subaru didn't know about. Emilia, the enemy wasn't strong, is that why you're down? Emilia, who had been listening to the conversation, tilted her head, as she didn't understand the feeling. At her words, Garfield first gave a good thing you're safe, glad that she was back, then he violently scratched his short blonde hair. Garfield, to be down cause he wasn't strong. That ain't it. Somehow, I can't explain T. Cause Emilia Summer's a woman. Emilia, it's something women don't understand? So, Subaru understands? Subaru, just a little, though. But, even for men there is something like an unknown barrier between the strong and the weak. But, I think the result is because Garfield is strong, aren't you overthinking this? Garfield, am I? Overthinking it? Emilia had a face that showed that she didn't understand, and Subaru's response wasn't entirely positive. At that, Garfield nodded with a sorrowful look on his face. Garfield already had his head full of worries in respect to strength. There was the question of having challenged Reinhardt to a duel, and also that later, he had received a painful initiation from the way of the witch cult. Even if he thought with his head, no matter how much he thought, the answer to his problem didn't come into view. It was possible that as was something like that. That was why, with regard to that. Subaru, hey, Garfield. If you think about it. Question mark colon o. There's Gar F. It's you you. Garfield, Gua. In front of Subaru who was trying to give him some advice, Garfield's body fell down with a loud thump. He barely noticed the little figure colliding against Garfield's waist, but his hand didn't come out in time to stop him from letting out a groan of pain, and tumbling down. He gazed at the collapsed Garfield, the one who sat on his chest who had fallen off guard, was a feline girl wagging her tail. The girl pricked her ears up as she put on a cheerful and adorable expression on her face. Question mark colon foo ha ha. You let your guard down, gar f. Your real enemy is in your heart. And within your heart, you already have important people in there. I mean, it's filled. Garfield, you're knocking and climbing at a person's chest. Mimi, he he he, Missy told Mimi. That slapping a man on the butt can attract love. Or something like that? Missy said that that is attractive or something. Slapping him on the butt is what Missy said. Mimi squealed with laughter, on top of Garfield. She was no longer in a state, where she was losing blood from her deep wound that couldn't be healed. Before the face of the girl who had completely recovered, Subaru touched his chest and bent down. Subaru, you look lively, Mimi. Mimi, oh, 
Oni San, welcome. Welcome. It seems like a lot of complicated things happened while Mimi was sleeping, good job. Mimi slept very soundly. But it seems that Garef also tried very hard, didn't he? Good job. Subaru, why you don't seem to have changed, that's the most important thing, isn't that right, Garfield? He had heard that Mimi's wounds had been inflicted from protecting Garfield. Garfield had been shook to the core from her wound that refused to heal and he'd carried her back on the verge of death. He wondered whether he was relieved to see Mimi better or not. But, at Subaru's call, Garfield, who was still sitting on his butt, rubbed his nose. Garfield, ha, T would have been problematic if I changed too much. I've said T many times, but making a fuss while you're recovering. Mimi, hum, what? Did you say something, Garef? Ah. Mimi, who brought her face close to Garfield's, raised her voice and glanced down at her own chest. Mimi checked the inside of the white robe, and opened her eyes wide with surprise. Mimi, Garef, this is terrible. Your wounds reopened. Blood is streaming out. Garfield, idiot. That's why I told you again and again. Damn it. If I don't bandage it gain and apply healing magic it won't heal. Aim here. Mimi, you kia. It howits. It howits. Due to the wound getting worse, Garfield took Mimi's hand, who remained composed, and took her to the inner part of the shelter. Faced with this exchange which was as noisy as a typhoon, even Subaru remained speechless. Amelia, PFFFFT. But, if Garfield stays like this, he may not have time to worry. But, next to Subaru who remained stunned, Emilia placed her hand on her lips and said that suddenly. Whilst gazing at the back of the two of them walking away, she referenced back to Garfield's prior worries. I see, thought Subaru, in agreement with those opinions. Subaru, despite everything, they make a good pair. Those two, that is. Emilia, Mimi is cute and it seems she really likes Garfield. It seems that Garfield likes Ram, so I don't think it's going to be that easy. Subaru, yeah, for sure. Wait, did Emilia Tan make a comment about love between men and women? Even though the example was easy enough to understand, Subaru was surprised that she could make that kind of conversation. Emilia, who even before Subaru's confession had been in a state where she didn't understand the love between men and women, had been able to comment on the love of others. Emilia, Humph, Subaru, I feel like you just said something really rude. Subaru, all right, though I'd thought that was an accurate recognition. No way, did Emilia Tan change without me noticing? And she's dressed in a wedding dress. Emilia, even though it's ended up very much in tatters. Due to the fact that it was difficult to move around in, she'd torn her wedding dress, it seemed like she didn't need to worry much about that around here. Beatrice, my my, in fact. They're a bunch of children, it seems like they only grew up in size, I suppose. Subaru, I don't want to hear that from you, who most resembles a child here. When Beatrice threw out her jape to recap things off, Subaru cleared his throat. Then, if Mimi had recovered, that meant that, he looked around the shelter in search of the answer. Subaru, dash. In a corner where there were people rejoicing at their reunion, he found the figure of the wizened swordsman standing in silence. Subaru held his breath for a moment at the figure of the sword demon who had his eyes closed in silence. Emilia, Subaru. Subaru, sorry. I'll be right back. Replying back to the anxious-looking Emilia, Subaru left both her and Beatrice there and slowly walked up to where he had pointed his gaze to. First of all, what should he call out to him? However, that worry ended up being unnecessary. Wilhelm, is it Subaru Dono? Subaru, yeah, it is. Wilhelm, who opened one of his eyes, caught sight of Subaru, who had approached him, hesitating on speaking out first. Seeing those silent blue eyes, Subaru realized that keeping his silence was pointless. Wilhelm was resting his back against a cold stone wall, blending into the landscape. Subaru stood beside him and saw his figure from the corner of his eyes. A figure full of wounds, 
that made him feel the echoes of a violent battle. There were traces of cuts all over his light garb without his jacket, his grey hair that he tied back had come loose and was flowing down his back, what looked more painful was the blood-stained cloth that was wrapped around the top of his right leg, that was enough to know that it was a deep wound that threatened his life. But what caught Subaru's attention the most, wasn't Wilhelm himself. It was the jacket that was right next to him which had something that seemed important wrapped inside it. Subaru, Wilhelm San, that's... Wilhelm, dash. He had tried to check what was wrapped up in his jacket, without giving it any thought. Receiving Subaru's words, Wilhelm directed his gaze to the bundle. The wizened swordsman kept his silence for a moment, and then moved his parched lips. Wilhelm, it's as you've guessed, it's my wife. Subaru, dash. Wilhelm, immediately after she died, her body turned into a pile of ashes. It would have been too wretched to leave her exposed to the wind this way, even though it's shameful that I put her in my jacket. Even if she's mere ashes, I want to place her in a grave, and mourn her. It meant that, the secret technique that moved the corpses of the dead, in the end, the corpses turned into ashes. It was a sacrilege towards one's soul after death, and the impact it had on the people who had ended up being the target of this secret technique was immeasurable. He couldn't even imagine what was going on in Wilhelm's heart when he thought about it. Wilhelm, I'm really sorry. It's a rather unmanly, meaningless attachment. Subaru, don't say it like that. Wilhelm, dash. Subaru immediately raised his voice on hearing Wilhelm's tone which sounded like he blamed himself. Whilst unaware that he'd gotten himself worked up, Subaru looked straight ahead at Wilhelm. Wilhelm opened his eyes a crack, and looked over at Subaru as well. Subaru, I don't think you're wrong, Wilhelm San, not now, nor back during the White Whale, you're an incredible person whom I respect. What's so wrong about appreciating the people you care about? There's nothing to be ashamed of, thinking like that is no good. Wilhelm, Subaru Dono. Subaru, you're incredible, Wilhelm San. Your wife. Placing her in her grave, mourning her, those thoughts are no mistakes. I can't really express myself well, but you are amazing. Those were his true feelings. Those were without a doubt Subaru's true feelings, his true thoughts that he didn't want denied. Back during the time of the White Whale, and during his sorrowful reunion now, destiny had been really cruel to Wilhelm. Yet even so, the sword demon had gone against destiny to his utmost, he traversed it with his own willpower, and tried to reach love. Not all results may end up being rewarded. His repentance and remorse may remain sempiternally. But, it should end well. Wilhelm's love in loving the one he loved, it all should end well. Subaru, it's nothing to be ashamed of. Please, duly place her in her grave. And, if the opportunity presents itself, and it's not too much of a nuisance, please let me visit her grave as well. Wilhelm, dash. Subaru, I want to do so, I think that's what a person ought to do. He wasn't wording himself well, and furthermore he was getting emotional, Subaru grew vexed at himself. In pushing his own egotistical feelings, he wouldn't be able to help it if Wilhelm burst into laughter. It would be quite natural for him to say that it was none of his business and refuse him. However, Wilhelm abruptly let his lips slacken before Subaru. A small gap broke through on his stiffened, tense face. And, he said. Wilhelm, yeah, please do, Subaru Dono. I also want you to dedicate some words to my wife, I think. If it's you. Subaru, dash. Why yes, I will. I'm honored. He'd gotten his permission, or more accurately, it was thanks to Wilhelm's generosity. After hearing Subaru's egotistical wish, Wilhelm let out a soft sigh. Guessing by his face that he didn't want to talk any more, Subaru bowed his head down. He should leave Wilhelm alone with his wife for a bit, but before leaving this place, he wanted to make sure of one last thing. And that was. Subaru, Wilhelm San. About your wife, um, did you manage to? Wilhelm, dash. Had he reached closure with her? Had he ended up reaching a result he didn't want? 
Naturally, confronting his dead wife couldn't have ended up acquiring a desired result. Even so, no one other than Wilhelm could have been permitted to face her, after having took in that situation, Wilhelm had sought closure. Thus, Subaru shouldn't be the only one who wanted that at least. Wilhelm, my wife. Wilhelm started to speak to Subaru, who had stopped in his tracks to look at him. But, his words stopped there. Wilhelm's gaze moved slightly away from Subaru. He directed his gaze to his jacket that had his wife's ashes wrapped up within. For a split second, a huge swirl of emotions floated through his irises. And, he spoke out. Wilhelm, yes. I exchanged words with my wife, and certainly, I said goodbye. Words, it was a figurative expression, most likely. Wilhelm's wife had been the prior sword saint, clashing swords with her, was a conversation like no other for the sword demon. Their blades of closure themselves should have been their final words of goodbye. That's why, surely that closure had been the result of Wilhelm's choice. Wilhelm, I love my wife. I should have gotten that across. Subaru, I see. Wilhelm's quiet confession of love. In contrast to the modest tone in his voice, there was a zeal which scorched the hearts of those who listened to it, and Subaru's chest grew hotter. Taking a deep breath, Subaru closed his eyes. Pouring out of him were raging billows of emotions. Keeping each one in check, he opened his eyes. Wilhelm, who was in front of him, had a lonely smile on his face. However, since he'd allowed himself to break into that smile, it felt as if he'd been saved, and Subaru too allowed his lips to relax. Subaru, Wilhelm San, thank you for your hard work. Wilhelm, dash. Subaru, perhaps, very soon everything will get hectic, I think, but until then please rest. I'll go around a little more to see what happened. Subaru spoke too quickly and wasn't sure whether the last words were right or not. He scratched his cheek with one of his fingers, and felt embarrassed as he turned his back on Wilhelm. Behind his back. Wilhelm, Subaru Dono. Subaru, yeah? As he was called while he tried to leave, Subaru stopped and turned around. Then Wilhelm, who had a slight trace of surprise on his face, immediately said no and shook his head. Wilhelm, my apologies. It's something trivial. Please don't pay attention to me. Subaru, is that so? No, when you say it like that, it makes me feel the opposite. But well, right, yes. I'll see you later. Subaru walked away from there, with a bitter smile adorning his face due to Wilhelm's atypical reaction, seeing what Subaru looked like when he returned. Emilia and Beatrice seemed to express relief on their faces. In that regard, Subaru's expression had probably changed quite a bit between the time he'd left and the time he'd come back. Subaru himself was well aware of that. Since reuniting with the dead was not something to be happy about. But at least Wilhelm ended it with his own hands, and he was satisfied with the result. He felt that that fact was a modest salvation. As he narrowed his eyes, the sword demon stared at the back of the dark-haired boy who walked away. His lips were firmly pursed together so to hold something back. It was a breakdown in his camouflage which until a little while ago had masked his real intentions with firm willpower. A frenzy of emotion which was likely to gnaw through his pursed lips if he were to disregard it, even now. Surely, what he kept hidden from that boy in his chest until then was. Wilhelm, Subaru Dono, you are. Only within his mouth, whispering in a hoarse voice, did the sword demon say the boy's name. Wilhelm, you could be, my. Having said that, the sword demon closed his eyes as if he'd closed off his own feeble heart, the continuation that made no sound was never heard by anyone. It was also something that would never come out of the mouth of the sword demon. That was the only thing, which the sword demon would never allow. Arc 5 Chapter 75, Fruits of the Battle for Pristella II After ending his conversation with Wilhelm, Subaru quietly felt relieved. Along with Garfield, the two of them that should have been tasked with Lust Dash, they were supposed to be the combination which should have had the most difficult fight. In actuality, 
Lust had abandoned her control tower, and it had been Wilhelm's wife, Theresia, along with the former hero, Kurgan, who'd ended up blocking their path. However, it was already guaranteed that there were no casualties in these three spots. Subaru, dash. Of course, Garfield and Wilhelm should have much to reflect on. In fact, Garfield had spoken about the reservations he had left, and it was easy to imagine that wounds too difficult to express in words lay within Wilhelm's heart, and yet, even so. Subaru was happy that the two of them had returned safe and sound after finishing up their battles. If there'd been casualties amongst his acquaintances, Subaru had resigned himself that he may have ended up having to use his return by death. That's why he was relieved that the two of them had survived without him needing to use it. However, that sense of relief from the fact that they hadn't ended up dying was connected with another conviction of his, at the same time. Namely that after all, he wouldn't have to once again depend on an unnatural power like his return by death. He'd made full use of his return by death, and challenged things many times to try and secure a better future. After depending so much on that power, at this point, maybe he could speak ill of it, however it was for this reason. It was a conclusion that only Subaru could reach, precisely because it was Subaru who had died many times, and each time, he'd overturned the future. To begin with, something like return by death should have been unnecessary. Surely there was a way to secure the future he wanted, even without his return by death. Like now where everyone worked together with each other for the same objective, so to secure that. Amelia, Subaru, was Wilhelm San okay? Coming out to greet Subaru, who had returned, Emilia asked about the wizened swordsman who had been standing in a corner of the shelter. To her words, Subaru jerked his chin into a nod, without looking back. Subaru, yeah, I think he's okay. He's wounded quite a bit, but... It seems like he managed to take care of the wounds within his heart, which were the most alarming. Emilia, I see. Although it's obvious, he really is a strong individual, isn't he? Subaru, indeed. He's a strong individual for sure. That's why he's okay. Subaru nodded his head up and down multiple times at Emilia, who told him that. Emilia opened her eyes up wide seeing Subaru's gesticulation, and then burst into a smile. Seeing Subaru frown at her unexpected reaction, she placed her hand on her mouth, and said. Emilia, I'm sorry. Subaru's behavior around Wilhelm San is really different in comparison to when you're with other people. How can I put it, in truth, I think he's pure as the driven snow. Subaru, no one says pure as the driven snow these days. Subaru gave a wry smile at Amelia's antiquated words which felt like they came from the Shoah era. Following that, he scratched his cheek with one of his fingers. Even if it appeared like he was teasing her, he understood what Amelia was trying to say. And that was plenty enough for Subaru himself to be aware of it. Subaru, Wilhelm San is, how should I say it, special. Because he's an amazing person whom I can sincerely admire, well, that's what I feel anyways. Amelia, I know that he's an amazing person too, but that being the case, Reinhardt and the others have to know that too, right? And yet, despite all that, Subaru, the perspective changes between someone of the same age and someone from a different generation. The disparity you feel with those of the same age has rather large implications on you that end up making you feel miserable. But, the differences you feel with those older than you can be set as a goal for yourself. Someday, when I'm a sullen old man, I want to be as imposing as Wilhelm. Emilia, hum, I jetcha. He he. If you say so. Emilia nodded with her face full of understanding, at Subaru's frivolous manner which he'd broken into to hide his embarrassment. Subaru felt defeated by that attitude. Speaking seriously about it, not even Subaru knew how he should express the deep emotions that he felt as words. Though, probably, almost certainly, he thought that it was a good thing that he didn't need to put them into words. Beatrice, Betty believes that growing out his beard wouldn't suit Subaru, in fact. Subaru, I didn't think it was this sort of conversation, but well, whatever, it's okay too, I'll grow out a beard when Biko deems it appropriate. Beatrice, well then, will such a time come, I suppose. 
The elaborate coexistence between furriness and adorable is an area that cannot be sustained without Bubby's elegance, in fact. Devote yourself to it, I suppose. Amelia, yeah, yeah, I say. As Amelia and Beatrice exchanged their feelings in a manner that was typical for them, Subaru, pointed his eyes over towards a corner of the shelter which had suddenly grown noisy. The evacuees who were gathered in a corner of the shelter, all of the individuals that were there had been released from their fear and unease that had been born from the city being occupied. However, they had inexplicably cheerful looks on their face. And that was because... Liliana, Welthen, Welthen. Allow me to sing again. Please listen, to my new song, The Burning Song of the Flaming City. Subaru, that racket is Liliana, huh? There was a short, young girl with brown skin in the middle of that kerfuffle. He could see the lively figure of the bard strumming her liolaya, shaking loose her blonde hair. Her appearance caused an unmistakable impact, it had an originality to it that shot out Askew that he didn't think even lust could imitate, it was Liliana without a doubt. Beatrice, she's a truly strident girl, in fact. Amelia, but, Liliana was one of the people who fought against the Sin Archbishops too, right? Um. I can't imagine at all how she managed to fight. Taking notice of the same thing as Subaru, Amelia and Beatrice relaxed their shoulders too. If she was acting so lively, then no doubt Liliana had made it back alive with no injuries as well. Her, and the other's place of battle, their battle against Roth was a place which he couldn't imagine, neither the strategy nor the fighting strength needed, or the most proper result. Subaru had already considered the possibility that Liliana's song would have been useful for confining Sirius's authority, however, he didn't know how they'd been able to put it into practice in reality. He was specifically determined in wanting to hear what on earth had happened in their place of battle. Subaru, it won't be easy to get close to Liliana right now. Let's postpone it for later. Amelia, yeah, besides, now is definitely the time where Liliana's songs are most necessary. Us taking that away wouldn't be good. Let's postpone talking to her until much later. Beatrice, I agree, I suppose. Betty would like to pass on talking with that irritating girl, in fact. Subaru and the others made this conclusion whilst they watched Liliana strumming out a tune, singing at the top of her voice with utmost passion. In reality, if they only took into account her singing voice, she was worthy of the title of songstress. He concurred with Emilia's opinion that right now the city needed her. Question mark colon dash. When he looked, Kiritaka's figure was right next to Liliana, as she gave her performance. His expensive suit was covered in mud and blood everywhere, and there were also traces of rips left on it. It was the outcome of having fled through scenes of carnage, and according to Otto's story, it had been unknown whether he was dead or alive. Subaru, no one's ought to have had a comfortable scene of battle. Taking note of Subaru's gaze, Kiritaka bowed in his direction. Subaru waved at him, and started to walk further into the shelter once again, in search for the next of his companions. Then, Beatrice, who was walking right next to him as he broke into a walk, said. Beatrice, it's not too important, but it was that man that woke me up when I was sleeping, I suppose. Subaru, Kiritaka? Beatrice, that man even went as far as crushing some of his precious great magic stones, in fact. Betty doesn't care if it was down to his sense of responsibility, or if it was for someone, I suppose. But, that's what happened, in fact. Subaru, I see, I see. That's great, Biko. You did well to say it. Beatrice, Humph, I suppose. Having heard this story that help had come from this unexpected source, Subaru stroked Beatrice's head. Beatrice puffed out her cheeks, seemingly in dissatisfaction, but it went without saying that this was just a facade. According to the story he'd briefly heard from Anastasia, Beatrice's actions after she'd woken up had also been an indispensable contribution in regard to the current results. If it had been Kiritaka who'd played a role in that, then it could be said that he'd fulfilled his duty corresponding to his role as a city executive. Emilia, Subaru. It seems like those who got injured are in the furthest part of the shelter. Emilia, who was looking towards that part of the shelter, 
told Subaru that as he chatted away with Beatrice. When he looked towards the dingily lit area pointed out by her, there in the middle of the bustle, was an area that was being used as a field hospital. There were mats and blankets spread out directly on the ground and several injured people were laying there. This was supposed to be the first place which Ferris visited, so even though the people lying down hadn't completely recovered, their lives probably weren't in danger. Subaru, does that mean that treating so many people to their full is difficult, even for someone like Ferris? Beatrice, it doesn't matter how skilled you are at healing magic, there's a limit to the amount of mana a person can hold, in fact. If you go around healing everyone you see, then you'd run out of it pretty much at once, I suppose. It was a wise decision, in fact. Beatrice, who had replied, looked faintly vexed as they gazed at the rows of the injured. Even though she hid it on the surface, she was a tender-hearted spirit, whose feelings ran deep. Beatrice's healing magic was quite effective, even if it didn't even get close to Ferris. But, even if we were to say she had any mana, the quantity which Subaru supplied would never get anywhere near that. It was inevitable that she was vexed, and lamenting her lack of strength. Amelia, in truth, I would also like to go around helping everyone with my healing magic, but... Subaru, you have another role, Amelia Tan. That's why for now, you need to put that aside. Amelia, yeah, I know. If they let themselves be carried away by the emotions of the moment, they wouldn't be able to reach their goal, and would end up losing everything. Subaru called out to Amelia so she'd restrain herself, and as they walked in between people who were groaning in pain from their wounds, they searched for their companion amongst them. And soon after, they were able to find the guy they were searching for. Question mark colon Natsuki-san, over here. Subaru, Heia, Otto. In the last row of the injured, there was a person who waved his hand. Noticing the young man's familiar figure, Subaru and the others approached him with a sense of relief. Lying on a ready-made bed, with a faint smile on his pale face, was the proud warrior grade head internal affairs official of the Emilia camp, Otto Suwin. Otto, though now, it feels I was given an evaluation that I really can't let by. Subaru, that's your imagination, warrior grade internal affairs official. Once again with you, it's the same old story wandering around the city seeking blood, in search for foes. You love doing that don't you? Otto, soon there's going to be strange rumors again, won't you stop with these completely false claims? Instead of a greeting of reunion, Subaru exchanged jokes with Otto who was lying down. Otto shouted and dropped his shoulders in resignation, and Subaru crouched beside him to check his condition. He didn't seem to have lethal injuries, but both of his legs looked painful. Emilia, Otto Kun, how's your wounds? Otto, it seems that walking will be a little bit difficult until I have recovered, but apart from that there's no visible trauma. When it comes to situations, Amelia Summers should have been more difficult, it's rather too pathetic of me that I'm severely injured. Amelia, that's not true. It's proof of having fought with all your strength, isn't it? Otto Kun's job isn't to fight, so it's good that nothing terrible happened to you. Otto, so far, Amelia Summer is the only one who has decent common sense regarding the work of a head internal affairs official. Amelia, eh? Before Otto who murmured deeply, Amelia tilted her head with a confused look. Putting that aside, Subaru asked Otto for an explanation of the situation in which he got injured. Initially, Otto was supposed to stay at the city hall, and await the reports from various places at the rally point. Subaru, the injury isn't because you got caught in the collapse of the city hall, right? According to what Anastasia San said, those who stayed at the city hall were Anastasia San, Ferris and Al. Otto, I don't know exactly what the three who remained did. When I left the city hall, through the waterways of the city, I bumped into gluttony. That's why I ended up like this. Subaru, gluttony. That bastard. Damn, there's also lust, how much more do they intend to mock us? Subaru's heart started boiling once again when he heard the name of his despised enemy. The wickedness of the witch cult altogether had derided and undermined everything which they'd set up from their predictions. Their behavior in ignoring the control towers was a mockery towards those who had gotten onto the stage. Otto, fortunately, 
thanks to Felt Summer and the people of the White Dragon Scales, we managed to oppose them somehow. However, without the help of Beatrice San, I don't know what the outcome would have been. Beatrice, despite us outnumbering them, I couldn't bear to see it, in fact. Emilia, yes yes. Thank you very much. Emilia gently stroked Beatrice who had puffed out her small chest. That exchange was pleasant, but what interested Subaru were Otto's actions. Leaving aside the result of the meeting with Gluttony, and why he left the city hall in the first place. Even if he had been out of the formation to intercept lust, he should have stayed in the shelter and nothing more. It shouldn't have been necessary to leave the shelter and walk through the city. Otto, there was a request from the witch cult. The priority of obtaining a certain book. Guessing Subaru's doubt, Otto spoke quietly. The book which the witch cult had requested, he spoke about it rather hazily, probably as a consideration that Emilia was listening in behind Subaru. Subaru nodded at his concerns. Subaru, the one that's with the restoration specialist, what's his name? Otto, it's Mr. Darts. No one should know that it was commissioned to be restored by him, but, to make absolutely sure, I tried to collect it. In the end, I encountered gluttony before I met up with Mr. Darts, and this is the result. He understood the reason why Otto had left the city hall and walked about the city despite the threat of the witch cult. Again, it looked like he tried to fill an area which Subaru hadn't been attentive about. He hadn't thought thoroughly enough about the attack on the city hall, and the recovery of the Book of Wisdom. Subaru, at least consult with me first, we're friends right? Otto, Emilia Summer was kidnapped, and you also carried the fate of the city on your back like a hero, did you want me to put another annoying burden on top of that? I'm sorry. But I didn't intend to pressure my friends with these stupidities. Subaru, K. Though he'd intended to joke around, he'd unexpectedly ended up reciprocating with happy words, making Subaru grunt. Seeing their exchange, Emilia and Beatrice exchanged glances and gave a deep sigh. Beatrice, these guys aren't honest, I suppose. Emilia, I think it's normal for them. But, then, that book. It'd be better if we collected it. Um, whereabouts? Subaru, ah, I'll take care of that. Or I'll get Garfield too. Emilia Tan doesn't have to worry herself too much about that book. Emilia, yeah? He didn't want to let Emilia get involved much with the Book of Wisdom. It had backwards compatibility with the Gospels, and was also a sort of relic that a witch had left behind, not bringing it near to Amelia as much as possible was one of Subaru's silent resolutions. Subaru, but, those who met Gluttony were Felt and the White Dragon Scales, right? Leaving aside the mercenaries in white, Felt didn't end up hiding somewhere? Amelia, but, I can't really imagine that girl staying quietly in one place, perhaps. Subaru, I agree with that. Felt and the others had arrested Reinhardt's father, Heinkel, and he'd heard that they were standing guard over him. Therefore, they shouldn't have participated in the recapture of the control towers, although there was probably no one to communicate that decision to. Subaru, so, Felt is? Otto, she was exhausted, but she didn't really have any injuries like these. She came rushing out of the shelter now, to pick up the subordinates she'd brought along. Subaru, Tun Chin Kan, right? I heard about that, it seems like those guys are doing surprisingly well, a trio who had both a good and a bad impression, but none of that remained. They had an acquaintanceship where he'd been killed once by them, but instead of taking revenge someday, he'd tried to leave it in the past. In any case, it was a good result that he was able to confirm the safety of that camp. After that, they would take care of the task related to the Book of Wisdom, so the next issue was. Otto, Natsuki-san. Be careful in the next shelter. Subaru, in the next shelter. Otto said that to Subaru, who was immersed in his thoughts, in a low voice. To the turbulent emotions which had been put in his voice, Subaru's voice also naturally lowered in response. Otto gave a small nod on hearing Subaru's reaction. And. Otto. One of the Sin Archbishops is being held there. Question mark colon what's this, is it you, commoner? 
How dare you show your wretched face in our presence? That impudence is worthy of admiration beyond all. He'd left the shelter which had been made into a field hospital, and headed to the next shelter following Otto's words. Compared to the former shelter, the scale of that shelter was quite small. If the previous shelter was like the parking lot of a shopping center, this shelter was like a bicycle parking lot at best. Immediately after he'd gotten the vague impression that its purpose, even if it was a shelter, was probably different, the woman in red who'd set herself up at the entrance of the building spoke that out to him. The woman's name was Priscilla Bariel. Among the royal election candidates which had gathered in the city, she was someone who lacked a cooperative personality completely. Even so, even someone like that was undoubtedly a reliable ally in this situation. In addition to that, it was Priscilla who was in charge of the unknown monster, Sirius of Wrath. The ability to destroy that threat ever so splendidly, and make it back was a result that had to be praised sincerely. Subaru, that you don't like my face is your personal subjectivity, so that's okay, for now, good work to the both of us. I'm relieved that you came back safe. I'm not flattering you. Priscilla, mine personal subjectivity is the aesthetic sense which has to be respected the most in the world. It's not even worth evaluating what you have to say. Well, it's fine. However, there are no words you can say in defense for your blindness in saying safe upon seeing myself. Subaru, ah? Are you injured or something? Priscilla was sitting on a chair at the entrance of the shelter, fanning herself. Looking at her upper and lower extremities, he couldn't find any injures or anything like that. No, it wasn't about injuries or not. Priscilla's white skin didn't have a single scratch on it, even the dress she wore didn't have a speck of dust or dirt. If there had been any differences before and after the battle, it would have been regarding her neck accessory and that her hair had come loose. Amelia, your necklace and hair clip, have you lost them somewhere? Priscilla, hum. So even a commoner with such an undiscerning I will take notice of it if it's a woman? Even though I don't like that boorish way of calling it a necklace. It seems to bring resentment. Subaru, that you weren't safe, in reality, you were talking about your accessories. To Amelia's naive and innocent words, Priscilla snorted in response. Certainly she'd now lost her luxurious gem-encrusted necklace, as well as the hair clip which kept her orange hair in place. The aroma of her charm had increased when she'd let loose her hair that was normally held in place, what a sinful woman she was. To being with, Priscilla's radiance was rather like that of a poisonous flower. If you approached, you'd end up getting stung. Subaru, so, I'll pass on getting stung. Why are you bothering to stay at this shelter? I didn't think you had such an admirable personality as to volunteer to keep guard. Priscilla, foolish japes. Mineself shouldn't have to engage in these kinds of jobs that commoners do. It isn't my actual intent to be in a place like this, but I cannot allow others to gaze upon mine sense of beauty now. So I avoided the public's gaze as a compromise. Besides, Al insisted. Subaru, I think he'd try to quickly deny that if he were here. Whilst he imagined the exaggerated motions of denial from the iron helmet, Subaru directed his gaze towards the shelter's entrance. He didn't catch any glimpse of said iron helmet, but he'd heard that he was in this shelter. In other words, he wasn't outside, but rather, inside the building, next to the Sin Archbishop. Subaru, is Al keeping guard inside? Priscilla, tis so. We don't know what an evil thing like that would get up to were we to leave it alone. Hence why Al is keeping guard over them. When it comes to him, he ought to do a good job. Subaru, you didn't think he'd try to kill them. That's unexpected. Priscilla, he can do so he wants. Mine self wouldn't stop him. Had she felt bored answering him? Priscilla yawned whilst covering her mouth with her fan. That seemed to be her way of expressing indifference at Subaru's question. She had no intention of stopping him if he entered the building. Subaru gazed at the entrance of the shelter, and placed his hand on his chest where his heartbeat had gotten slightly faster. Amelia, Subaru, if you're scared to go in, you needn't force yourself to. Beatrice, indeed, in fact. I don't think we'll get anything out of it, I suppose. 
Emilia and Beatrice both gently expressed their opinions to Subaru who'd stopped in his tracks. He felt like he wanted to let himself be coddled by their concerns. However, as soon as that thought popped into his head, he noticed Priscilla's cruel gaze looking over at him from the corner of his eye. It was a gaze that regarded all of Subaru's doubts and hesitation as a boring farce. Whether he went forward or backward, Priscilla's evaluation of Subaru likely wouldn't change. For Subaru, who'd still been given the lowest evaluation that was completely unsparing, that he did not care about. He didn't care about it, but he regretted that the two who were with him had also been evaluated that way. Subaru, I'm going. In any case, it isn't a problem that I have to escape from. Emilia and Beatrice, dash. Subaru made up his mind, and the two of them didn't give their opinions for or against it. They just stood by his side, so as to respect his will. Then, with the two of them accompanying him, Subaru stepped into the dark shelter. Priscilla wasn't even looking at their backs anymore. It was rather like her, he would say. With the parched pitter-patter sound of their footsteps, they moved forward into the stone building. Soon, they could see the end of the passageway, ahead of the path which turned to the left. Question mark colon is that you, bro? I heard the princess voice, so I thought she was talking with someone. Crouched down in the passageway, carrying his blue dragon sword on his shoulder, the iron helmet, Al was awaiting them. When he saw Subaru and the others heading towards him, he turned his attention to Emilia. Al, oh, it seems like the Miss too is all right. Good work, bro. Subaru, it's cause Emilia Tan's well-being was my minimum requirement for victory. Moreover regarding you, I've heard you ran into many problems. Priscilla's irrationalities in particular were crazy. Al, ah, you're being completely serious. Still, I too was wondering what was going on with her this time. Well, no, I'm almost always wondering what's going on, so I've got no persuasive power. Emilia, but, it doesn't seem like you dislike that? Al, dash. Al, who had grumbled out something like a complaint about his mistress Priscilla, was hit right on the nose by Amelia's innocent words. He couldn't see that which was concealed behind the helmet, but he felt like he'd shaped his lips into the form of A on the other side. TL note, to make your mouth in the form of A is basically describing him frowning, as you can well see, from the Kana itself. In practicality, he was a man that was always dragged around everywhere by Priscilla, and despite that he still wanted to be her servant. He supposed they had a relationship that others wouldn't understand. For a little while, Al twisted his neck in an environment which felt like it had devoured him, he clapped his shoulder with the ridge of his blue dragon sword and abruptly directed his gaze towards the back of the passageway. Al, it's a little bit late for you having come this far, but... Did you come to speak with the Sin Archbishop? Beatrice, do you think there would be another purpose, I suppose? Do you think we'd bother coming to chat with the guard, there's no way we'd waste our time, in fact. Al, this little girl sure is scathing, huh? Don't get yourself so worked up, Biko, was it? Beatrice, dash. Before Beatrice's cold, sharp gaze, Al deliberately shook his head, keeping Beatrice in check, who seemed like she was about to grab him, regardless of their difference in height, Subaru glared at Al who'd started this unnecessary provocation. Subaru, I more or less get that you're upset, but please, don't provoke her. Biko, you too, don't fall for them. Deal with it with the dignity of an adult. Beatrice, Betty will only allow Subaru to call her that way, I suppose. The next time you call me like that, extremely terrible retribution awaits you, in fact. Al, yeah yeah, I understand. You couldn't be any colder. As he spoke, I'll move to the side of the corridor, and made way for them. A door came into view ahead of them when they moved further into the passageway. Most likely, the Sin Archbishop was locked up in there. Suddenly, the back of Subaru's neck started to tingle, complaining out of a tense feeling. Al, the Sin Archbishop is within. They're being restrained so that they can't get up to no good, so for now, I don't think it'll end up becoming a massacre. Also, I'll give you just one piece of advice. Subaru, advice? Al, bro, the miss and that spirit too. 
It'd be better if you went back home without talking to them. Nothing good will come from getting involved. Leave this be, and go back home. Subaru, there's just no way we can do that. Dropping the tone of his voice, his opinion was an earnest one which he spoke with a serious voice. Denying those words with a shake of his head, Subaru replied that he couldn't do so, and rejected his suggested. And, to Subaru's reply, Al spoke out I guessed as much, with a sigh. Al, no matter what I say, I don't think I ever get much credibility. This time, my behavior here was in the wrong, I ain't got any excuses for it. Subaru, that's really not the reason why. Well, it's true that you weren't cooperative, but that doesn't mean I'm saying I won't listen to you. Don't get the wrong idea. Taking into account Al's terrible words of self-castigation, Subaru pointed at the door at the end of the passageway. The task he had at hand with the person within, was one that was Subaru's problem only. Whether his intentions had been transmitted, Al sat down with a plunk on that spot. And, whilst he pointed to the door at the end, only with his head, he said. Al, I hope you don't lose sight of yourself whilst you speak. Subaru, okay, don't hesitate to help me if something happens. Al, if that comes to pass, I'll send in the princess, so no matter what happens, she'll send them straight up to heaven. Exchanging a final conversation, Subaru and the others said goodbye to Al and headed towards the door. There was something drifting about that made them feel a strange sense of oppression in regards to the door which lead to the closed room. Having arrived here, even if it was trying, he couldn't avoid it, and so with that determination, Subaru grabbed the doorknob and forcibly pushed the door open. It was a narrow room in which the air flowing in it smells of dust. Its light source was small and dim, even for a shelter, it only had the bare bones. It was a narrow room that could fit at most five or six people in it, if you jam-packed it, the lack of air could be felt inside it. And, in the middle of this room. Question mark colon aha. So you came, my dear. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Thank you. On top of an old chair, with her whole body completely bound by chains, was that monster, Sirius was awaiting them. Arc 5, Chapter 76, Fruits of the Battle for Pristella 3 Arc 5, Stars What Make History Chapter 76, Fruits of the Battle for Pristella 3 The Sin Archbishop of Roth A bandaged monster who claimed to be the wife of the madman, Sloth. Sirius Roman A. Conti had her entire body tied up with the chains that had been her own weapon, and she was locked up in a room of the shelter without being able to move about. Sirius, I was bored because no one came, nor would they come close. But, they went to call you, my dear. Thank you, I'm sorry. Thanks to everyone, it seems like we can have a happy reunion. Even though it seems like there's some nuisances as well. On having seen Subaru enter the room, Sirius's voice called out in greeting. However, the final part of her words were filled with an intense anger towards Emilia and Beatrice. Subaru, dash. As always, it seemed like Sirius was mistaking Subaru as a body that was possessed by Petalgeurs, or something like that. Of course, it was just what she wanted to believe. Whilst overwhelmed by the monster's powerful gaze that radiated with madness, in which she had clearly lost her marbles, Subaru shrugged his shoulders so to mask that, and said. Subaru, you're quite composed for one who's captured. I don't know if Priscilla thought to try and capture you on some whim of hers, but we definitely won't be releasing you safely. Sirius, even if you say that, they can't get rid of me either so easily, right? Thank you, I know you care about my well-being. But, I'm sorry? You took the trouble to worry, but that makes no sense to me. It's like that, isn't it? With this peculiar thought, Sirius interpreted Subaru's threat as a positive. The monster kept its quiet posture on the chair, and only let its slightly cracked voice quiver. Sirius, so long as there's love to think of others and want others in everyone's hearts, no one can deny me. It's the same even for that prideful girl. Subaru, your authority shouldn't have worked with Priscilla and Liliana. It's not like there's no one capable of hurting you. Sirius, but that isn't you. Whatever doesn't come from you yourself, no matter what it is, ultimately makes no sense to me. 
Thank you, I'm sorry. Subaru, TCH. He gritted his teeth at Sirius, who had relaxed her bandaged lips into a smile. It seemed like a conversation had been established, but in reality, there was no mutual understanding between them. The resolute values within Sirius didn't accept even a modicum of external stimuli. The more it struck him, the more the stricken Subaru got hurt. Beatrice, Subaru, it's pointless, in fact. It's meaningless to expect human emotion like introspection or empathy from such people, I suppose. These guys are nothing but malevolent, in fact. Sirius, spirit in the form of a girl, don't you get closer to my precious Petalgeurs. When Beatrice pulled Subaru's sleeve, who was clenching his teeth, Sirius bluntly began to take a sullen attitude. Beatrice snorted her small nose to the words of that monster, and tugged Subaru's arm even closer to her. Beatrice, that's too bad for you, I suppose. But Betty belongs to Subaru, I was needed here, and here I am, I suppose. Don't you call Subaru by that disgusting name, in fact? You don't even know the true meaning of holding that name. Sirius, don't get carried away, little brat. That person's side is the place which I snuggle up to in heart and flesh. Don't you dare point your mistaken, arbitrary devotion to that person. I'll set your backside on fire, burn the inside of your belly to cinders, and turn you into fertilizer for the odd lagna. Emilia, both of you, don't get worked up and start fighting. It'll make me angry too. When the stormy atmosphere was created by Sirius and Beatrice, the intervening Emilia's gaze became sharp. He was in a situation where he was surrounded by three women, being pulled by his arm, but Subaru didn't have the liberty to joke about it right now. Such was the strong feeling of oppression he felt in his soul by being next to Sirius. He wasn't sure if it was caused by the authority that monster possessed. Subaru, Amelia, Beatrice, step back. Perhaps she'll just talk with me. Although, regardless if there's someone here or not, it's doubtful if it'll happen. Amelia, what? Subaru, please. This is an unexpected chance to speak with the witch cult. If it wasn't for this situation, he wouldn't have had the opportunity to sit down and talk with the witch cult. Emilia let out a sigh at Subaru's request, and both she and Beatrice exchanged glances with each other, they took a step back so as not to interfere with his conversation with Sirius. Then, Subaru, who'd been entrusted with this situation, turned to face the bound monster once again. Subaru, as you wish, I will speak with you. So, you've been making your chains to creak since a while ago, stop moving. If you slip free from your bindings, we'll be forced to beat you down. Sirius, you two have your standpoint. I understand that. It's fine. These chains won't come loose or break so easily. Thank you. The captive Sirius was delighted with Subaru's attitude, who had tried to converse with her. It didn't imply that Emilia and Beatrice's figures were out of sight, but it seemed like she'd completely expelled them from her notice. Sirius, so, what should we talk about? Because of your relation with me, there's hardly anything to say between us. Dot we can just exchange love, don't you think? Just kidding, I'm sorry? Subaru, your purpose. Yes, your purpose. The purpose behind why all of you sin archbishops attacked this city at the same time. You don't need crap like the book or the artificial spirit. At least, we know quite well that all of your purposes weren't really to steal them. Serious, it's a misunderstanding that we didn't really intend to. Though, it's certainly true that I personally didn't want them. I don't know about the other guys, but I was just following the gospel's description. Subaru, the gospel. That again? It was the same with Petalgeurs as well. Why do all of you follow that strange book? Petalgeurs followed it as well. And as a result, he lost his life. The Gospel's description showed the path of the future that an owner must follow, even knowing such circumstances, it wasn't omnipotent, that much was clear if he thought about the final moments of that lunatic. Subaru knew that the path of the future which could be seen was not absolute. Yet even so. Subaru, why does the witch cult follow exactly what the book says? Is it because that book will help with the resurrection of the witch? Of your beloved witch of envy? Sirius, 
Please don't misunderstand, darling. Subaru, misunderstand? Sirius's emotions of joy suddenly disappeared from her voice on hearing Subaru's accusatory voice. Whilst the monster looked into Subaru's eyes with her glittering eyes, on her face which was wrapped in bandages, she twisted her lips so to bare her yellowed teeth. And then, she spoke. Sirius, you're the only one I love. The only one. I don't care about the witch. Everything are just necessary things to get to you. Subaru, dash. Sirius, the other Sin Archbishops are similar. All of them have worthless, insignificant, repulsive desires, and merely cling to their authorities. For me, my only reason is love, and for my beloved dear, it's different. I'm sorry. It's different in every way. The witch cult's purpose was the resurrection of the Witch of Envy. Subaru had believed without any doubt that it was so, considering Petelgeur's Roman A. Conti's behavior and utterances, and in addition, the creed and acts of barbarism he'd heard about the witch cult up until now. However, that principle, the very reason for the existence of the group known as the witch cult had been shaken here. Of course, Subaru had also met Regulus Corneas, and they'd exchanged words too. As soon as he thought about whether that conceited, egocentric man, who'd looked down on everything besides himself, was going to idolize the witch, his sense of incongruity became stronger. Now that he mentioned it, it was obvious. The more he thought about, the more he could come to a better conclusion. But, if it was like this, then what purpose did the witch cult have in existing? Subaru, then, why the hell are you all in the witch cult? Dot. Sirius, because you're in it. Subaru, dash. Sirius, that is my sole reason. I'm here to exchange my love with you. I don't know about the others. If we become one, I think you'd understand. Becoming one, in brief, probably meant melding their hearts with each other with the power of her authority. But that wasn't understanding, it was forced conformity. It wasn't possible to call forcing a heart against its will by binding it to the same emotions a way of understanding each other, let alone becoming one. Subaru, what are the purposes of the other Sin Archbishops? What is the ultimate goal of the witch cult? Sirius, well, who knows? I'm sorry. Regrettably it's something that doesn't interest me. Subaru, in general, where does the witch cult meet? Is there anyone who leads it? Sirius, no. Especially with such established routine. You know it too. Whilst still putting on a crazed smile underneath her bandages, Sirius avoided Subaru's question. No, she probably didn't even intend to dodge it. The monster was going to sincerely answer in a monster-like way to her husband, Petelgeuse's questions. Due to her behavior so far, there seemed to be no doubt that Sirius had an abundant devotion towards Petelgeuse, on top of her dependence. In other words, just like the monster had stated, she really didn't know anything. Sirius, even so, after all, it's like that? Subaru, dash. Sirius grumbled that out whilst looking at the pensive Subaru from below. Subaru reacted a little slowly to the frigidness of those words. The monster took advantage of the momentary gap that was born from it. The small chair creaked as it tilted, and Sirius' face drew close to Subaru's visage. Her bloodshot eyes stared at Subaru, who'd held his breath reflexively, from close up. Sirius tilted her chair, still bound up to her ankles, and balanced herself up using only her toes which hung barely free. Her body fell forward with an injection of momentum so to lean against Subaru. Subaru, oh. Sirius, I'd thought something was strange ever since the time we reunited back at the clock tower, but I was so sure. The passion of that day is nowhere to be found in your eyes. My dear, are you being swallowed? Subaru, dash. Sirius, you're being eaten up by a soul by a body which was supposed to be a temporary abode, and you've ended up unable to move about. Really, you're such a useless person without me. Sirius's long tongue suspiciously licked Subaru's cheek as she breathed out a fevered sigh. Feeling the rough tip of her tongue on his skin, every single hair on Subaru's body stood on end. A growing sense of discomfort erupted within his chest, and the back of his eyes became dyed in deep red. 
It was crazy to think that this phenomenon had simply been caused from her vile action. It was crazy to think, but he didn't feel like he could consider anything else. And then. Amelia, Ice Brand Arts. Sirius, G.H., F.H.H.H. The blow of an ice hammer came swooping diagonally and hit Sirius's body, who had been clinging to Subaru, and launched her to the back wall along with her chair. The sound of an impact was raised, and Sirius, who had received this icy blow defenseless to stop it, fell down. Dust blew up across the narrow room, and bits from the ceiling came pattering down. Subaru, oh, oh? Standing next to Subaru, who had ended up falling on his knees, Amelia dematerialized the ice hammer she'd created. Subaru, who'd been slow to notice that it had been Amelia who'd let loose that blow without any forewarning, let out a long sigh. He really couldn't comprehend what had happened during this moment. Beatrice, Subaru's such a big idiot, I suppose. Subaru, TCH. Biko? Amidst the impact and the parched sound, Subaru blinked, noticing that his cheek had been slapped. The one who'd struck his cheek was Beatrice, who'd nestled up close to him. She looked at Emilia out of the corner of her eyes, and said. Beatrice, if Emilia hadn't interrupted that now, Betty would have done the same, in fact. You were too careless around someone like that, I suppose. In the worst case, she could have ripped your throat apart with her teeth, in fact. Subaru, dash. Subaru became aware of his own carelessness thanks to Beatrice's words. It wasn't an exaggeration or something he could laugh at. In reality, Sirius had licked Subaru's cheek with her tongue. Putting to one side the repulsiveness of that action, if that tongue had been a fang, and if instead of his cheek, it had been his neck, Subaru wouldn't have been able to stop it. Emilia, don't try anything strange. I'm a little scatterbrained, so I can't hold myself back very well. The next one will surely be a really painful blow. Emilia declared that she didn't intend to go easy, whilst keeping her guard up against the collapsed Sirius. Sirius was completely bound, such that she wasn't able to move about, the excessive precautions they'd ended up taking against this opponent who was kept as a prisoner in this state was proof of the monster's fiendish being. It seemed like he'd forgotten about that in front of the threat of its authority, however, this sin Archbishop of Roth stood out from the rest, even in looking at its combat strength alone. At a first glance, one would think that the strongest in the witch cult was Regulus the Invincible, but in reality, since greed relied entirely on his authority, his threat had been low. A strength that didn't depend on an authority, along with the threat of an authority, in this sense, the other sin archbishops were way tougher than Regulus. Beatrice, Subaru, you should have already known this, I suppose. You won't get anywhere, even if you talk to this person, in fact. She's not the type that you can have a proper conversation with. I don't know what she knows, but even if you wish to get something out of her, you aren't going to be able to have a sane conversation to find out what she knows, I suppose. Subaru, if it's impossible to converse with her. Beatrice, pose the queries to her body, what I mean is torture, in fact. Though that isn't something which Subaru should do, I suppose. It's something which the kingdom does sometimes, after having caught someone, in fact. Beatrice tugged at Subaru's arm so to get him to stand up as she expressed that cruel point of view. Torture, Subaru felt an undescribable feeling of uneasiness in regards to that word. Along with death and brutality, they weren't words which were heard or spoken in his everyday life. Although he didn't know the reality of it, with how much such gruesome things were practiced, if they were within reach of their imagination, he understood it. Along with the anguish of the people who were exposed to that. Subaru, I don't think it's what they deserve. Subaru's mentality wasn't so naive to believe that human nature was fundamentally good. He didn't think that everything had to end up with death when it came to settling a battle, the thought of wanting to finish things up without killing as much as possible had always been in his nature. That was a moral value which he brought in from his original world, and that in itself was a naivety which Subaru couldn't detach himself from. But, even so, there'd always been a conclusion that had stepped past the boundaries of those morals. He would have preferred to finish things up without killing if he could. In the end, that thought meant that he would have to kill his opponents that necessitated it. 
that had applied to both of the Sin archbishops, Petelgeurs, and Regulus. And it would be no different when it came to the other Sin archbishops, Sirius, Capella and Alphard of Gluttony as well. He felt hatred, and a lust for revenge. But in yet a different part to that, there was an intent that had determined that those guys were people he would have to kill. Subaru, I'll be excusing myself from talking with you any more. When we separate here, I probably won't get another opportunity to talk with you. I don't think that's a pity, nor commiserable. But, hurry up and spit out what you have to say, and then you can rest in peace. That'd always be helpful. Telling someone to die right to their face had brought him a difficulty breathing. Subaru said merely that, and made a motion to leave the room since there was nothing else left any more. As Beatrice had mentioned, if they wanted to try and get information on the witch cult from Sirius, they had no other way but to pose the questions to her body to get more out of her. That was a different task, one which Subaru could not do. When Subaru showed his intention to leave, both Emilia and Beatrice's faces broke into relief. Both of them had been against entering the room from the start. It was a regrettable situation in that they'd just been put in a foul mood without gaining any results. However, thinking about it in a positive light, it had become clear to them that the way those guys thought was incomprehensible, it seemed they should be content with that. Subaru, dash. There was no telling what would have happened if he'd gotten close. Subaru and the others made their way to the entrance without bothering to lift Sirius back up, who still lay toppled over thanks to Amelia's blow. It definitely wasn't a laudable attitude, but, with that. Sirius, dash. Subaru, wait up. Subaru stopped in his tracks due to an unpleasant sensation that grated against his skull just when they were about to reach the entrance. Then, he looked down at Sirius who was lying on the floor. The source of that unpleasantness came from over there, from the collapsed Sirius. The monster was lying on her side, breathing crudely from her nose whilst pressing her face against the cold floor. Her breathing was so awfully ear-piercing that it had drawn his attention to her. Just before leaving the room, he'd realized that she was humming. Subaru, stop that song, what are you trying to do? Sirius, dash. She was out of tune, her pitch and rhythm were both in a state of chaos. This dissonance didn't come to a stop there. It was nothing else but a declaration of Sirius's intent in regards to Subaru's words. In other words, a refusal, a rejection. Subaru, I told you to stop. This song is grating through my head. Sirius, dash. I'm sorry. Ah, but songs sure are great, aren't they? They taught me that songs are wonderful. That's why I wanted to try and sing all of a sudden. Subaru. Liliana? Sirius should have heard the song when she squared off against Priscilla and Liliana. He had no idea how her song had sealed her authority during their fight. In the midst of battle, the monster hadn't hated the song, and she'd learnt something of it. However, the monster's understanding of the song definitely was of different strokes to the feelings which Liliana had put into hers. Hers was something more eerie, and distorted. Subaru, don't compare her song with yours. Yours is different, it's something else. Sirius, I could say the same about you. You're different. You've changed. You're definitely different from that person whom I love. Even if you're the same, you're different. Swabru, huh? Sirius, Petelgeurs is inside you. Soul and soul will melt together, flesh and flesh will become one, and like that, that beloved person will surface, though, it will take some time. What I ought to do is help that. To see that person waking up, by your side. Still collapsed on the floor, Sirius twisted her neck and looked up at Subaru. An endless swirling storm of emotions surged up in her crazened eyes. Anger, joy, sorrow, and a longing that she couldn't conceal, all continued to swirl in Sirius's eyes. Sirius, I'll drag that person out from inside of you. Thank you, I'm sorry. Please, until that day comes, take care of your mind and body. Subaru, TCH. Sirius certainly understood that Subaru and Petelgeurs were different things. She should have understood that, 
but yet the monster hid under a convenient fantasy, i.e., overwriting him. Petelgeurs, who slept inside of Subaru, would someday come out to greet him, she'd said. There's no such thing. That would be impossible. It was likely true that Petelgeurs's which factor that he'd taken in was inside him. However, there's no way that safeguarded Petelgeurs's spirit. From where did this monster find these similarities between Petelgeurs and him to have repeated such bullshit? Or was it that Subaru and that lunatic had some similar parts when seen from the outside? Sirius, one last thing, I'm going to give you some advice so that you don't end up doing something unnecessary. Subaru, advice? You, to me? Sirius, yes, so that I don't lose my beloved darling. Be careful around gluttony. Bizarre eating, gourmet and satiation will eventually try to snatch you away. If that happens before he wakes up, no one will end up being able to remember my darling. Subaru, dash. From the place he'd least expected, Roth had mentioned the name Gluttony and given him information on them. Although, the content itself wasn't anything unusual, it was just information which he already knew, but, no. Subaru, wait. Gourmet, and who else? Sirius, gourmet, bizarre eating and satiation. Being eaten and taken in without anyone noticing what was lost is an act of barbarity against love which must melt together, blend together, and become as one. If you get the chance, please kill gluttony. Since they're a bother. She revealed that about the sin archbishops who were in the same position as her, and what's more, she'd indifferently wished for their death. It was great that in this case there was a fatal discrepancy in the relations between the top brass in the witch cult. The issue was what Sirius had said about gluttony no, about the gluttonies. Subaru, I totally thought that the gluttony which Otto came across was the gluttony who was in the control tower, since they'd been prowling about like lust, but, dot. What if that wasn't the case, and it was just one of the gluttonies from the two additional ones? What if all of the three gluttonies were lurking in the city? and it hadn't been just that one. And what if the gluttony in charge of their control tower had continued to protect its post? Subaru, TCH. Shit, I need to make sure. Subaru clasped his head in dismay at his own stupidity, he kicked the floor and headed towards the entrance. Now was not the time to continue talking with Sirius. Subaru had to make sure with his own eyes the safety of everyone who had participated in the battle to defend the city. He had to make sure that no one had disappeared due to their names being devoured by gluttony. Subaru, Emilia. Beatrice. Go straight back to the shelter we were at before. I've got to make sure of something. Emilia, Subaru? I don't know what's blown into you, but calm down. Subaru, when this is over. I'll calm down all you want. I'll calm down, so please let me do what it takes for me to calm down. It's something urgent. Subaru hurriedly replied that to Emilia who had touched his shoulder. Emilia gulped seeing Subaru's behavior, and then nodded saying I understand. Beatrice, who from the start hadn't intended to interject in Subaru's behavior, looked shocked. Subaru had already forgotten about Sirius, and had hurriedly jumped out of the room. Emilia, wait up, Subaru. I'm coming too. And so, Emilia hurried after him, and both of their footsteps moved away at a quick pace. As she listened to them, Beatrice turned her head back when she was at the door, and looked at Sirius, who was still face flat to the floor, and then pointed her palm at the monster. Beatrice, to tell you the truth, it's not like I don't think turning you into smithereens here would be proper, I suppose. Sirius, so, why don't you do so? Spirit Hall. It'll be most welcome for me if it speeds up that person's awakening. Beatrice, dash. Beatrice let out a sigh at the provocative Sirius's manner of speech, and then lowered her palm. The little girl held the hem of her dress with the hand she'd lowered, and her eyes became filled with strong emotion. Beatrice, if you make Subaru sad, Betty will definitely kill you, in fact. Sirius, of course. My beloved Petelgeuse's resurrection should just be welcomed by emotions of joy. It was uncertain how much she understood, or if she was done here or not, but regardless of that, the doddering conversation ended, and Beatrice left the room, 
closing the door behind her. Just before she did, Sirius's distorted hum slipped into Beatrice's eardrums. A harassment and severity of sound that grated against your sense of hearing with its distorted rhythm like trampling the concept of music underneath it. A completely new kind of music that planted unpleasant feelings in others, it was the music of resentment. The door was closed, and the music of resentment was cut off, but, no matter where she was, that distorted rhythm remained in her ears. Beatrice chased after Subaru and Emilia at an adagio pace whilst tasting that unpleasant sensation. After leaving Sirius's prison, Subaru rushed over to Al who was waiting in the corridor. Al, who'd been on standby, his blue dragon sword held in his hand, was taken by surprise by Subaru's threatening attitude who'd stormed his way over. Al, hey, bro. I heard a super loud noise, you didn't kill her, right? Punching and kicking also counts as prisoner abuse, so they ain't things you can really praise. Subaru, I didn't kill her, afterwards I'll give you a proper explanation about the prisoner abuse, more importantly, I need to check something. Al, no one died where you were, right? Al, dash? Well, if you're asking about the whole city, I don't know. But at least, me, the cat-eared sis, bro, and the miss with the Carrara guy accent are all fine, I thought you already knew? Subaru, I know, but... Ah, shit. I won't get anywhere this way. It was natural that it had been an inconclusive answer. Following with Subaru's concerns, if there had been someone who'd ended up as a victim of gluttony, that person would have disappeared from others' memories, like Rem. In that situation, asking is there not a person you don't remember? Made no sense. The easiest way would be to tell Al and Amelia everyone's names, one by one. Subaru, TCH. That was scary, that was terrifying. Although it wasn't the time to cower, it would be terrifying to hear it from someone's mouth. It would be much more reassuring to go back to the shelter and check the safety of everyone with his own eyes. Subaru, I'll go back to the shelter. Please don't take your eyes off until Reinhardt comes back for whatever reason. Al, all right then, but... Well, no. I won't ask the details. Gives me the chills. Shaking his hand, Al didn't question Subaru's true intention behind his behavior. Subaru went back through the passageway whilst avoiding considering, rather, thinking unnecessarily about problematic things, and left the shelter. Looking at Priscilla from the corner of his eye, who seemed bored as ever, that's the second one, he counted. Priscilla, ha. Commoners sure are of small caliber, hence why your hearts get perturbed by such trivial things, it's such a big issue. If you're going hither and thither, at least focus your attention like you're sightseeing as much as you can. Subaru, that you haven't changed doesn't relieve me one bit. See you later. Not having time to stop, Subaru quickly passed by in front of Priscilla. It was a manner, or rather, a disrespect which could have fouled Priscilla's mood, but she didn't say anything about it and only muttered how boring. Whilst fanning her skin. Emilia, so Subaru, what do you want to do? What is it, that you have to make sure of? Returning back to the shelter full of the injured, Emilia called out to Subaru who was restlessly looking around. To her call, Subaru hesitated for a moment on whether to ask for her help. Thinking about Rem's case, Emilia didn't have any resistance in regards to Gluttony's meals. Subaru hadn't forgotten the shock when he'd learnt about the loss of Rem's name from her mouth. He'd resigned himself to the possibility of that wound reopening once more, and he'd the courage to explain the situation to Amelia. Because this was an unconscious blade which Amelia couldn't take into account. Subaru, dash. Till now, Subaru had confirmed the names of several of his companions who'd fought in the defense. Beatrice and Anastasia first. Then Garfield and Mimi were added to that, then Wilhelm and Otto, Liliana and Kiritaka too. Felt's being was confirmed too from Otto's words. According to the girl's story, Reinhardt and Ferris should also be fine. And Priscilla and Al who he'd been with just a little while ago. In other words, it wasn't yet possible to check the safety of. Question mark colon Subaru, it seems we met up safely. Subaru, Reinhardt? 
A refreshing voice called out to Subaru, whose thoughts were spinning around rapidly, from his side. When he turned around, there was a red-haired young man, who had raised his arm in greeting to him, it was Reinhardt. It had been only a few hours that he'd met up safely with him, who after Regulus' defeat should have gone around to provide reinforcement to the other camps. Nevertheless, now that he was looking around for his acquaintances, he felt honest relief in being able to see his face. Reinhardt, it's a relief that both Emilia Summer and Beatrice Summer also reunited safely. Emilia, thank you, Reinhardt. You should have been running around the city, right? Thank goodness you're all right. Yeah, truly. Reinhardt, no, it's no big deal. Besides, even without me, everyone fulfilled their roles steadfastly. My modest power was only a little bit useful. Reinhardt replied politely back to Amelia, and then looked at Subaru. Reinhardt narrowed his sky-blue eyes, and as if seeing through to the depths of Subaru's heart, he said. Reinhardt, so, Subaru, did something happen? Right now, you look like you're flustered, Subaru, right now I want to check if something happened. Reinhardt, have you met with Felt? Felt, and the others. Well, Larkins and the others, that is. The trio of Tun Chin Can, now that it had come to this, they also belonged in the framework of comrades. He'd heard from Otto that Felt was fine, he'd also heard that her servants were fine, but that didn't mean he'd mentioned the names of the three servants and confirmed them. He wasn't able to feel relieved. To the desperation of Subaru's question, Reinhardt gently placed his hand on his chin, and said. Reinhardt, yeah, they're fine. Felt Summer, those three, Larkins, Gaston and Cambly are all safe and sound. Larkins and Gaston have injuries, but they aren't so serious enough to worry. In regards to Felt Summer having acted independently, I think she will have to reflect on this later, don't you? Subaru, there seems to be a pretty big chance that our internal affairs officer was saved thanks to Felt, so do take that into account, I beseech for a lenient punishment. Dot anyways, there wasn't anything else in addition. Reinhardt, anything else? Subaru, anything else? No, sorry. It wouldn't really be a specific question. So um, after we separated, did anything happen? Any problems, or anything that worried you? Even if he thought about it again, he still didn't have a specific question to ask, Subaru felt miserable. However, Reinhardt didn't laugh at it, instead he quietly mulled it over and shook his head. Reinhardt, no, my apologies, but nothing is coming to mind. Nothing particularly problematic happened after I left you and Emilia Summer. That I think. Subaru, I, see. My bad. It isn't that. Well, um. Yeah, there's a lot I'd like to talk to you about, so when you can, won't you gather along with Felt too? I'd like to consult with the people involved about what happened now, and what comes after. May I leave that to you? Reinhardt, dash. Sure, since it's a request from you. Right now, I just asked Felt Summer to stay quietly in the standby area once again, so it'll probably sound sarcastic to her, though, Subaru, yikes that's bad. Afterwards I'll apologize as well, so for now, I'll rely on you. Giving a wry smile at Subaru's words, Reinhardt looked around his surroundings a little, and then quickly left the place. When he jumped out to the outside of the shelter, you could barely see his figure which was leaping over buildings in one bound, he would soon meet back up with Felt, it seemed. The problem was. Emilia, Subaru, Ferris is here. You want to hear his story, right? Subaru, hm, ah. Yeah, I also wanted to talk to Ferris. Called by Emilia, he looked at where she was pointing at. There, he was able to find the figure of Ferris, who was restlessly letting his gaze wander to and fro, in a corner of the shelter. The cat-eared healing arts user was staggering about, and his complexion looked awful. Most likely, it was the result of his healing voyage that he'd been taken on by Reinhardt. By freely using his healing magic, it seemed like he'd sustained a considerable burden. Even so, he was walking around looking for his next patient without resting, or it didn't seem like that. Question mark colon R. Ferris, 
who was looking around his surroundings, noticed Subaru and Emilia, and raised his voice up. He hastily tottered over to them, and caught a hold of Subaru's scruff of his neck as if he was going to collapse. Propping his light body up, Subaru called out to him with an hey. And then. Ferris, tell me. Subaru, huh? Ferris, the Sin Archbishop. They were caught, right? I'm going to make them spit out everything they know, I'm going to find out how to treat Crush Summer. So, tell me where they are. Subaru was paralyzed by Ferris' gaze which glared at his right in front of his wide-open eyes. Ferris' fury was like that of a raging fire, he was only concerned for the well-being of his beloved mistress. And if it was to save her, he was prepared to show no mercy to those who know how to make that possible. Subaru, Fay Ferris, calm down, I understand your feelings, but the result won't come even if you hurry to do it. For now, let's talk. Ferris, don't say what's convenient. You understand my feelings? There's no way you do understand them it seems. Whilst you speak so calmly, you know how much Crush Summer is suffering. If you'd understood, you wouldn't be able to remain calm. Stop being so irresponsible. Subaru, dash. Having been jabbed in the chest, and a finger pointed at him, Subaru kept his mouth shut. Having been attacked by irrational comments, Subaru couldn't even reply back. Crush's condition hadn't changed, she was still infested with Capella of Lust's blood. But more than anything, Subaru felt relieved by Ferris' comments just now, realizing that he hadn't forgotten Crush. That black corrosion had also set itself into place in Subaru's right leg and the palm that he'd touched Crush with. But there was no way that would bring relief to Ferris' heart. Ferris, I have to save Crush Summer. I can and will do everything that is necessary for that. If I have to torture the Sin Archbishop, I will do that too. I know how to cure people. That's why, even if I break them, I can heal them. That's why, that's why. Question mark colon Ferris. That's enough already. Subaru couldn't say anything to Ferris who was burning in frustration. And then, the one who'd called him from behind him to stop, was the wizened swordsman who couldn't stand to see this situation. Wilhelm called out to the knight, who served the same mistress as him with a voice which was devoid of all emotions. Wilhelm, I fully understand how you feel. But, this behavior is nothing more than an insult to crush Summer, more so than anyone else. First calm yourself. Do things after you calm yourself. Ferris, you're saying you understand how I feel like as consolation. Wilhelm, I understand. Wilhelm forcibly stopped him in his tracks with a low tone of voice when Ferris had tried to flare up at him. And then, Wilhelm looked at the jacket which had the ashes wrapped within it, which he'd hugged against his chest. Ferris immediately bit his lips, his face guessing immediately who it was that slept there. Ferris, it's not fair. It's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair. Old man Will. Wilhelm, I know. It is poor of me to impose on your generosity and kindness. Forcing that on you, who opposes the pain of others more than anyone else. You should blame this old man. Ferris, you are you, you are you are sob. Ferris held back his tears and hung his head down. Wilhelm embraced his head and nodded at Subaru. It looked like it meant that he would take over. Ferris too would have to face the conference later in place of Crush again, when he calmed down. It would be necessary to discuss the handling of Sirius then. But for now, what they should do is exchange words so that they know each other's conditions. Wilhelm's serene eyes communicated that to Subaru. There was a pitifulness that depended on that, Subaru bowed his head, and left the place. Subaru, Wilhelm San, must want to cry too. Why did everything go wrong? There was no way to have achieved joy for everyone, acquaintances and strangers. How much did Subaru have to fight, strive and try in some way to choose the best option, to arrive at that outcome, it was something that he did not know. He had recently confirmed the safety of Reinhardt and Felt, and also Ferris and Crush. The ones that remained missing were Julius and Ricardo who had gone to recover the control tower of Gluttony. In addition to that, Priscilla's page, 
Schult, and although an unpleasant person, Heinkel. Speaking of which, Julius' younger brother, Joshua, ever since the problem started, he'd always be. Subaru, ah? Just when he was thinking that, Subaru saw the shadow of someone watching the shelter from the outside. He wore well-tailored white garb, and had a slender night sword holstered at his waist, a handsome, and tall profile, along with lustrous purple hair that was almost flashy, there was no way to mistake him. It was Julius. Right now, the guy he wanted to check the safety of, was here. Subaru, hey, Julie. Julius, dash. He quickly lifted his hand up and raised his voice to try and greet Julius, who had let half of his body peek through. But, when Julius noticed that Subaru's eyes were looking at him, he quickly turned around and left. He tried to leave the shelter at a fast pace. Subaru, ah? Faced with Julius' unexpected behavior, Subaru let out a stunned voice. That reaction was completely unexpected. His opinions had been divided in respect to whether Julius would have obediently replied to his voice, but even so, he would have never imagined this reaction. It wasn't an obedient answer or sarcasm, he simply ignored him. Subaru, is that bastard kidding me? Having spouted out all the irritation that had been boiling within so far, Subaru chased after him. It wasn't that he was worried. It wasn't that he was worried, but he was looking for him to confirm his safety, he shouldn't have had that attitude. What was he up to? He had to catch him and find out. It was necessary to mention that this was not the time to joke around. Emilia, hey, Subaru? What's going on? Subaru, that pretentious bastard Julius was there and ignored me just now. I'm going to go get him. Emilia, eh? Leaving behind Emilia's voice of surprise, Subaru ran and chased after Julius. After he jumped out of the shelter's entrance, he saw his back which was about to disappear beyond the street. They were clearly movements to avoid the gaze of the public. However, if he wasn't running, it'd be easy to catch up with him. Subaru, if you're okay, just hurry up and say you're okay. As if he was condemned, Subaru ran to the corner of the street. With one walking swiftly and the other running, the distance inevitably shortened. As soon as he turned around, he was able to see his back, and Subaru raised his voice. Subaru, hey, you bastard. You, why the hell are you running around when everyone's so busy? If you don't show your face you'll cause concern. No, it's a general opinion. Julius, dash. Upon hearing Subaru's violent voice, Julius stopped. Julius turned his face only, and calmly gazed at Subaru with his yellow eyes. Subaru frowned at the silent glance, but Julius did not change his posture. Julius, my apologies. I was looking for someone, but it looks like that person wasn't inside. I'd like to make my way to another shelter. If you'll excuse me. Subaru, wait 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 wait, what are you saying? What you're looking for? surely has to be Anastasia-san, right? If so, I was in that shelter. You just didn't realize it because you were impatient. It's not like you. Julius, TCH. He called out to the back of him as he tried to leave after he left behind merely words of courtesy. Then, Julius showed a dramatic reaction to Subaru's words. He made his shoulders spin and turned around with a surprised face. Subaru, E. A.A.? What's up? Subaru reflexively reacted with a shrill voice. It seemed obvious why. Julius' expression, as he turned, was tinged by an astonishment he had never seen before. No, astonishment wasn't the only thing in his expression. What was there was a gleam as if he had been clinging onto something. Faced with that emotion that didn't suit Julius at all, Subaru didn't know how to respond. As he saw Subaru like that, Julius gulped and with an expression of anguish. Julius, Subaru. You, are referring to me? Subaru, what kind of question is that? You don't have a personality unimposing enough to forget you in just a few hours. Finest night, Julius Euculius San, what nonsense are you? Shrugging his shoulders, Subaru responded as if making fun of Julius. And in the midst of that exchange, 
he stopped talking when he realized his own stupidity. Beatrice, Subaru. Don't run off on your own. Subaru, whose throat had frozen, and Julius opposite him. Both Emilia and Beatrice had come chasing him and joined the scene of the two facing each other in the street. When they saw the two looking at each other in silence, their large eyes flickered. Emilia, well. You're in the middle of something, right? As she noticed the strange atmosphere and tension, Emilia anxiously tilted her head. Subaru felt a bad presentiment at her reaction, especially from her gaze which was looking at Julius. Thus, Subaru pointed to Julius. Subaru, yes, that's right, but it's not that. Emilia Tan. Biko you too, well. Emilia and Beatrice, dash? Emilia and Beatrice raised question marks at Subaru's awkward words. He had to do something, probably a definitive question. Subaru swallowed his saliva, and took a glance at Julius. Before Subaru's gaze, Julius prepared himself and lifted his terribly hollow face. Subaru, I found Julius. So, I can take him to the conference, right? Beatrice, Julius. Upon asking, Beatrice gazed at Julius. Then, Emilia spoke doubtfully in a low voice. Emilia, Julius San, is he an acquaintance of Subaru? And, as if to repeat the nightmare of before, she said that. Arc 5, Chapter 77, A Nameless Night. Receiving the jolting impact, his body got out of the dagger's trajectory dot. Not being in a position to sharpen his blade, and even if he did accept it with his broken knight sword, he would not be able to evade the severe wound. Was the conclusion that anyone would realize at a glance, henceforth, Julius was able to notice that he was being shielded. However, it was, again, a different subject whether he should express relief or gratitude for it. Julius, Ricardo. Ricardo, shit, he got me. H.K. With an anguishing voice, Ricardo, who had pushed Julius aside, narrowed his eyes. When he called out that name, at the same time, a spout of blood clouded Julius' vision. The blood had sprouted from, the rough, bulky right arm of Ricardo having lost everything from his elbow, it was a gash exposing the soft cross-section. The arm covered in bestial hair gave rise to a sound and fell onto the cobblestone, and the big hatchet it was gripping, too, made a dull sound and rolled on the ground. Julius, how did such? H.K. Ricardo, arg. This ain't the time for saying that, Julius. Raise your head and look tower arts. At Julius, who was breathing heavily, Ricardo slammed a loud yell. However, that was abruptly obstructed by the attack of the dagger he suffered on the abdomen, and his nose was smashed and broken by the solid knee's direct hit. Throwing him aback, and as Ricardo flopped onto the floor, with his limbs stretched out, Gluttony sneered. Roy, ha ha Tilda. Aren't you going to, completely say it Sue? Julius, H.K. The form of Alphard, who was shouting out his delight, and Ricardo, who had collapsed, seeing the figures of the two, two choices came up in Julius' mind. Which one of the two should he give precedence to, a seemingly instantaneous gap had been produced there. And, the appetite of gluttony would never overlook that gap. Roy, to look away in the middle of the meal, you really don't have manners, knee summer. Julius, you bastard. Like a springed doll, Alphard leapt trickily. At that phantasmagoric movement, Julius' reaction got faintly delayed. The outstretched palm and, the broken knight sword entangled, and the feeling of his chest being traced by the palm with his slash being dodged, what followed immediately afterwards was an inexplicable sense of loss. Roy, a h thank you for the treat sue. At the end of that voice, for some reason, his consciousness distanced further, and further, and. Julius, though it is pathetic, in the midst of the battle against gluttony, my name was stolen. Perhaps, that is what this current situation is. Based on what Emilia had said, that truth had been brought to light. Expressing a cynical smile on his face due to the truth of being forgotten by his acquaintances, Julius shrugged his shoulders. Subaru, name got eaten. Is that what you mean? But. Eating the memories and names of people was the blasphemer, 
Sin Archbishop Gluttony. The threat of getting the name eaten, and having all connections cut off Subaru was well aware of its fearsomeness. However, looking at Julius now, who seemed to be in a healthy shape, he could not help but feel his understanding was frivolous. Subaru, his victimization is, like Rem or Crush San. Having her memories eaten, and completely forgetting her own former self, was Crush. Having her name eaten, and vanishing from the memories of people with not a single exception, and continuing to be in a deep slumber in that state, was Rem. Victims of gluttony, the two young girls were sufferers Subaru was well acquainted with. However, coming here, Julius had been trapped in a state different from those two. His own memories having not been lost, nor did he lose consciousness. However, from the memories of his surroundings, his existence had disappeared. Subaru, really, does nobody remember? If you attempt from one side. Julius, I have already met with Anastasia Summer and Ricardo. For some reason, they treated me like an unacquainted person, I have endured that experience. Being unable to thank the one who shielded you, is displeasing, isn't it? Julius, reflexively, killed his sentiments and replied but, his smile which faintly had too much energy being put into it, or the tone of his words, naturally comma were difficult for Subaru to behold. No matter how strong Julius' consciousness may be as a knight, there is no way he could bear such mental stress with ease. With the ruin of the relationships he had compiled, the fear and despair of losing the days he had lived personally. That was the sense of loss Subaru had tasted, to the point of it being painful, when he had arrived into the different world at first. Subaru, Beatrice. Beatrice, what Subaru wants to say is understandable, in fact. But, unfortunately, even Betty does not remember that man, I suppose. Betty, is already outside of the Forbidden Library, in fact. Sympathizing with his intentions at a single call, Beatrice, with a difficult face, horizontally rotated her neck. At Beatrice's point, the confirmation Subaru had picked up that was, whether she remembered Julius or not. As Emilia did not remember, naturally, there is no way Beatrice would remember. That was how it was supposed to be, but there was a possibility that Beatrice was an exception. For some reason, Beatrice was. Subaru, even though you remembered Rem. Beatrice, it can be said as many times as you'd like, but rather, that case itself should be thought of as the exception, I suppose. And now, it should be thought that it has been proven with the man in front, in fact. Subaru, in the end, that is the inference regarding your memories, ha. Huh? It had been some time ago. Some time ago, Beatrice, in the Forbidden Library, had once referred to Rem after her name had been eaten by gluttony. Subaru had questioned that after she had formed her contract, after the Forbidden Library had been lost but, this was one conclusion they had reached after their exchange. Subaru, when isolated from the outside into the Forbidden Library, Biko does not get affected by what is outside of the room. That's why the moment Rem's name was eaten, no effect was taken. Is what I had thought, isn't it? That's why, once exited from the room, special treatment would not be given. Ha! Huh. Beatrice, that tone, seems like there is a problem with Betty leaving the Forbidden Library, I suppose. Subaru, and nothing like Tharti. I, a mammoth happy to be able to walk under the rays of the sun with you. Beatrice, a, eh, in fact. And, within that short back and forth, lay the truth. And, in fact, Beatrice exhibited no peculiarity regarding Julius. Beatrice's inference was surely, that the barriers to her memory served their purpose only in the forbidden library. Rather, in this case, the problem here was not Beatrice's distinctiveness. Emilia, but, why does Subaru remember Julius San? Just like, the time with that Rem San. Subaru, that's it. The question, that would dawn upon everyone, was finally spoken by Emilia. The sole person in the entire world who remembered Rem, whose name had been eaten, Subaru. Forgotten even across the preservation of the memories of Ram, who was her twin elder sister, however, Emilia and the others did not make a reference. That must also be because, looking at Subaru connect to Rem with such devotion, they could not randomly speak regarding the memories, 
or make any implicitly believing rash remarks. But, not just that, the ability to refute Subaru's memories, could only be done by nothing else but having definite proof, which not a single one of them possessed. However, it was different this time. In this case, the concerned party who also remembered aside from Subaru in brief, Julius, who had been forgotten since his very beginning by the world, retained consciousness. Naturally, the reconciliation of that mutual recognition and, the reason for Subaru being treated as the exception of the authority of gluttony gave rise to doubts. Emilia, does Subaru have any idea? No holding secrets, okay. Subaru, I don't intend to hide anything at all but. I think I sort of do, I won't say that. Emilia, that, isn't that a secret? Subaru, if you can't confirm it don't declare it, I don't think that's secret keeping. Conversing with Emilia, Subaru investigated the possibility of him being an exception. The feeling that had uprisen in the very beginning, was the influence of the witch factor sleeping inside of Subaru. If the authority of gluttony of eating memories or names was the power of the witch factor then, it was conceivable, due to a certain cause, it may not apply upon Subaru, just like Unseen Hand. Perhaps, Subaru could return by death through the power of the Witch of Envy. With the power of that which invoked, it may have had cancelled the effects of the authority of gluttony. And there was the remaining feeling of the exceptionality like that of Beatrice's forbidden library. That was, because Subaru belonged to a different world. Subaru was a human whose origin was from a different world comma and not an existence who belonged to this world. Not being an existence of this world, he doesn't fall under the effect of the authority which interfered with the concepts of this world how was this hypothesis? Subaru, however, if it's the latter, then the way to confirm it is easy. Julius just has to meet with Al. The sole person in this world, who was under the same circumstances as Subaru, was Al. Regarding the exception of the authority, if the latter hypothesis happened to be correct, Al must also be remembering Rem and Julius. Above all, the Al of this world and Rem had no acquaintanceship with each other, henceforth, it could not be confirmed. Subaru, there's no way he can say that even this time, ha. Huh? Emilia, Subaru? Subaru, it's regarding Emilia Tan's question but, there's something I want to confirm before answering that. Julius, you'll have to come with me. At Subaru's voice, who cut short the chase, Emilia made a somewhat discontent expression. He was keeping secrets, is what could perhaps be thought as well, but this was a measure necessary for attestation. Above all, in the case of the hypothesis correctness being proven, what both Subaru and Al held in common the part of both of them being trippers from a different world would be obscure, the ones whose hometowns lay beyond the great waterfall do not fall under the effect of the authority, that absurd explanation would be the only option left. Subaru, don't tell me, you won't refuse, will you? It is regarding you, after all. Julius, I must state that I have no choice. It seems, under the present circumstance, you are rather knowledgeable regarding the condition inflicted upon me. I shall follow you. Subaru, why do you have such a delicately large attitude, you? Whether the calmness had been restored through the conversation till now, the attitude of the elegant appearing Julius, with his jaw pulled in, returned. Regardless of appearances, the uprosen situation was too tough on his mind and heart. Not charming at all, was another way to put it. Subaru, suddenly getting absorbed in appearing admirable and increasing problems for the party in contact, ha. Huh? Anyway, let's go back to the shelters. I think now it's the suitable time for all the people concerned to assemble too. That's it, what about Ricardo? He had taken part in the suppression together with you. He's fine, right? Julius, he did get injured whilst shielding me, but it should not have an effect on his life. He is currently being properly diagnosed by Ferris. Subaru, is that so? Then, that's okay, I guess. At Julius' reply, Subaru innermost thoughts were half relief and half reflection, to dissect, the relief of Ricardo's safety, and the reflection of Julius' insensitivity, who had directly inquired from the ones he had fought alongside with. And at Subaru, whose voice diminished, Julius sighed. Julius, I do not expect you to show friendly concern. If you conduct yourself the way you always do, 
it would be more comfortable for myself, after being in such perplex because of the environment. Well then, let's return to the shelters. Saying that, Julius, friendly, patted Subaru's shoulder. Julius, though it's not something too pleasant, there is no choice but to leave my introduction to you. The fruitless effort of the display in the Hall of the Royal Election, it would help if you would withdraw that at this occasion. Subaru, don't go about digging up people's guiltful history. Shit, worrying for you was a mistake. Pushing away the hand on his shoulder, Subaru turned towards Julius while stepping towards the shelter. Of course, he would not misunderstand by thinking that Julius' reply just now were his true feelings, moderating Subaru's feelings of guilt, he has simply given his reply in the need of a smart response. He knew that. As he knew that. Subaru, am I, an idiot? No, I am an idiot. Why must he now, uphold an attitude, of giving salvation to Julius' heart? He, who lost all others, above all, must be feeling the helpless anxiety of solitude, how could he mistake on his words and his judgments? His own insensitivity was terribly irritating, and Julius was almost just as irritating as well. In the situation where anxiety was natural, acting as normal was a strength of his as well. That strength was surely, something which Subaru could never attain, despite his desire. Until Julius were to be left as is, Subaru would certainly harbor his own sense of responsibility. Looking at the back of Subaru, who was heading towards the shelter, after having angered him, Julius' lips' edges curved into a slight smile. It was a powerless smile, one which he could never let Subaru see, who had his back turned towards him. Emilia, that face, do you intend to not show it to Subaru? In that dim gap in his heart, a silver bell's chime pounced in between. Turning back comma there lay the line of sight of amethyst eyes towards Julius. At that gaze, wearing gloom, Julius concealed his smile and shook his neck horizontally. Julius, meager disposition, futile resistance of the defeated, that is what it is. Please do not point it out. Emilia, defeated you say. Julius, perhaps we, were the only ones who missed among those who headed to capture the controlled towers. Fully realizing our great insufficiency, I now live in disgrace, and have been left alone in a prohibited state. Completely defeated. With a stubborn attitude, Julius strongly brought attention to their defeat. At his attitude, Emilia's eyes wavered heartbreakingly. Emilia, at this moment, may have had been able to find the powerlessness of Julius' heart. Emilia, I'm sorry. However, Emilia's utterance was different from what Julius had been intending for. At Julius, who raised his face, Emilia embraced her slender shoulders. Emilia, the truth is, I don't know what should I say to you, right now. I'm sure I must have had known you but still I cannot remember, and I can't be reliable like Subaru. Julius, in Subaru's case, he should not be referred to much. He is the one that is the exception, isn't it? Emilia, even still, I know you are being hurt. That's why I cannot do anything but apologize and... In regards to Subaru, thank you. The fact that she thanked for Subaru, was unsettling. Emilia sighed, at Julius, who furrowed his eyebrows. Emilia, Julius Sands' current face, if Subaru saw it he would certainly be pained more. That's why, thank you, for hiding it. I'm really sorry. Julius, please stop, Emilia Summer. It is not something to be thanked for, and furthermore. Furthermore you are making too much out of me, there is no need, for such consideration. It was true. Julius, subjected to Emilia's gaze, filled with innate kindness, could feel the inappropriate comfort. With such admirable consciousness, it was not as if he had confirmed Subaru's innermost thoughts. It was something much simpler, a much more uninteresting reason. Julius, I don't want him. Subaru, to pity me. That is all there is to it. Up front, drawing closer, gazing at Subaru's stature, Julius declared, pulling Beatrice's sleeve, who was close to him, with a difficult expression, was Subaru. At such a figure of Subaru, Julius was unable to discard his own powerlessness. Why those thoughts, that reason was. Emilia, just now, 
I feel I heard Julia Sands' true thoughts for the first time. Amelia, continuing her steps, commented that about Julius' words. Julius thoughtlessly rounded his eyes, and Amelia raised a single finger. Amelia, it may not be of too much help but, I will also talk to everyone to try and convince them. That's why, along with Subaru, trust us as well. Let's go. Julius, yes. Also, Amelia Summer. Amelia, what? Calling a halt to Amelia, as she turned back, Julius elegantly bowed. Though it may not be in her memories, it remained inside of him as if carved deeply, that courteous etiquette as both a knight and a noble. Julius, being called Julius San by Amelia Summer, gives rise to a helpless sense of unpleasantness. Please refer to me as Julius, that way of reference. Amelia, I, used to refer to you like that, isn't it, I understand, Julius. With a finger on her lips, Amelia consented. After that, Amelia drowned in thought, and shortly glanced at Julius, then proceeded to face towards the empty sky. And. Amelia, can I, ask something too? Julius, what might it be? Amelia, right next to you, minor spirits. No, maybe quasi-spirits. Those children, are flying about in seeming uneasiness. Did you know that? Julius, yes, I am aware because they are, odds that, being close to me, will eventually bloom. Julius closed his eyes, at what Amelia has pointed out. Right beside him, when he closed his eyes, he knew there were the quasi-spirits, wielding the power of six colors, flying about. However, those buds had no knowledge of why they were there. That is why, for them. Julius, my current self's words will not reach them. Just like, the words for my master or my comrades. Arc 5, Chapter 78, The Remaining Ripples in the Watergate City. Reinhardt, R. Subaru. Thank goodness we didn't miss each other. I'm back. Subaru, Reinhardt. How quick, you only just left. When Subaru and the others returned back to the shelter after they'd picked Julius up, they came across Reinhardt, who had just returned to the same shelter. Subaru gave a surprised response at his speedy work, and Reinhardt, who had slightly raised his hand up as he walked towards them, suddenly broke into a frown. With a face that felt Subaru's awful complexion and the unease in the somewhat anxious attitudes of the four of them, he said. Reinhardt, what's the matter, Subaru? Dot is there something wrong? Subaru, there's definitely something wrong, but, it's difficult to choose the words. There's something I want you to confirm too. Reinhardt, if I can be of any help, you may ask for whatever you want. What is it? Reinhardt's response to Subaru, who dropped the tone of his voice, was as sincere as ever. That's why he wanted to trust in his extraordinariness as he'd done so far, starting with the battle against the Bowel Hunter, all the way up to the battle against Greed. However, that line of thinking of attaining salvation by divine grace was. Subaru, do you know anything about the guy who's standing next to me? Reinhardt, you don't mean Beatrice Summer, right? Reinhardt said this whilst he looked down at the little girl in the dress that snuggled by Subaru's side. Subaru in silence, didn't reply to Reinhardt's words. He merely kept staring at the sword saint, praying that the answer he desired would be returned. To the fervor of that gaze, Reinhardt looked at the other person standing next to Subaru, and slightly narrowed his eyes as if he were thinking. However. Reinhardt, my apologies. He's someone I don't know. Judging from his aspect and appearance, I think he's one of the valorous individuals of this battle, though. Julius, dash. Julius' cheeks stiffened at Reinhardt's reply. The two of them were supposed to be close friends who were companions from the Order of Royal Guards, with his name eaten that connection of friendship also ended up being cut short. Julius cast his eyes down gloomily on hearing that reality, and Subaru, looking at him from the side, was feeling dejected too. The sword saint, as the strongest in the kingdom, was the most skilled swordsman having cut apart even the witch cult. Not even Reinhardt van Astria could escape from the influence of the authority of gluttony or perhaps having thought that it was possible, if it was Reinhardt was only a baseless wish. That wish was cruelly broken, 
and only confirmed his own shallowness. Reinhardt, my apologies. I don't know the reason why, but it looks like I wasn't able to meet your expectations. Julius, ha, it should be us who say that. From your point of view that question must have seemed like an accusation. It is us who should apologize for presuming upon that consideration. It was Julius himself that took responsibility in replying to Reinhardt's apology. He masked the shock of being treated as a stranger by a friend. He looked around the shelter as he covered himself with words of calmness. And then. Julius, it seems like it's almost time for the important people to have gathered. It's high time to start the conference that included what to do next. Reinhardt, I understand. You mean to say that we'll talk about you two there, right? Guessing the intentions behind Julius' words, Reinhardt lifted his chin. In fact, the valorous individuals of the defensive battle from earlier, those involved in the royal selection, along with the city officials, were beginning to gather inside the shelter, and right then, a young woman dressed in a kimono came back from outside that very shelter. Anastasia, hum, it looks like they've gathered before we told them to. How convenient. Anastasia, who'd finished looking around the outside, said that with a smile as she tugged on her scarf, Echidna. From within the surrounding shelter, in her field of view, she obviously must have seen the figure of Julia standing next to Subaru, but it didn't look like she was going to mention him. Anastasia, it seems like with Emilia San and Yolen felt San were nearly you about complete. If Priscilla San comes after, then that'll be enough. Then, I reckon we can start the conference. Anastasia made her suggestion as she clapped her hands together. She said it with an air of composure, without even calling out to her best knight who should have been reflected in the corner of her eyes. The place that had been designated as the conference room in place of the Lost City Hall was a meeting place near the shelter. This meeting place was also a shelter, but due to its poor provisionings against flooding, the disaster that had kept the city of Pristello on high alert, it seemed that the shelter hadn't been used during the turmoil. Anastasia, to start things off with, it ought to be a good time for the people in the other shelters to start going back to their homes, don't you think? In truth, we also wanted to go back to the inn. But, it seems like the tidying still hasn't ended. When it came to tidying, was she referring to the inn or the people involved in the current turmoil? Anastasia had probably made that comment so it could mean either one, so to take the initiative amongst those who had gathered at the meeting place. Anastasia, first of all, let me thank you all for your hard work. Luckily, the amount of damage which the witch cult's grand offensive caused was extremely low. Including both the people who are here and those who aren't, that's what I believe. It was a battle like no other. Those present in the conference, dash. Anastasia, even without those grim faces, I too, understand. The damage was low, your faces say that you ain't convinced by those words. The looks on those unsuspecting silent faces became harder at Anastasia's words, who in some regard seemed unconcerned. Anastasia shrugged her shoulders and looked around the room at that. At the meeting place, not only were the original members who had undertook the battle to defend the city assembled, but also the other collaborators who'd gotten involved had joined. From the Emilia camp, there was Emilia, Subaru, and Beatrice. Both Garfield and Otto were absent due to the gravity of their injuries. From the Felt camp, there was Felt, Reinhardt, and Camberley, whose face was pale due to his out-of-placeness. Gaston and Larkins were absent due to their wounds and exhaustion. From the Crush camp, the most important member, Crush, was still resting in bed, so Ferris and Wilhelm were participating instead of their mistress. From the Priscilla camp, there was Al and Priscilla, whose face looked bored. Next to them was their attendant, Schelt, safe and sound. It looked like Heinkel's safety had been confirmed, but he was an absentee. And from the Anastasia camp, there was Anastasia, who was standing in the center like she'd taken the reins. There was Tivi and Ricardo participating as well, the latter of which had white bandages wrapped throughout his body. And Julius, who was seated away from them, on the Emilia campsite. Finally, there was Kiritaka, Liliana and the white dragon scales who'd joined due to their involvement. 
Nearly twenty people in total who were involved one way or another had gathered in the room to carry out the post-war conference of the defensive battle. And the one who got the ball rolling and spoke out a rebuttal against Anastasia's initial speech was Ferris, his attitude unsettled. His yellow eyes shook with irritation as he raised his hand up. Ferris, the post-conference is important. I understand that. I understand that, but I wish to speak about how we're going to deal with the Sin Archbishop. In the end, one of the top brass of the witch cult was captured alive, right? There are many things that we need to ask. I want to hurry that up. Anastasia, well, I knew Ferris San was going to say that. By the way, what's Crush San's current condition like? Has there been any change since? Ferris, I can just say she's stable. We couldn't get any information out of lust, so right now she's recovering her strength with my healing magic, and relying on her willpower. For a moment, her symptoms were relieved a bit thanks to Subaru Kun's help, but... Being looked at out of the corner of the eye from the frustrated Ferris, Subaru fixated his gaze on his own palm. A part of his palm had turned black, and it was in a state where it exposed an unseemliness like that of a burn or birthmark. A similar change had occurred in Subaru's right thigh which was covered by his trousers. Subaru didn't feel any pain or the feeling of anything foreign in it, but it wasn't like that for Crush. The removal of that which was definitely eating up her strength was a matter of the highest priority to save her life. That, and it was also rather tough for a woman to bear those black veins on her skin. That a beautiful woman like Crush had been affected made her stand out all the more painfully. Anastasia, if I'm to speak honestly, I ain't in agreement with keeping that sin archbishop alive. That thing is a being that brings only trouble. If it's possible, killing him in a hurry would definitely be for the best. Ferris, dash. But then our leads would disappear. Whilst Subaru worried about the black veins, the argument between Anastasia and Ferris was reaching a boiling point. In regards to the captured Sin Archbishop's treatment, Sirius, Ferris stubbornly shook his head at Anastasia who had suggested its execution. It was natural from his point of view. However, Anastasia merely shook her head at Ferris who was getting fired up. Anastasia, I think what happened to Crush San is a pity. But, they're different matters. Besides, that Roth even knows anything about lust, no, I don't think they do in the long run. To me, it seems very unlikely that the witch cult was cooperating with each other. Ferris, if they're connected, then why? Why did something like today happen? The Sin Archbishops all gathered and came to attack the city, and yet, they're not cooperating? Anastasia, of course, even I ain't saying that their actions overlapped by happenstance. But, their aims, Retreat times and dispersion don't match, it'd be a little weird to call that cooperation. The witch cult doesn't have any awareness of stuff like cooperation. Ferris, that's just a deduction, right? Raising his voice, Ferris completely denied Anastasia's words. It looked like Anastasia as well had realized that her suggestion was difficult to accept, and it didn't seem like she was going to give a rebuttal to that which she'd been denied by Ferris' sentimental argumental. Thereupon, Subaru slowly raised his hand up. Subaru, may I say something? I also have an opinion, but if anything, an opinion that's close to Ferris. I don't think it's pointless getting information out of Roth. Ferris, what do you mean? Subaru, it isn't a story I'm proud of, but a little while ago, I was allowed to speak with Roth for a short amount of time, there I was able to hear a little bit about gluttony. Even if it was only about the length, depth and closeness of their relationship, it's too hasty to say we can't get any information out of them. In fact, Roth had thrown some words similar to a warning at Subaru about gluttony. Thanks to that, there was a part in which Subaru had realized the possibility of gluttony having several individuals, and had ended up not overlooking Julius when he'd tried to distance himself from the shelter. He couldn't close his eyes to this. Nevertheless, within Subaru's true feelings, he also had a part which agreed with Anastasia, Subaru, but, leaving aside whether we can or can't use them as a source of information, I also have a bad feeling in regards to keeping them captured, though all the Sin Archbishops are like that. Right now, so that they could partake in the conference, Sirius's guard duty was entrusted to the White Dragon Scales. 
She was in a condition where she was bound in chains without quarter, and had even been gagged so to stop her from talking. They'd also been instructed to take turns keeping guard, as their hearts had the potential to be manipulated were they stay near her for too long. Nothing should happen during this conference, but his anxiety was unending. Subaru, it's necessary to feel this anxiety whilst they are captured alive. I can't unconditionally make a decision about what to do about that. Ferris, which side are you on? Ferris pointed his eyes, which were full of hatred, towards the fence sitting Subaru. Subaru grimaced at the heat of his gaze, and said, Subaru, I'm not taking sides. Honestly, I think both of you are right. In the worst case, I will do something about the black veins in Crush San's body using the parts of my body which haven't turned black, if that solves the issue, then I think that'll be no issue. Ferris, ha. Amelia, Subaru. Subaru's own judgment was a fairly extreme conclusion in regards to Crush's black veins. Upon hearing those words, Ferris' face became flabbergasted, and Amelia looked at him with rebukeful eyes. Everyone else also turned to look at him with shock, and complex emotions in their gazes. Amelia, I also heard about that, but that's truly as a last resort, right? Right now we don't know what'll happen even if it's nothing, but, acting like this is normal is. Subaru, well, it's not like even I want to put that seemingly unhealthy ink in my body for fun. But, we have a precedent with Crush San that it relieved her symptoms a little. Amelia, dash. Subaru, what I mean to say is, don't hurry in drawing conclusions, I understand the feelings of impatience, but even if my back or my butt turns black, given that they're out of sight, I'm not reluctant to help out. That's what I'm on about. Despite there being a way to be able to do something, letting it go by due to his own cuteness would leave him a bad taste in his mouth. Crush was a valued benefactor to him, and more importantly, there was a way that didn't involve his, nor any of the other's life. He'd try and help as much as he could if it was something like darkening his skin, which was out of sight. Wilhelm, Ferris, sit yourself. For the time being, Subaru Dono is right. Ferris, I know. I really know. The one who pulled Ferris' sleeve, who was lost for words, and made him calm down, was Wilhelm. Ferris looked down and tried to say something to Subaru, but sat down without saying anything in the end. Subaru let out a sigh on seeing his state, the mood around the then tensened meeting area went back to normal. Even so, the situation from before still continued. Anastasia, in any case, I understand that everyone's opinions regarding the treatment of the Sin Archbishops are divided. It's worrying to keep him alive, even the limits of mine and Natsuki Kun's instincts ain't coming out. In truth, if they'd killed him instead of captured him, our talk would have gone all the more quicker. Priscilla, what, this worthless spiel has ended? No matter how much you gaze upon myself, no rewards shalt be given to a show that lacks value. Cease that beggars look immediately. Priscilla replied with a yawn to the bantering Anastasia's look. That misplaced reply was proof that Priscilla hadn't been listening to the conversation properly up until now. Her participating in this conference must also have been some kind of whim of hers. Anastasia, don't speak so slyly. Though that attitude is unbecoming for one who captured someone from the witch cult alive, more than anyone else, why did you capture him? What led to this bizarre turn of events? Priscilla, as if myself knew whether she'd live or die. When I gave the final blow, the Yang sword clouded over and its sharpness disappeared. Thus, she survived. The one who dragged her out from the canal was one of the rabble who drained the water in search for the songstress. It has nothing to do with myself. Anastasia, it doesn't bother you that the one you tried to kill didn't die? Priscilla, the contrary. Myself drove the sword solely to kill. If she didn't die by that, then myself has no intention to kill her again. Though she didn't die by mine hand, it seems to be all the more convenient as far as myself is concerned. Anastasia, ha, I don't understand, but I'd. Anastasia seemed to have given up trying to understand Priscilla, who as ever, had elaborated her enigmatic theory. Subaru didn't know her intentions either, but Priscilla's thinking probably wasn't understood by anyone else. It was dubious whether even Alan Schult, who stood by her side, 
understood heads or tails of it, Reinhardt, at least, I am against judging Roth in this place. I do want to respect Ferris' feelings of course, and it's also a unique opportunity for the kingdom. On top of strictly keeping guard of them, I think that we should make an effort to get what they know out of them. Felt, I think it's better to kill them. Even just remembering those sin archbishops makes me sick to the stomach, I don't think they'd say anything that half makes sense. It's better to kill them before being dragged into something problematic, so that they won't cause any problems in the future, probably. Reinhardt, Felt Summer. Felt, for your information, I ain't at all saying this to get on your nerves this time. And, coming from a different place, the opinions were split between master and servant. Reinhardt, who had advocated that they should keep Roth alive, and Felt, who had denied that. Although, Felt's opinion wasn't well grounded, Felt herself didn't seem to think that her opinion would be accepted. In the end, Roth's person would be given into custody to the kingdom, it looked like it would end up like that. And in the worst case, in the eventuality that a conviction would need to be carried out too. Anastasia, when it comes to being suitable for that, ye are it seems. But in this case, will Felt San follow ye to the capital too? Or shall master and servant go their separate ways? Felt, if Reinhardt's going, I'm going too. This time, it can't be helped. Reinhardt's face changed to one of astonishment on hearing Felt's words. Felt caught a fleeting glimpse of his face from the side, and plastered a deep scowl on her lovely face. Felt, don't get the wrong idea. The fact that I can't stand you ain't changed. It ain't changed, but there's times where I ain't gonna do that. Reinhardt, there are times where you aren't going to do that? Felt, I don't know. Try ask that to your own chest. My chest ain't soft enough to reply back to you. Sticking out her underdeveloped chest for her age, Felt stuck her tongue out at Reinhardt. Reinhardt cast his eyes down seeing his master's attitude, and then quietly lifted his chin up. Only they themselves knew what feelings there were between master and servant. At any rate, it looked like the Felt camp too wasn't the same as it had been a year ago. Camberley, W. Well, in that case, I'll. Reinhardt, Camberley, look after Larkins and Gaston. Once they can move about, they may first return back to the mansion. Bring them only in contact with old man Rom. Camberley, why yes sir, I understand. A look of relief came over the uncomfortable looking Camberley on receiving his orders. For now, thanks to Reinhardt volunteering they could feel at ease regarding Roth's escort. What came after, that which they could get out of Sirius, would be the duties of the kingdom's experts, Kiritaka, then. May we move to the next issue? Ladies and gentlemen. The one who'd raised his hand up after he'd seen the matter of Roth's treatment decided had been Kiritaka. He gazed at everyone's faces whilst he adjusted his slightly messy hair with his hand. And then, he spoke out. Kiritaka, first of all, regarding the battle to protect this city. I'd like to thank you all on behalf of all of its citizens. If it wasn't for all of you, the city of Pristella would likely have fallen into the evil clutches of the witch cult. I offer my deepest gratitude for that. Kiritaka hung his head low, and bowed, having taken responsibility for speaking of the general consensus of the city. Liliana, who was by his side, with a look of panic on her face, also bowed her head like Kiritaka had. Putting Kiritaka aside, Liliana's earnest reaction was quite unlike her. Perhaps her fight against Roth, or something after that had caused a change in her attitude. In any case. Subaru, we were already in the city, and involved, we didn't have the option to just watch on as a spectator, so you don't have to thank us to this grandiose extent. Don't you think? Amelia, yeah. Besides, maybe the witch cult taking over the city was just a bonus for them judging by their aims. Whether we saved them or they saved us, maybe we don't know which one it is. Emilia and Subaru insisted that it was hard for them to accept the praises at face value for the witch cult's attack. Certainly, the greatest part of repelling the witch cult had been down to the merit of the members gathered here. However, in the first place, the Sin Archbishop's aims were Emilia, the artificial spirit and the Book of Wisdom. 
All of those things had been brought in by those involved from the outside, and the Amelia camp had been responsible for gathering them all. They couldn't sincerely accept their praises. Felt, wait up. It bothers me that you say that freely as if it were the consensus. Are you really saying that if we hadn't been here, they would have slammed the door shut on those witch cult guys? I reckon we need a talk more clearly about that. Priscilla, tis vexing, but I'm in agreement with that beggar girl. Don't drag us into all of you commoners' self-convenient diffidence. Don't be so conceited, you half-witch and you philistine. However, the harsh duo stated their rigid opinions on hearing the words of Subaru and Amelia. Felt and Priscilla looked at each other after they finished speaking, and immediately looked away, their faces looking disgusted. Ever since from the start, those two did not get along with each other. Only those in her camp were close to Priscilla, so it a pretty normal reaction. Kiritaka, please settle down. I'm gladdened by Amelia Summer's words, but as Felt Summer and Priscilla Summer said, the city's defense was all of your merit. This I vow as a representative of the city. In the meantime, I'd like you to lend your strength just a little while longer, Subaru, by strength. You mean the next issue you mentioned earlier? Kiritaka, indeed. It's about the inhabitants who were transformed by that wicked power. Everyone, dash. Everyone there went silent at hearing Kiritaka's somber tone. What he was about to point out, was something which everyone here understood. The staff of the city hall who'd fallen into the evil clutches of lust and had been transformed into inhuman forms. One had been transformed into a black dragon, and the other dozen or so had been transformed into huge flies. They still couldn't do anything due to the effect of lust's authority, variation and change. For now they ought to have gathered them in one place and concealed their existence, though. Kiritaka, the culprit, Lust, has fled. No, even if we could catch Lust in the first place, it's doubtful whether or not they'd have any intention to turn them back to normal. Subaru, that's for sure. Dot, but we can't just leave them, right? Is there anything at all which we could do? Isn't it even impossible for Ferris? The changes to the people who couldn't turn back to their original form were fundamentally different from injuries or disease. Seeing Subaru's gaze, Ferris shook his head, and then bit his lips. Ferris, even I simply can't cure that. No, it isn't about whether I can cure them or not. It isn't an injury or disease, they were just transformed into those kind of creatures. Healing magic can only help you get back to being right as rain if you're injured or sick. That's why healing magic is futile against those transformations. Kiritaka, to be frank. I can't tell if the people who were turned into flies have awareness. I can't make the distinction, and a fly the size of a person can't even fly to begin with. They haven't learned how to move their wings properly, they're in an incomplete state. But, if they have awareness. Subaru, if they clearly understand their circumstances, they'd end up going crazy I guess. They had lost their own figures. It was a frightening change, even in just thinking about that. However, Considering that they'd been changed into something inhuman, into something repulsive, it made it all the more worse. When your body isn't free, and you even lose the means to express your will, you could imagine pretty easily what they'd be thinking in the end. For sure they would. Priscilla, those who were transformed into vile insects would want to die, I'd imagine. If there is no chance to turn them back, then would it not be merciful to bestow that? Al, princess, that's... Priscilla, be silent, Al. There's no meaning in mere wishful lip service. Mine self has no mercy to dish out to slothful pigs, but killing those who revile fate by being trifled to absurdity with is also a kindness. In short, that's what it means. With her harsh view, Priscilla dismissed Al, who had instinctively voiced his opinion. However, the reason why Al didn't make any more objections, was because Priscilla's opinion was also correct in some sense. Of course, he didn't think they should die. But, they had been transformed into flies and there was no known way to get them back to normal, it was perfectly natural that they would want to die. Subaru, it's impossible to negotiate with the culprit, lust. Healing magic doesn't fix them. What do we do? Kiritaka, I'd wanted to ask everyone about that. 
It doesn't matter even if it's a shot in the dark. Does no one have any idea on how to cure them? Still seeming to cling on to hope, Kiritaka's question was drenched in both expectation and resignation. No, the amount of resignation was stronger. And that was natural. If there'd been any possibility to cling on to, someone would have been bound to have suggested it by now. In other words, at this point in time, where no allusions to a solution had been made so far. Kiritaka, I understand. I profusely apologize for the inconvenience. Dealing with them is an issue for the city, we shall take the responsibility afterwards. Subaru, take the responsibility? What will you all do? Kiritaka, we'll consider the possibilities after this. We have to check the will of those involved, and see each of their conclusions. No matter what the final opinions are, we shall see it through until the very end. They sounded like strong words that implied the end in which they ended their lives instead of the one where they could return back to normal. Hirotaka's conclusion was inevitable in a sense. It was inevitable, but it was too soon for that conclusion. Amelia, wait. Erm, wouldn't you be able to leave it to me? Hirotaka, Amelia Summer, eh. Having realized that their discussion on that matter had reached its end, Amelia quickly raised her hand. She looked straight at Kiritaka whilst feeling his anxious and expectant gaze converging on her, and said, Emilia, a way to return them all back to normal right now. Sorry, that I don't know. But, I want you to not make any hasty conclusions, we need more time. Kiritaka, I understand your feelings, Emilia Summer. But, it's about whether they have that time in them. The big issue is for how long their spirits can maintain their equilibrium in their transformed bodies. Amelia, yeah, I know. That's why I will make time to protect their minds. It may be a crude method, but it'll surely be able to do the job. A way of putting them to sleep. Subaru, I see, cold sleep. Realizing Amelia's intentions, Subaru snapped his fingers and then raised his voice. As he felt the people around him tilting their heads quizzically due to the unfamiliar words, Subaru nodded at Amelia, who was looking at him. Subaru, in other words, you mean the same way as with the brides in the church, right? With Amelia Tan's magic, we'll put the transformed people into a state of suspended animation. It may end up just postponing the inevitable, but it's sufficient to put off making a conclusion. In the meanwhile, we should find a solution. Kiritaka, freezing them, and keeping them sleeping. Is that possible? But won't they end up freezing to death in their sleep? Amelia, they'll be fine. It was for a short while, but I used this on the brides, so I understand the effects on one's health, and besides, I also slept for around one hundred years by myself. Kiritaka, you yourself slept? Although an undesired commotion spread throughout the meeting place, Subaru clenched his fist at Amelia's words. It was unusual that Amelia was being positive about her magic and that she had insisted on trying to use it this way as well. That, and it was a fine play that even Subaru hadn't thought about. It certainly wasn't a drastic solution to the problem, but they just needed time to find a solution from somewhere other than lust. At least, their possibilities should be increased in not having a set time limit. In the worst case, yes, it was the worst case, but there existed a possibility. Subaru would defeat Lust with his own hands, and take away the witch factor she held. Or perhaps, if it was him, it may not be possible that he could return them back to normal using the power of that witch factor. He'd just taken in the witch factor of greed, and it was possible that reproducing the Sin Archbishops was merely a pipe dream. Kiritaka, if that's possible, by all means I would like to ask that of you, but... Emilia, let me do it. You won't regret it for sure. Emilia repeated her request to Kiritaka who was hesitating, at a loss for what to think. Kiritaka agonized about it before her earnest attitude. However, Liliana who was at his side, tugged at the cuff of his suit. The brown girl looked up at Kiritaka and then flared up her nostrils. Liliana, what are you worried about, Kiritaka-san? Why not? Let her try. After all that Amelia Summer said. It's natural that there's a chance of success. Kiritaka, of course, I want to believe that too, 
Very much so, Liliana. However, this is something that involves many lives. We can't come to a conclusion so easily. Liliana, there's no need to worry. Emilia Summer will not fail. Because, B-E-K-A-U-Z, the great heroes of the future can all surmount such tribulations without difficulty. Those heroic tales where they surmount any wall standing in their way, no matter how tall or thick it is. Blood boiling and flesh raising, a tale which fascinates everyone is created like so. The gentle strum of the Lilia, unsuitable for the meeting place, resounded throughout. None of Liliana's idealistic notions had any basis, but for some reason, they did have a strange persuasive power to them. Of course, it wasn't so simple as to make their conclusion using just that. Subaru, at the least, let's ask their families. If the staff of the city hall are the victims, then their family should be in the same city, right? We should try and hear from them whether they leave open that possibility. Kiritaka, in regards to that question, there shouldn't be anyone who seemed to have abandoned their family. Subaru, then we can talk later about whether we will leave this to Emilia or not. And, regarding whether they will believe Emilia or not. Well, I'd like to hear about that specifically from the consensus of the city. Kiritaka directed his gaze towards Emilia, showing signs of hesitation. If Emilia had cowered from that look, then perhaps the debate would dragged on even further. However, Emilia nodded without fear at his clinging gaze. Emilia, leave it to me. I will do it without fail. Confidence and conviction, even though it was somewhat of a different feeling, Emilia had shown her willingness to face her own deeds with a strong sense of self-awareness and preparedness. Kiritaka, dash. Kiritaka was speechless in seeing the gaze in Emilia's eyes, and in hearing her assertion. And it wasn't just that, the gazes of the people around which were pointed at Amelia also showed an infinite variety of reactions as if they were swaying in a wave of emotions different to the one so far. Finally, Kiritaka let out a deep sigh. Kiritaka, I und, erstand. For sure, I reckon we should endeavor to make our wishes come true rather than jumping to hasty conclusions. Since otherwise the battle to protect Pristella too had seemed reckless at first. Kiritaka, it's me who should be thanking you. Kiritaka smiled wryly at having lost his position. After the conference, and after they got permission from the victims' families, it seemed like the cold sleep from Emilia's magic would be realized. Subaru replied to Emilia's nod by giving her a thumbs up. Having cleared up the second point of dispute, what came next was their last topic on the agenda. And that was... Question mark colon so, the last issue... There have been many reports of unconscious people of unknown identity that were found one after the other in various parts of the city. I'd like for us to discuss this matter. Most likely, for the knight who had been forgotten and had remained silent until now, it was the most important issue. Question mark colon right now, the number of nameless people is reported to be 36. Amongst them for us, it includes six people who appear to have been part of the White Dragon Scales. Furthermore, it's very likely that the number of nameless people will increase in the future. The one who led the debate and gave the report was Dinas, the representative of the White Dragon Scales. With his fingers, he touched the dragon crest that was embroidered on his white garb, a strong expression of regret adorning his face. Most likely, that was the crest that denoted that they were White Dragon Scales. The ambiguous testimony that he had said, who appear to have been part of must have been related to that crest as well. Felt, it's okay to say that the guys who were attacked by that sin archbishop are nameless, right? Like, the guys who popped up out of nowhere suddenly defeated, Kiritaka, taking into account the situation, it's reasonable to think that, I'd say. Their uniforms have matching embroidery sewn in. It's really frustrating that their identities are completely unknown. Dinas, What's more is that there's thirty more people who are in a similar position, it's a complete mess. It's unclear to say whether they were or not, it's difficult to judge what the best thing to do is. The victims of gluttony dash, dealing with the people who had had their names eaten, in some sense, were harder to deal with than the victims of lust. After all, the victims had completely disappeared from the memories of those who knew them. On top of that, if the people in question weren't conscious, 
then there were no clues left to find their identity. Even with the people from the White Dragon Scales, it may be great that just their affiliation was known, but no one knew more than that. They didn't know who they were caring for, or such, felt, all of the nameless that you found were unconscious, right? What was the healing arts user's chic? No, guy's prognosis on that? Ferris, it's the same as with lust as well. I don't know why they are unconscious. The result of my prognosis is that I think they are just sleeping. But this too isn't a certainty. Those who just sleep should keep keep weakening, but then there's the case of Rem Chan. To the words of Felt, Ferris looked over at Subaru and then spoke. A year ago, having suffered the same damage from gluttony, Rem had been diagnosed from Ferris similarly as to the nameless people. The result of the prognosis had been exactly the same. And still up until now, Rem hadn't woken up, and yet her health hadn't deteriorated. Even though she seemed asleep, he had to say that her body wasn't carrying out its functions for life support. Her hair wasn't growing, and there wasn't even any excretion. She was in an unfathomable state. Subaru, putting aside knowing their identities or not, the care of those people is easy. It's better to deal with bedridden people since they're bedridden, we can just leave them sleeping in their beds. Even though in truth, I'd like for someone who knows them to be by their side. Ricardo, since that ain't possible, that's the issue, ain't it? It's something arduous. Even though he knew saying that had been half meaningless, Subaru had done it for Rem. In the real meaning, he had no other choice but to defeat gluttony for Rem. Even if he knew that, having offered a little bit of opposition was Subaru's self-satisfaction. Subaru's naivety was denied by Ricardo, who'd raised his voice, his face showing no traces of ill-will. When he turned to take a glimpse at his side, Ricardo was sitting on two chairs set side by side, having crammed his huge body in, and was taking part in the conference. He still seemed to have his spirited attitude unchanged, but there was something that was different in just one place, and that was the hefty amount of bandages that were wrapped around him, and his right arm missing from the elbow down. Ricardo, Don makes such a miserable face, bro. It's true that I screwed up, but I'm alive. When you think about what happened now, it's by far more preferable damage. Noticing Subaru's gaze, Ricardo raised his severed right arm up and bared his fangs. It seemed like Ricardo had lost his right arm due to an attack from gluttony during the fierce battle of the control tower. He'd heard that from Julius, who had been fighting at his side. Julius had also told him that Ricardo had lost his arm protecting him, and that Ricardo himself didn't remember it. As if proving that, Ricardo shifted his gaze to Subaru's side, and said, Ricardo, by the way, I see that handsome guy next Taya is an acquaintance of yours bro? Looks like you met the guy you were searching for, that's a relief ain't it? Truly thank you for helping me earlier. Julius, dash. Calling Julius a handsome guy, Ricardo acted as if he was talking to a stranger. From the flow of the conversation, it seemed that Julius had exchanged with Ricardo the same words as back when he had tried to smoke screen Subaru at first. Julius should have carried the injured Ricardo to the shelter, so it could be presumed that Ricardo's thanks in the end were for that. Nevertheless, leaving this misunderstanding as is was far too agonizing. Besides, they'd come to the topic of gluttony. It was time to cut to the chase it seemed. Subaru, I have something which I want to talk to everyone about. It's something important that's related to the dealing of the nameless. Standing up, Subaru got the attention of everyone in the hall to himself. Right now, the one who had the most information on how to deal with the nameless was Subaru. Subaru felt everyone's gazes naturally filled with anticipation of a solution for this state of affairs, however he shook his head. Subaru, I'm sorry for having caused anticipation, in all honesty, this isn't something which will yield hope immediately, but I have to talk about this. Anastasia, you know, if you give it an extravagant preface, you're bound to make us fret. What are you planning to say? Anastasia threw a few joking words to Subaru so to try and relieve some of the tension in the place. However, it was her who should be the one most prepared for this. Otherwise, the fact had the potential to turn her current state of mind inside out from the roots. 
Subaru took a quick breath, and then looked at everyone's faces. And finally, he looked at Julius, who nodded despite looking tense. Seeing that, Subaru then pointed to the neighboring Julius with his hand, and asked his question. Subaru, is there anyone who knows the name of this man here? Everyone, dash. Silence prevailed in the meeting place to Subaru's question. The time that was kept in silence wasn't out of a lack of understanding, though. It was because everyone sensed the intent of Subaru's question, and were contemplating about Julius' position, and on that basis, if nobody said a word, it meant that there was no one who had any idea about Julius' identity. Subaru, Al. What about you? Don't you remember his face? Al, ah? Uh? What's up, bro? Why are you nominating me all of a sudden? Having had his name abruptly called out, Al raised his voice in sheer surprise. That behavior was enough to prove that he had memories of Julius inside of him, but, even so, he had to make sure. Subaru placed his hand on the round table and posed his question to Al, whilst leaning forward towards him. Subaru, do you really not know why? It's what you and I have in common. So, do you not remember this guy? Well? Reply to me. Al, ah, uh, so that's why. Sorry, bro. I know what you mean, but I don't think I can help you. That guy's nowhere to be found in my head. Subaru, are you completely sure? If you think a little more seriously. Julius, that's enough. That's plenty enough, Subaru. As an Isekaya, Al presumed the intention behind those series of questions based off of that, but he hadn't nodded his head, nonetheless, it was Julius himself who stopped the unrelenting Subaru. Julius clapped Subaru's shoulder with a forlorn smile on his face, and bowed at Al. Julius, I overexpected, I'm sorry. We apologize for our impoliteness. Al, you have no reason to apologize. I don't know. If there was such a reason to or not, but you don't need to apologize to me. Waving his sole arm, Al turned his gaze away from Julius. There were no signs of falsehood in his reaction. It was probably true that Al didn't remember Julius. Then, that meant part of Subaru's conjecture was incorrect. The world you originated from had nothing to do with the effect of gluttony's authority. If it was like so, then after all, the most likely reason was the witch factor inside Subaru's body. And it seemed to be limited to isolation with the outside world according to Beatrice's door crossing. Wilhelm, judging from the story, Subaru Dono. This young man was involved with us. And in addition to that, I also think it's someone who was in a fairly important position. Wilhelm spoke out his deduction after observing the trio's exchange. Others would have most likely come to the same conclusion, which the wizened swordsman did. Subaru nodded at Wilhelm, and then he turned to look towards Julius. Subaru, this is Julius. Julius Euculius. Like all of you guessed, his name was eaten by gluttony, and ended up as one of the nameless people. But the process is different than the others who were unconscious. His consciousness remains. Ferris, we have such a case? He's forgotten by those around him, but he himself remembers. So, is this person one of ours? With disbelief on his face, Ferris swept his gaze from Subaru to Julius and then back again many times over. To the shivering Ferris words, Reinhardt tucked his chin in and said it seems so. The sword saint gazed at Julius with his tranquil eyes, and said, Reinhardt, before the conference, Subaru asked me the same question as well. He, Julius was likely an acquaintance of mine or Ferris. Or maybe the word acquaintance isn't sufficient to describe our relationship. A friend, perhaps. Julius, at least, I thought of you both as friends. If you both consider me a friend in the same way, nothing would make me feel more honored. Ferris, friends. Then, Julius you're a knight as well? One of the royal guards? Both Reinhardt and Ferris were bewildered at having been called a friend by a stranger. Their reaction couldn't be helped, thus Julius corrected them half in resignation. Subaru's insides were burning in anger as he watched the trio's exchange. What a warped, nauseating scene it was. Subaru didn't know in detail how the three of them had met, 
how they ended up becoming friends, and what their friendship was like. Even so, as colleagues, as friends, the three of them should have interacted with each other in a close, naturally familiar manner. Now there wasn't even a trace left of those certain bonds. When Rem's name had been eaten, and everyone had forgotten her existence, Subaru had thought there was nothing that existed in this world that was more sorrowful than that, but, what about Julia's current condition? The sensation of complete loss that invaded him from being abandoned by everyone in the world, if that wasn't sad, then what was? Sadness wasn't something you could compare. But, even if it was, this was far too cruel. Anastasia, I guess it ain't something like him being a plain old royal guard. Out of the blue, Anastasia's words butted in between the painful first meeting of those friends. She put a thoughtful expression across her gentle features, and licked her lips as she touched her jaw. Then, she pointed at Ricardo before then pointing at Julius. Anastasia, Julius San was the one who brought back, on his shoulders, the grievously injured Ricardo. Straight after we talked a bit about Ricardo's treatment, he immediately left saying that he had Targo in search for someone. But, about that reaction, that's what you did, wasn't it? Julius, Anastasia Summer. It was their second first encounter which between master and servant, should not normally occur. Recalling the bitter memories of that time, Julius spoke out the name of his master with anguish on his face. However, Anastasia didn't even take notice of the presence of the quivering devotion that he'd put into those words. She thought for a moment, and then raised one of her fingers. Anastasia, Julius San's nameless case is a rather unusual one. We don't know how many people in the city are in the same state, but mayhaps there's a possibility of confirming that for others too who are like the unconscious nameless. There's no doubt that this too is a serious situation. Ain't that right? Moving her gaze away from Julius, Anastasia directed the theme to the outline of the debate. It looked like the matter of Julius' identity had been postponed as one of the problems that couldn't be resolved. That was pretty unjust treatment for the current Julius, but Subaru was the only one in this place who could feel outraged by it. Anastasia, in light of these problems, dot I have a proposal, though, is that okay? Subaru, a proposal? Subaru's innermost feelings were put aside, and the attention of the conference was once again directed at Anastasia. At the center of attention, Anastasia looked around the surroundings, before finally settling her gaze on Subaru and Julius. Anastasia, the victims of the witch cult. The victims of lust, and those nameless from gluttony. Asking the Sin Archbishop in question for a solution for each of these is hopeless, are we in agreement with that? Kiritaka, it would be difficult to force them to speak, in that sense, you're right I guess. But, an overly pessimistic opinion could on the contrary result in clouding our view. Anastasia, that doesn't mean I'm thinking about the worst either. But, there isn't just one way to get an answer, Aizhou wanted to say that. Subaru, there's a different way to get an answer? Subaru ended up parroting back Anastasia's words without comprehending the meaning of her words. A different solution to asking the corresponding sin archbishops who were the culprits behind the damage, if there existed such a way, it would probably be close to a witch's deal. For a split second, a choice which Subaru mustn't make crossed his mind, in that if it were the witch of greed, she'd maybe know the answer. Emilia, so, what do you mean? Please tell us clearly. However, Emilia asked Anastasia about the true meaning of her words in place of Subaru, who was busy shaking his head denying that idea. And then, whilst drumming her head with her fingers, Anastasia said. Anastasia, if we can't get the information out of those crooked sin archbishops, then we ought to ask it to another person who may know. There is such it seems. Someone from this country who may know a way. Question mark colon there's no way. Having guessed the meaning of Anastasia's words, someone spoke that out in a hoarse voice. However, unlike everyone else around him who'd realized what she was on about, Subaru had no idea what her statement meant, felt, I don't understand. Don't put on airs, and say it clearly. Felt sulkily demanded that from Anastasia, her understanding the same as Subaru's. Anastasia gave a wry smile to Felt's words, and apologized with an I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 
Anastasia, the sage Shaula. Felt, ah? Anastasia, the Pleiades watchtower, if it's the sage who should be there. If they're the person of legend who can see everything about the world, it wouldn't be strange if they knew, right? She said that, and revealed the true intentions behind her proposal. Arc 5, Chapter 79, The Sage's Watchtower Anastasia, the Sage Shaula When Anastasia mentioned that name, a stir spread throughout the meeting place. Whilst everyone exchanged glances with each other, and put on expressions like they couldn't believe what they'd heard, only Subaru was left behind from this situation. Subaru patted Emilia's shoulder beside him whilst he put on a troubled expression, and said. Subaru, um, is this sage Shaula someone famous? Emilia, Subaru, you didn't read the story of the witch when you studied the alphabet? I thought that nursery tale was in the book that you were reading a lot. Subaru, the nursery tales which, are, in that picture book. Now that you mention it, I'd thought that the witch's story was listed as well for sure. That which was pointed out by Emilia brought up old memories of a year ago in him. Though he had been buried by the memories of those hectic days, a year ago, he'd study the alphabet in a picture book for children, that was during the time when he'd just started to help out at the Roswell Mansion. It was a collection of classics that compiled the popular nursery tales in this world, amongst them, there had been an illustrated one about the Witch of Envy for sure. However, in that tale, Subaru, in all honesty, its contents weren't that detailed, so I didn't fully understand everything. The most I got out of it was that long ago, at a certain place, the witch did something terrible. Amelia, was is really that vague, um, let me think. Question mark colon the witch of envy is the symbol of terror that once brought chaos and ruin to this world, when Amelia had sunk into thought on how she would have had to explain it to Subaru, who had displayed his ignorance, Julius who was sitting opposite to her, opened his mouth instead of her. Julius, all that was recorded was that she was a half-elf with an infinitely cruel and ruthless personality, and that she had tremendous magical power which she controlled shadows with. Other than that, her name. We only know that her name is Satella. Even now, the scars that being left behind on the world remain strong. Subaru, A. Eh? Subaru lifted his chin up at Julius' explanation who'd kept his emotions in check as best as he could. He focused on giving a neutral explanation, but the change in his state of mind was painfully shown regardless, even though no one around them mentioned it. In the meantime, his explanation continued. Julius, at the great waterfall at the far east of Lubnica, there's a shrine made from magical sealing stones. Even now, that which is sealed up in that shrine, whilst she spews out a huge amount of miasma, Subaru, I'd heard that she couldn't be destroyed. But, how could they manage to seal such a powerful witch? Julius, that's where the name of the sage from before comes into play. Julius nodded after he heard Subaru's question. The knight touched the sword at his waist, and looked towards the end of the round table, right at the red-haired youth. Julius, four hundred years ago, three great heroes contributed to the sealing of the Witch of Envy. One of those was the sword saint, Reed Astria, the sword's heaven-sent child who was the first to acquire the divine protection of the sword saint and the title which Reinhardt inherited. TL Note, the concept of a heaven-sent child is one that's seemingly common in Japanese tradition. It refers to a child that was given as a result of a prayer to a deity. Many such exist in legend, folklore and I believe religion too, in Japan. Reinhardt, there's also records that show that Reed Astria, the first sword saint, did not have the divine protection, not all known legends are unconditionally true. Of course, it's a fact that Reed Summer built the current Astria family and the name of the sword saint, though. Reinhardt, who was said person's descendant, supplemented what Julius, who was looking at him, had said. However, considering it regarded his ancestor who'd accomplished great deeds that had been left behind in history, Reinhardt's expression when talking about it was somewhat brooding. He also seemed to be worried about Julius when it came to that. It didn't look like he was going to insist on the subject regarding the inherited divine protection. In any case. Subaru, so, the sage was a companion of that sword saint, that's the gist I'm getting. 
Emilia, more accurately, the sage Shaula, and the divine dragon Volcanica. You know, the dragon that protects the kingdom of Ludnica. It said that it started with a promise whereby Volcanica joined forces in battle to seal the Witch of Envy and now even to this day still watches over the kingdom. He'd heard the name of the divine dragon Volcanica many times back at the place where the royal selection candidates expressed their determination. In his memories, the blood of the dragon had always been heralded as something able to bring fertility to ravaged earth, let one overcome any disease, and make one either immense or unrivaled. Julius, it's customary to call the sword saint, the sage and the divine dragon as the three great heroes. You ought to remember that. Subaru, whoa, don't get fired up. I get it, thank you for the explanation. Subaru raised his hand at Julius and Amelia, before then taking a glimpse at Beatrice. When she noticed Subaru's gaze, she slowly shook her head. Unfortunately, Beatrice didn't seem to be familiar with the legend from four hundred years ago. Beatrice was an artificial spirit created by Echidna, but other than the necessary information to maintain the Forbidden Library, she'd been completely estranged from it. He got the impression that she didn't know the behind-the-scenes circumstances around that matter because she'd been fairly impervious to the ways of the world due to shutting herself in for such a long time. Subaru, I'm sorry for bringing the debate to a standstill. Let's continue talking. But, this sage Shaula. After he apologized for interrupting the discussion, Subaru took the initiative to try and bring the conversation back to its original course. But, he noticed something strange whilst he talked, and he couldn't help tilting his head at it. He understood the background of the sage Shaula, a hero from four hundred years ago, but... Subaru, e, what? She's still living? After four hundred years? Emilia, is that so strange? I'm around a one hundred years old as well in reality. Everyone else, dash? On hearing Subaru's mutter, a mystified look appeared across Emilia's face as she put one of her fingers to her lips. The meeting place stirred a little at that murmur, but Subaru on the contrary only replied with a you have a point. If he slowed down and thought about it, the half-elf Emilia's real age was in excess of one hundred years, and Beatrice was a lowly who was around four hundred years old. It felt to him like Puck too had mentioned that he was four hundred years old, in that case, didn't that mean the average age of the Emilia camp was about one hundred years old, perhaps? Subaru, putting aside that pretty shocking fact, what about the sage's current state? Julius, they're alive. On that, it seems that there's no doubt. Subaru, seems? Subaru frowned at Julius' unclear response. But, Julius was not the only one who couldn't answer clearly, everyone around was the same. Especially, those of the royal guard, Ferris, and Reinhardt, who looked troubled. Subaru, well, what does that mean? Julius, their whereabouts are known, and I dare say that them being alive is confirmed too. However, no human being has managed to exchange words with the sage, that's the meaning of it, I guess. Subaru, once again, what does that mean? They knew their whereabouts, and even though it was vague, they'd been able to confirm her as being alive. But, getting in contact with them was impossible. He thought he could put all of those impressions together, but... Julius, currently, the sage Shaula is in the tower near the witch's shrine and has always secluded herself there so to stop those who plan to revive the Witch of Envy. Always, since that time. Subaru, for four hundred years? Julius, for four hundred years. It was an absurd story. Beatrice, who had kept herself secluded in the Forbidden Library for four hundred years was already quite a case, but that sage Shaula, or whatever, was also quite a stubborn individual. Ferris, the tower which the sage Shaula lives in, that's the Pleiades watchtower, right? There, the esteemed sage continues to toil night and day so to prevent the witch's revival. Subaru, MHM, the tower's name makes me think of something, but it's of no importance, do continue. Ferris, even if you're telling me to continue, that's pretty much it you know? The sage Shaula gives it their all and continues to watch over the shrine to ensure the peace of the world, that's what is said. And that is that, Ferris said whilst clapping with a sullen look on his face. Even if he said that that was the end, 
It was clear from his attitude that the story hadn't completely finished there, considering that what he'd said couldn't explain the funeral-like mood around the meeting place. Naturally, there must be some reason why they were like that. Subaru, then, by any chance are they a troubling individual? Anastasia, to ensure peace in the world, the sage Shaula continues tower watch over the witch, their name is known far and wide throughout the world. I've known about him too since the time I was in Kararagai. But, at the same time, the sage Shaula is also known in this other way. Subaru, dash. Anastasia smiled gracefully, pausing between her words for a second, and then, whilst looking at Subaru, who had a bad feeling about this, she spoke. Anastasia, the sage Shaula is someone with extreme trust issues who can't trust a single soul. No matter what the purpose of those approaching the watchtower and the shrine may be, she massacres all of them, or so I hear. They were like that according to Anastasia's explanation. The sage Shaula built the Pleiades watchtower and continued to watch over the witch's shrine. So far there had been many people who had tried to get in contact with the sage, but all their plans failed and they gave up. That was because of the interference of no other but the sage Shaula themselves. Anastasia, the great waterfall in the far east of Ludnica. It seems that the witch's shrine and the watchtower are near there, but the sage doesn't know which of the two people are I'm in to approach, wouldn't you think? Therefore, the sage killed indiscriminately regardless of whether it was a wretched witch cultist who was trying to find the witch's shrine, or a person who was trying to get in friendly contact with the sage of the watchtower. The subjects good or evil, their likes and dislikes, their righteousness or malintent all didn't matter, since that was the best way forward. As a result, there weren't any reports or records left behind of anyone being able to get in contact with the sage Shaula in all of these four hundred years. Ferris, Buyuat, since the situation where they attack anyone approaching has been going on and on, we can just be sure that the sage Shaula is still in the watchtower even now. Subaru, they sure are a damn annoying sage. Ferris, it's neat like that. In fact, there are many witch cultists who try to get near to the shrine, more than you can imagine, Subaru Canyon. The sage sand deals with every single one of them, they're just steadfastly keeping by their goal of preventing the revival of the Witch of Envy. Even though he had stated his positive opinion, Ferris' expression didn't clear up. All the Royal Guard members had the same unrestful look on their face, for that to have happened, there may have been an experience where the sage had dished out a painful lesson to the extent of the royal guard. On the other hand, Subaru nodded at Ferris' sugar-coated opinion. Certainly, if you looked at it from the do-whatever-it-takes-to-achieve-the-goal point of view, it would be incredibly annoying, but if you took into account the evil nature of a witch cultist, it was a natural precaution. Rather, it was because there was someone who continued to keep guard over the Witch of Envy that it was conceivable to even think that this world had some sort of security system in effect against the Witch of Envy. Priscilla, fleeting is the night, mind self cares not about the true colors of the hermit who lives in trepidation insofar as time permits them to. What's important is the fact that they are borrowing mind limited time. Mind self will return post haste to the inn if you continue with this useless prattle. I have to get Shelt to massage my feet. Shelt, why yes ma'am. Priscilla Summer has worked hard and is greatly fatigued. I appreciate that with all my heart, having been embraced and buried in her huge breasts, Shelt had replied with a red face. Priscilla, who'd stroked the boy with the smile of a villainess on her face, hadn't found much worth in this conference in the first place. It was something of a miracle that she'd come all the way here without throwing a tantrum. Felt, even though like I'm not on that princess's side, I also agree that we gotta get back on topic soon. Tell us, about the sage. Felt demanded that they cut back to the main topic, a look of impatience adorning her face. Agreeing with that state of affairs, Subaru turned to look back at Anastasia. Subaru, though we've kept interrupting you over and over, what did you say is up with this reclusive sage? Anastasia, so the story finally goes back to the start. Anastasia clapped her hands. And then, she looked over at the faces of everyone sat at the round table whilst still gently touching her fox scarf. Anastasia, like everyone knows, the sage Shaula helped with the sealing of the Witch of Envy with their unparalleled wisdom and magical power, 
as well as a wide range of insight that said they see through the world with, and knowledge that said they know everything about this world. If both of those are true without exaggeration, then don't you think they should know some way to do something about what the witch cult left Bane as well? Subaru, but, isn't what you're saying just wishful thinking really? Anastasia, does that mean you're against it Natsuki-kun? Even though it seemed like she'd returned his question with another one, an answer for Anastasia's one was difficult. Trying to rely on it if he simply just looked at their title of sage was the honest recourse. In respect to that, Subaru didn't think it was even a bad idea. If they were someone who'd accomplished achievements that went as far as remaining in legend, then maybe they really did know a way to counteract the witch factors of sin. But, a different anxiety had taken a hold of Subaru. The name of the sage Shaula, and the Pleiades watchtower where they lived, those two key words didn't allow him to obediently accept her proposal. Because Shaula and Pleiades were both words which Subaru was familiar with. Subaru, dash. According to Subaru's modern knowledge, Shaula was the name corresponding to the second brightest star of Scorpio. The Pleiades from the Pleiades watchtower was far more explicit, in that was the name of the star cluster known as the Pleiades cluster, its name in Japanese was Subaru. Of course, he didn't think it was anything that denoted Natsuki Subaru, but the name of the celestial bodies which he knew about cropping up in this world was enough for his alert levels to rise to the max. The witch cult sin archbishops, Petelgeurs, Regulus, Sirius, Capella, Alphard, Batonkatos. Currently, all of the Sin archbishops whose names had come to light bore the names of stars from Subaru's world in their names, it was impossible to not hold preconceived notions towards the sage Shaula and the Pleiades watchtower. Ferris, putting aside Subaru Canyon's dissenting opinion. Ferris cut into the conversation in place of Subaru, who'd remained taciturn without coming up with a successful objection. He placed his finger on his cheek, and whilst he assumed his normal attitude with the exception of a stern look in his eyes, he said. Ferris, the view itself of visiting the sage Shaula may be good, but isn't it an issue on how we will do it? Is there any way? Even when no one has managed to reach the watchtower. Felt, the reason no one has is cause the sage is too strong, that's the story right? Felt raised a question at Ferris tantalizing words, whilst she crossed her legs on top of her chair. She gave a fleeting look in Reinhardt's direction. I see if it just meant simply not being a match for the sage's powers, then. Felt, we could manage it if it's Reinhardt, right? He has no other use except being strong, but when it comes to Zhu that, he's in Seyain. Reinhardt, it's unusual that Felt Summer gives me praise, thank you very much. Felt, this is what I meant. Felt sullen leached at Reinhardt's response. However, immediately after that, Reinhardt lowered his eyebrows as if he were troubled. Like that, he spoke out with a but, prefacing it apologetically. Reinhardt, unfortunately, I couldn't reach the watchtower. I lacked the strength. Felt, this guy lacking strength, isn't that a little alarming? Julius, he doesn't mean a lack of combat power, felt Summer. There's no area in this world that Reinhardt's true strength wouldn't reach, I'd say. But, the Pleiades watchtower is a different problem to such impediments. Ferris, so you know the details. Though, if you were a royal guard, that's natural I guess. Ferris's face turned to one of discomfort on hearing Julius follow up Reinhardt's words. Looking at the strained relations between between the three royal guards from the corner of his eye, Subaru spoke out to Reinhardt, and said. Subaru, what was your purpose in trying to meet the sage? Reinhardt, it was an order from the kingdom, for a cure for the disease, that it was. It was about two years ago. Subaru, two years ago. The phrases disease and two years ago allowed Subaru to understand the circumstances. Two years ago from today, the members of the royal family fell ill one after the other to an unknown disease, right at the royal castle. It was an epidemic where no cure was known, most likely, they ordered Reinhardt to get in contact with the sage so to learn a cure for that disease. But he didn't accomplish it, that explained the gloomy faces of the three royal guards. Reinhardt, the watchtower and the shrine, they're at the great waterfall at the eastern edge of Lugnica, 
surrounded by the Augria sand dunes. The watchtower can be seen in the distance from the entrance of the sand dunes. So you shouldn't lose sight of that place, but... Subaru, but... Reinhardt, there are many strange phenomenons that occur frequently in the sand dunes, so that you can't get closer to the watchtower. One theory says that it's due to the miasma that's seeping out from the shrine. Reinhardt, on top of that, the Augria sand dunes have turned into a haunt for witch beasts who are drawn in by the miasma. In that land full of miasma, the ferocity and strength of the witch beasts is off the charts. Even in that sense, going there in the first place is considered to be suicidal. Subaru, so it's a wayward desert with a haunt for witch beasts. For sure it's hell. In addition to the troublesomeness of the sage themselves, there was a desert which not even Reinhardt could cross, and a metric ton of witch beasts which roamed the desert, regarding this, the factors for abandoning the ploy were too many. It was understandable that getting in touch with the sage hadn't been achieved even once over the period of four hundred years. Anastasia, yes, but what if there was a way to cross that hell? Everyone, dash. Everyone raised their faces up at her sudden words just as a gloomy atmosphere had begun to enshroud them. Anastasia smiled in satisfaction on account of having butted in at precisely the right moment. Then, she nodded so that everyone could see. Anastasia, there is, that's why I even bothered to mention the sage's name. Ferris, Anastasia Summer from Kararagai, you know a means to reach the sage who's been in seclusion for four hundred years, at this time? What sort of means is it? Anastasia, you ruin your pretty face. I'm going to explain it to you even without that bristly face. Carelessly turning aside Ferris, who'd gotten himself worked up, Anastasia removed her scarf from her neck. And then, she unrolled her scarf on top of the round table and lifted the head part. Anastasia, I mentioned her before the defensive battle, my artificial spirit, Echidna. This little knows a way to the Pleiades watchtower. That's why we can go and meet the sage of the watchtower. Subaru, dash. Subaru's breath caught on hearing Anastasia's declaration. The artificial spirit Echidna, that being that disguised itself as a fox scarf was the key to reaching the sage. Question mark colon I'm receiving so much attention, ha. Huh? You're making me blush. Saying that, the fox spirit lifted her neck. Subaru didn't know how much he could trust her, just like the witch which she'd borrowed her name from. Arc 5, Chapter 80, Leaving Behind Ripples on the Water's Surface Emilia let her beautiful, crystal-clear voice echo throughout the room as she tensed her face slightly. She spoke to everyone in the room with her bell-like voice, or perhaps she'd said it to persuade herself, either way, she raised both of her slender arms. Emilia, dash. Closing her eyes, Emilia started to concentrate her mana to both of her raised hands. Great magical power swirling around, and the utmost concentration to handle it with precision. If she lacked either of those, she'd be unable to achieve her goal, this was an endeavor which only she could do. Emilia, dash. Countless gazes poured down on Emilia who met her great sorcery head-on with a serious expression on her face. The women and children were huddled together, watching over her actions with bated breath. Some were holding each other's hands, while others had closed their eyes as if in prayer or wishing, they shared only hope and anxiety as they trembled. Subaru, it must be tough on them. And, at the tail end of the same room, Subaru was silently observing Emilia, who was being showered in many complex emotions. The area they were in was a part of the underground facilities in the city of Pristella. Originally, it had been a cellar that had stored emergency provisions. Its current almost empty state was ideal for their intended purpose. There wasn't anything placed in the stone cellar, and its spaciousness seemed to emphasize its bleakness and chilliness. But, it ought to be suitable for their current purpose, precisely because it was that kind of place. Subaru, though, I wouldn't say that's a good thing. Beatrice, quit muttering sentimentalities, I suppose. It wouldn't be good if someone heard you, and you'll also end up messing up Emilia's concentration, in fact. Standing beside Subaru, who'd let that mutter accidentally slip out, Beatrice gave him her advice. The girl, 
who held Subaru's left hand with one hand and played with her drill curls with her other, stared at the white ritual that was being held in front of her eyes. Her pale blue eyes seemed like they were holding back pain in some respect to Subaru. Subaru, since it's Amelia, it will be okay. Don't worry about it so much. Beatrice, don't get the wrong idea, I suppose. Betty is not worried about Amelia, but about Subaru, in fact. Empathizing with the emotions of literally everybody is a bad habit, I suppose. Subaru, I see. The strength of her hand holding his grew stronger, and Subaru bent his lips into the shape of A at the girl's concern. He knew what Beatrice wanted to say, as well as what she was worried about. However, his decision after he'd understood that was based off his current determination. On that point, he couldn't yield. Even though he knew that it'd just be troubling. Amelia, dash. Away from Subaru and Beatrice's hushed exchange of words, Amelia's ritual continued on. Amelia, who was concentrating with all her might, had beads of sweat trickling down her forehead as she panted out misted breaths. She was giving it her everything in mind and body to control the enormous amounts of mana. A pale blue light originating from in between Amelia's hands began to faintly envelop the cellar. Although the cold air was cold enough to fog up his sight, the chill did not pierce into his skin, it was gentle as if it were embracing his heart exposed. He'd heard that people who fell into hypothermia and were on the verge of death forgot about the cold. Extreme cold took away from people the ability to tell the temperature correctly, and granted them warmth as a parting gift before snatching their lives away, he'd heard. Subaru vaguely thought about whether something near to that was happening in this white world, but he immediately shook his head, dismissing it as plain stupid. Pale blue light filled the room, and the cold air converged to its center. And, in the middle of the light, there was. Question mark colon dash. A huge black creature, curled up with its wings folded, a black dragon that was lying down. The strange creatures didn't stop there, there were also flies roughly the size of people gathered around the black dragon. In all they gave you the impression of a nightmarish scene. However, Subaru didn't feel any revulsion at this scene. No. To be precise, he was strongly aware that he shouldn't feel revulsion towards the black dragon and the human flies. They were victims, innocents without any fault. They were victims of the malice from the sin Archbishop of Lust, victims who had been transformed into inhumanities. Subaru, and everyone else, currently didn't know a way to restore their remolded bodies back to normal. That's why they'd chosen this measure. Subaru, it may be that we're just postponing the inevitable, but... Beatrice, it will get us time, and even just that can be a salvation, in fact. Since you're trying to hurry things up, your outlook is getting narrower, so you can't see the options that you'd normally be able to. Not being aware of that, or realizing it later. Both of those are cruelties, I suppose. Beatrice replied with something of a monologue to Subaru's mutters. Her small, feeble sigh contained an insightfulness and sentimentality which only those who'd spent a long, long time thinking could have. Feeling that at the end of her words, Subaru just silently stroked her head without saying a single word back. Beatrice, what is it, in fact? Subaru, it's nothing. No matter how much time they took, they wouldn't necessarily be able to make the right choice. Sometimes, even if you give it some time, there are cases where you wouldn't be able to pick the right choice. Nevertheless, you can act so that the option you choose is the best one. The answer which Subaru had produced to Beatrice's 400 years had been like so. And so he hoped that time which would be brought to the tragedy that struck the city, would also be like so. Subaru, dash. The climax of the cold air that filled the cellar overlapped with Subaru's strong emotions, and finally a sound like the air cracking, or so he thought, resounded throughout. Emilia, it ended up going safely. Emilia turned around whilst breathing out misted breaths. She quickly bowed her head at that place, a little out of breath, behind her, with their whole bodies covered in white crystals, were the lives of all of the souls who had been encased inside of ice. Subaru, TCH. The members of their family were weeping, and their significant others were sobbing in tears. Their sorrowful wails came out before any thanks, 
and they cruelly echoed throughout the cellar. For a very, very long time, their wails continued to echo throughout, as if their sorrow had no end to being separated until goodness knows when from their loved ones. Question mark colon for now, it seems like Emilia Summer's proposal turned out well. Would I be okay to feel relieved by that? Having been informed about the conference at the meeting place, as well as Emilia's subsequent work to freeze the mutation victims, Otto nodded, looking relieved. They were somewhere away from the shelters, in a private room at a hospital, where he'd been carried to. His condition on top of his bed still hadn't changed, with both of his legs painfully wrapped in bandages. Even so, at least he'd managed to leave from the field hospital's treatment, and it was possible to say that his cramping legs looked like they'd improved quite a bit. In fact, Otto's position was as one of the valorous people who'd contributed to the city's defense, so it would have been nice if he'd gotten higher quality medical treatment. However, Otto hadn't told them that, so Subaru opted not to say anything, since he'd probably been considering those around him. Subaru, hospitality that is presumed without saying anything. That's the true meaning of Wabi Shabi. TL note, for what Wabi Shabi means, read, https colon slash slash n dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash wabi shabi. Otto, although you're here, Nasuki san, your mind is elsewhere, it's the same as always, so it's fine, but anyways. Thank you for your hard work, Emilia Summer. Disregarding the nodding Subaru, Otto thanked Emilia for her hard work, who'd come to visit him. She drew her eyebrows down on hearing his thanks, and said, Emilia, nah, it's all right. More importantly, I'm sorry for going through with it on my own without consulting with Otto Kun. But, it was because I'd thought it was something only I could do. Otto, ah, it's fine. I'm not angry since your actions were undoubtedly precious, good deeds. Besides, they were very valuable actions even in a calculating sense. Emilia, calculating? Otto, it probably would have been better if you understood what I meant, but if you don't, even if you don't. No, how can I put it? Regarding that, honestly, it's really difficult for me to decide, which would be better. Subaru, don't think about it, feel it. That is EMT. Emilia wasn't quite aware of the result of her own actions. With some magic words, Subaru serenely brushed Otto aside, who lay perplexed at Emilia's attitude. He then continued by saying more importantly, Subaru, your legs, they seem like they won't be usable for a while, right? Otto, with Pristella's current state, it'll be difficult to treat them more than this, won't it? The number of healing arts users in the city isn't enough to take care of all of the injured. I think it may be better to move to a hospital in another city, but it seems that Kiritaka-san sent out as many messengers as he could to the neighboring cities, and requested for healing arts users. That's why quietly waiting here for a healing arts user from one of those places to come by would perhaps be more prudent than going back to the mansion. Laughing weakly with a taha, Otto would be forced to withdraw from the front lines for a while. Wounds as severe as Otto's couldn't be so easily cured without a mage who could use healing magic fairly proficient. They had to be at Ferris level or Beatrice's when she was in the Forbidden Library. Subaru, Ferris is constantly attending to Crush, and our healing special attack core leader is going around Pristella, the reason being is that family of course. Emilia, those three, the mother and two siblings, right? That person who had the form of a dragon is the father, so it was a family of four, I think. Their special attack core leader wasn't here right now, no, he shouldn't refer to him like that, Garfield is what he meant. Currently, he was going around the city which was short of working hands, and working as hard as he could on the repair work. By nature, Garfield was a kind, well put together young man. Even if he'd felt nothing for the city, if there were people in need, he'd end up helping them without hesitation. But, even so, his commitment to Pristella was second to none. And Subaru could more or less imagine the reason why. Subaru, that he didn't tell us must mean that there are various complex circumstances, I guess. Emilia, yeah, that's gotta be it. Indeed, changing the subject, but don't you think that Garfield and that family resemble each other a bit? Their hair color and eye color are completely identical. Subaru, Emilia Tan, 
you know that the subject hasn't changed right? Amelia, eh? Putting the surprised Amelia to one side, Garfield was in such a condition. Under normal circumstances, he himself should have sustained damage that wouldn't be possible to call minor throughout his body, but due to his divine protection of earth spirits and his boundless physical strength, he had no intention of resting. In addition, Mimi, who'd been a pain to her little brothers with her wounds reopening, was also tagging along with him, so there hadn't been any ruckus around. Otto, well, in regards to Garfield's true feelings, one day he will reveal them on his own I'd imagine. We don't need to try and get it out of him. More importantly. Emilia, hum? Otto, ah, no, since both of you didn't mention it at all, I didn't say anything either, but why does Beatrice San look so moody? Inclining the top half of his body, Otto turned the flow of conversation to a corner of the hospital room, Beatrice was there, puffing out her red cheeks, visibly shaking her head from left to right with a sullen look in her eyes. Subaru nodded and responded with an ah to that question. Subaru, it's because of that, you know. She's in a bad mood because we went to the restoration artist on your errand and ended up being turned away. When you look at it from multiple perspectives, wouldn't it be your fault? Otto, no. You're going too far there, isn't that right, Emilia Summer? Emilia, MHM, you're right. It's a contractor's natural obligation to take care of their spirit. So, the one who needs to cheer Beatrice up has got to be Subaru. Subaru, you mentioned cheering up, but even when you say that, I don't have many memories of Emilia Tan taking care of Puck. Emilia, don't nitpick with that. Besides, I've done tons of stuff when Subaru wasn't there to see. Like grooming his fur, cleaning his claws, cuddling him to sleep. It was doubtful whether that could be referenced as a format on the way of associating with spirits, but Emilia's expression when talking about Puck had turned cheerful. Ever since his sudden parting back at the sanctuary had stabbed her, she'd had a strong expression of grief whenever she recalled Puck, but it seemed that stage had passed too. A crystal stone made of colorless great magic stone adorned Emilia's chest. The same design that she always wore before she was separated from Puck, combined with the beauty of her expression, she had gone back to looking like the same old Emilia. She touched the crystal stone with one of her slender fingers, and said, Emilia, I still don't have enough power to bring Puck back right now, but mine and Puck's contract hasn't been severed, so we can meet again when I accumulate enough mana so that he can manifest. So, just a little bit more patience, eh? Subaru, that too was thanks to one of Biko's achievements, and, well, thanks to Kiritaka's kindness. The reason why Subaru and the others had come to the city of Pristella in the first place had been to obtain a great magic stone. The reality should have been that he'd turn it over or not after some negotiation, but the negotiations had ended up taking an inconceivable detour. In any case, they'd gotten one at present, and were very satisfied. Subaru, so you cheer up too, Biko. Beatrice, I'm not moody, I suppose. It's your misunderstanding, in fact. Humph. Emilia, oh, Beatrice, how adorable. Going all the way to letting out an easy-to-understand sound effect, Beatrice turned her face away from Subaru who was trying to get her to cheer up. Subaru too was in agreement with Emilia, who was feeling the butterflies behind him, however, whether they could talk about her cuteness or not was yet another matter. Otto, it seems that Mr. Darts is a person with a craftsman's temperament, doesn't it? He can't leave a job half done once undertaken, I understand that sort of thing. Subaru, but, still, let's think about how his professionalism has been taken to too much of an extreme. It seems like this guy was working in his workshop all throughout the chaos, doesn't it? He's too much of a workaholic. Otto, that's the craftsman in him, you see. Subaru, the craftsman in him, huh? He didn't really know why Otto seemed to be proud, but when he said that, it seemed to make him feel good, boys were such simple creatures. A craftsman's temperament was cool. However, Beatrice directed an angered look at the nodding Otto and Subaru, and said, Beatrice, yes, but that doesn't mean he should completely ignore his client's words, I suppose. Even when I said I'd pay him double, he didn't say a single damn word, in fact. 
Subaru, giving any indications of listening to what a little girl is saying as she slaps your cheeks with a roll of bills would only work as a reward for those who aren't professionals that are well versed in their trade. You tell her too, Emilia Tan. Emilia, yeah, you shouldn't think like this, Beatrice. If you are going to waste money, I'm going to have to end up confiscating your pocket money. Beatrice, what rude treatment I'm getting from both of you, I suppose. The indignant Beatrice grabbed one of the curtains, wrapped herself in it and hid herself behind it. Following that, Emilia couldn't resist any more, and hugged Biko in the curtain, making her yell out, Nia, in fact. Putting aside their cheerful intermezzo, it wasn't like he didn't understand Beatrice's feelings. That which Otto had commissioned to the restoration artist Darts, and Subaru and the others had tried to recover was the damaged Book of Wisdom. It was the origin as to why its owner, Roswell, had tried so hard to interfere with the future in advance of Subaru, it was natural to be interested in its contents. Subaru, although his interference is subtle, it's since the slippery nature of that guy goes hand in hand. Even though his sabotage had been discovered, Roswell's attitude on the surface hadn't changed from before. Of course, since he had schemed behind that easygoing attitude, remaining alert was essential. However, it was also true that he had an air to him that seemed like the poisonousness had slipped out. Nonetheless, it wasn't the same as going as far as being able to call him a collaborative ally who'd take the role of a bystander. Subaru, if we can at least see what's lying ahead with the Book of Wisdom. If they were able to hold belief that Roswell was not planning anything, regardless of the past, it would be safe to walk the road ahead together. It'd probably also have a bit more of a positive effect for the future of the camp, Subaru, that's why I want to insist on it. Otto, even when I don't endeavor to make such excuses, I and Emilia Summer have more or less the same opinions as Natsuki-kun, so on that point we're fine. Just Garfield, well. He has his personal enmities, so even if he knows the facts, his attitude may not change. By personal enmities was he really referring to the sanctuary or ram? Without touching that subject, Subaru gazed over at Emilia and Beatrice, messing about. Subaru, that book is no stranger to Beatrice either. So, I think I would like to confirm it if it's even possible. Taking her out from the forbidden library, and leaving the past behind are different problems. Otto, did you know that many times I'd thought about trying to consult with you? Subaru, I ain't blaming you for that you know. He thought that recovering the Book of Wisdom, trying to restore it back to normal and trying to do it all on his own was a good judgment on Otto's part, and fundamentally, it was hardly ever that Otto's considerations failed. He was fully aware that he was not a person who acted in self-interest. Subaru, you really ain't suited to be a merchant. Otto, could you leave me alone? More importantly, what about Mr. Darts? Subaru, it may be my greatest job yet, he said. You can defer the fee, so I would like you to let me work on this properly until the end, he said. It was worrying that the deadline hadn't expired, but that guy was a craftsman, so he couldn't possibly say it was impossible. He wanted to believe that he was not the type of craftsman who'd grumble even after the deadline passed. Otto, so in the end, I'll also have to collect the Book of Wisdom, I feel like me staying behind in Pristella has already been decided, don't you? Subaru, Garfield also plans to stay for a while for the repair work and the city defense. Them having been driven away is settled, but what if that's a feint for them attacking again? Since they never quit, those shits, they look like the sort of guys that'd make the same mischief over and over. It seemed like Subaru wasn't the only one who'd recognized that, everyone who was involved hadn't let their guard down either. It was also possible that their aims were to force unnecessary feelings of tension so to torment them. Subaru, even if I bring that up, nothing more can be done about it. Otto, in any case, I think we need to wait and see how things go. As soon as my legs are in a better state, I will go around to check up on various things. However, Otto broke his words off there, as he discussed his future plans. He strenuously lifted the upper part of his body up from the bed, and looked up at Subaru, who'd closed one of his eyes. And, as he struck his temple with one of his fingers, he said. Otto, I shall say this clearly, I'm against this. 
Subaru, well, I thought you'd say that. Subaru gave a wry smile at Otto's declaration. That he would say that and be against it, was an attitude which Subaru had predicted. After all, Otto Suwin had evaluated Natsuki Subaru correctly. Subaru himself was more aware than anyone of his own helplessness, but there weren't many who clearly understood his shortcomings. At best, it was Beatrice and Otto. Perhaps Patrash a bit. And although now wasn't the time for him, Ferris mayhaps too. Therefore, he had anticipated that Beatrice and Otto, from their camp, would have been against it. He believed if Patrash could speak, then she'd have probably been similarly against it. However, Subaru, if you know me that much, then you should know my answer. Otto, in truth, Beatrice Sand's moodiness isn't only because of Mr. Darts, right? Subaru, Wheel, I'm not so sure. As you might expect, even I don't understand what's in the depths of Biko's heart. When Subaru feigned his innocence with a shrug of his shoulders, Otto's face turned into one of exasperation. Of course, when it came to him and his sharp hearing, he shouldn't be lacking in knowledge of legends slash rumors, he must know all too well the riskiness of Subaru's choice. Adding on to what he'd said, Subaru prefaced what he was going to say to Otto with an I'm sorry. Subaru, I will go to see that sage or whatever they are, with that white fox guide for a little while. He smiled as he said that. Question mark colon come in. When he knocked on the door as a courtesy, just in case, a calm voice replied to him from the inside. It was a familiar voice, but one that lacked in spirit. Subaru felt excessively annoyed at it. Question mark colon it's you, Subaru? Subaru, is it bad that it's me? Question mark colon it's strange, now when I see your face, I feel terribly relieved. Subaru, Blira. He walked into the room, wrapping up the reproachful words that he'd exchanged at the start with that action. Even while he showed that attitude, there was consideration in the way Subaru closed the door behind him. Closing the door without making a sound was the minimum amount of courtesy for those who slept inside. Question mark colon if they would wake up because of the noise, it'd be so much better. Subaru, if so, would you give me a round of applause or something? That'd be a priceless scene. Gluttony who was let to be at large would get more and more pissed off. Question mark colon humph. Giving a relaxed smile, Subaru inclined his head without meeting his eyes. Then he looked around the room and narrowed his eyes at the row of beds. A simple bed, and a thin blanket, that was all the charity given to the people who slept there. And Subaru knew that more than that wasn't even necessary. The people who slept here were forgotten from memory, cut loose from daily life, and only remained left behind as imperfect beings that just weren't dead. Subaru, Julius. I'm not one to say it, but you shouldn't spend so much time here. Julius, dash. Subaru, even if you keep looking at them, you can't remember that which you can't remember. That applies to both a beloved little sister, as well as someone who is truly like your other half. Subaru called out to the young man, Julius, without using any words of comfort. He was sitting at a corner of the bed rows, at one of the bedsides located the furthest away. He lifted his face up, him still full of sorrow which he couldn't conceal from his handsome features. Julius, knowing that in my head and knowing that with my heart are completely different things. I don't mean to be conceited, but so far I'd never thought of myself as an emotionally driven, big-headed person. Me not realizing that until this happened is a lack in my self-awareness. Subaru, dash. Whilst he spoke, Julius looked down at the bed right next to him. Naturally, one of the victims of appetite who'd lost their name was sleeping there as well, and their consciousness and memories had been completely cut away from the world. That's why Julius Euculius didn't remember this person, the slender-faced young man with long purple hair who was his own little brother, Joshua Euculius. Julius, Joshua, eh? He can call his little brother's name because Subaru had told him his name, and the relation he had to him. The victims of the authority of Gluttony Dash, when it had been reported that many unidentifiable, comatose people had been found, Subaru had been convinced that they had suffered the same damage as Rem. And he himself may have not forgotten those forgotten. 
Relying only on that slim hope, he'd gone to the hospital room and discovered the sleeping Joshua. Julius, it's strange. Although there's enough in common to be able to conclude he is definitely a blood relative after listening to your story, within me there's not a single memory of my little brother. Julius closed his eyes without showing any emotion on his face. Joshua was the only he knew from those who were found. Amongst the victims of gluttony. He couldn't find the other thirty-plus victims even in his memory, and thus they continued to sleep without anyone even mourning for them, or worrying about their well-being. If you thought about it, you could probably say that Joshua, who had his big brother worrying about him, was one of the lucky ones. Even in these circumstances, where he was forgotten by the big brother he loved so dearly, and said big brother went to the hospital room so to cling on to his brotherly love in name only, and called out to his little brother without true emotion. Even if he was forgotten, even if he forgot him, even if he wasn't there in his memories, even if there were just facts, it was just heart-wrenching. Subaru, fucking hell. He should have known. He really should have. That the sin Archbishop of Gluttony's authority was the most despicable evil in this world. Along with wrath, who twisted people's emotions at will. Along with lust, who broke people's dignity as well as their form, before then trampling over them. Along with greed, who denied everything besides himself, imposing his egocentric sense of omnipotence, along with sloth, who indulged himself in using the word diligence to paint over the lives of others with his selfish love. They were the worst evil without doubt, not a single one of them deserved to live. How could he stand those beings that profaned the lives of absolutely everyone like gluttony did? Subaru, staying here will only make you feel depressed. Don't make me keep saying it. Only unpleasant things passed through his mind. He had put that irritation into words, and called out to Julius. When he heard those words, Julius stood up, and touched his forgotten little brother's slender chest, and said. Julius, he's. Breathing. He's alive. It's strange. Subaru, yeah that's right. But he doesn't eat, nor does he need to go to the bathroom. He also doesn't need to take a bath. He doesn't laugh either. Julius, he doesn't feel the sorrow of being forgotten. Either. That may be a blessing. Subaru, a blessing? Subaru raised his eyebrows in response to that word which Julius spilled out. Looking back at him, Julius slightly curved the crooks of his lips up, and whilst giving a weak smile, he said. Julius, if you don't realize you've been forgotten, you needn't fear the anxiety of being left behind. It's really hard to bear having what should have been close relationships with people. Being cut off from one side. Subaru, dash. Julius, Subaru. Being forgotten, and forgetting. I wonder, which of those is the most painful? Subaru, how? Subaru's throat clogged up at that question. It didn't clog up due to the answer. He'd had the answer ready in an instant. So what had obstructed Subaru's words hadn't been bewilderment. It had been fury. Subaru glared at Julius who had a cynical smile on his face. Subaru, how would I know? Don't mess about, stop absorbing yourself in these things. Julius, Subaru? Subaru, forgetting, being forgotten, to hell with both. Don't try and order such painful things, are you that negative? Making that damn face like you're the most unfortunate person in the whole world, want to try and compare your misfortunes with mine so far? Whatever the case, I would win? Julius, dash. Julius became speechless at the sudden change that took over Subaru, who had raised his voice, jabbing his finger at him. Opening his eyes wide in surprise, he couldn't say anything to Subaru who suddenly become enraged. And as he looked Julius keeping his silence, Subaru lowered his finger and shrugged his shoulders. Subaru, don't make such a despairing face. I know you're suffering, and I know that you were forgotten, and you have nowhere left to go. But, I'm sorry but I won't let you show your weak side. Julius, dash. Subaru, have you forgotten, Julius? No, do not forget, Julius. Subaru glared at Julius whilst he bit his lips in frustration. He placed his hand on his chest, and once again made a declaration like the ones he'd done. Subaru, 
My eyes know your strength. My shame knows it. Even if everyone has forgotten, Julius, dash. He couldn't breathe, the feeling of his blood going up to his head didn't vanish. Really, how long had it been since he'd gotten this pissed off? Since Regulus. He was astonished that not even half a day had passed since then. How much had this turmoil in Pristella burdened his heart and lungs? Julius, H.H., ha-ha. Subaru, ha? Julius, ha-ha. No, you truly are a one-of-a-kind man. I've realized that once more. Getting rid of the startled face he'd had up until now, Julius suddenly bent over in laughter. Giving in to the urge to laugh, Julius continued to laugh before the disgruntled Subaru. And when the urge gradually settled, Julius let out a long sigh. Julius, I see, you're right. It doesn't mean that absolutely everything was left behind, right? Subaru, rather than saying being left behind, I'd say you're in front by around three horse lengths. Julius, is three horse lengths enough? Subaru, I'm gonna fucking beat your ass. If it's me and Biko as a team, it'll be completely different for you. He flipped him his middle finger, and spat at Julius who was starting to get back to his usual manner. Julius gracefully dodged his spit, and gave him a bow, whilst saying I see. Julius, then, I will try to have faith in those big words. Subaru, MHM, do so. As much as you can too, do great deeds so that you surprise everyone when their memories come back. This time at that smuggish attitude, Subaru raised his thumb up and then turned it down in provocation. Faced with that coarse gesture, the finest knight that only Subaru knew, smiled gracefully. Julius, so, first of all, more so than anyone else, I will try to strive to surprise you. You, who remembers me. Saying that, he fortified his intent of accompanying him to the Pleiades watchtower that awaited them. Arc 5, Chapter 81, The One Who Fills the Vessel of Greed. Arc 5, Star What Make History. Arc 5 Finale, Chapter 81, The One Who Fills the Vessel of Greed. A series of witch cult riots arose in Pristella, the Watergate city. The scars of the battle remained throughout the city, along with the tragedy that struck its inhabitants. There were numerous functions of the city that had yet to be fully restored to compensate for the loss of personnel. Those problems still remained, yet the situation was settling down and beginning to move towards the next story. For Natsuki Subaru too, the many problems of the city ate his heart. Nevertheless as he observed the city after the withdrawal of the witch cult, he felt that he could presume that perhaps he'd been able to contribute a little to that conclusion. Subaru, although there are still many unresolved problems. The scars that were left by the Sin Archbishops, especially amongst those left by lust and gluttony, were enormous. The inhabitants, who'd had their bodies mutated by the authority of lust. Their bodies had been placed in a temporary state of death by Emilia and were awaiting the moment to awaken in a shelter deep within the city. And most of the people who had been attacked by the appetite of gluttony even now found themselves in an endless sleep, and even their bonds with those who would expect their awakening from the bottom of their heart had been snatched away. Emilia's expression, who had proposed a way of postponing the solution to the problem of the transformed citizens, was painful. Julius's anguish, who had lost his place and had suffered with how things were, was beyond imaginable. And there was no need to mention the wounds in the hearts of the city's people who were the ones most affected. Everybody had been hurt. It was Subaru's duty to do everything he could to heal those wounds. And Subaru, there are still problems I have to take care of. To solve the final unsolved problem, Subaru nodded. Only this, was what Subaru had to do. Subaru, Julius will go with us. Anastasia, I see, then I can feel more calms well. After he'd finished with his various discussions, Subaru returned to the conference room and was welcomed by Anastasia. Anastasia was the only one left at the round table in the conference room. The discussion on the main topics had been held there several hours ago. Some of them had already returned to the inn, and others were preparing to leave Pristella. Even without that, it had been a tiring day. 
There was no need to rest on the hard round table and spend your time in the darkness of the empty shelter. Subaru, what? And yet, she had stayed here, waiting for someone to arrive. It wasn't that he had been sure of it. But, Subaru too had vaguely thought that she would have been here. After all, right now she shouldn't have felt comfortable anywhere. Subaru, with this, those who are aiming for the Pleiades watchtower are Amelia, me and Biko. In addition to that, if we add Julius and you, there are five of us in total. Anastasia, aren't Char making a mistake in the number of participants? After all, there aren't five of us, there are six of us. It would be a problem if you forgot my adorable echidna. She unrolled the scarf from around her neck and spread it over the round table whilst making her dance. The white fox scarf was obedient towards her master's harmless game, just like a doll. She didn't just look like it, though. Subaru, I didn't forget. That is why. We're five. Anastasia? Dash. As he leaned his back against the door of the conference room, Subaru told that to Anastasia, who was hoisting out her scarf. Hearing those words, Anastasia's smile froze. Her elegant smile vanished as if it had melted, and then she tilted her head slowly. Pulling the scarf to her lips, accompanied by a mystified look on her face. A-N-A-S-T-A-S-I-A, oh, that's weird. How did you know I'm not Anna? Anastasia's tone changed completely, so much that it was clearly noticeable. It was terribly amicable and familiar, but the essential part was completely vacant. Although her voice was the same, it was clearly different. Subaru, if you want to hide it, you should do a better act of doing so. Surely, as far as I know, Anastasia is the most rational and realistic of the candidates, but she doesn't have an attitude as lacking in humanity as you do, nor is her way of speaking like that. Echidna, I've been observing Anna for some time, so I should have been able to imitate her, but it didn't go as well as I had thought. You are the second one to notice. Subaru, the second? Echidna, Al Khan also noticed. He called me a witch. How could he do such a cruel thing? Subaru, that's... That was quite the fitting term, Subaru felt admiration for Al. Anastasia's echidna and the witch echidna were essentially different, but it was impossible that they were not related, there was no doubt in that. Perhaps it had been Al's insight, something only he could have noticed. He was someone summoned to this other world, just like Subaru. If the power of the Witch of Envy was connected to the other world summons, Al could also be related to the witch. Usually, he would have talked to him more about it, but... Subaru, anyway, that doesn't matter now. The most important problem is you, who hijacked Anastasia's body and tried to make it yours. Echidna, saying hijacked sounds pretty drastic. At a glimpse, the current situation is bad, that appears to be a fact, but I must say that it is unfortunate that you misinterpret it that way. Seriously, it's painful. Subaru, that way, you make it sound like it's not the case. Echidna, in actuality, it's not true, even if you can't see it. I only borrowed Anna's body, it was inevitable. If I hadn't, it would have been the end for the both of us. After that, I continued to use Anna as a vessel, not out of my free will. Subaru, too long. In summary? Echidna, it was fine to borrow her body, but I can't get out. I see, this is Scarf Donor, on this occasion, he'd put it as a Ridna, but he'd never thought that a Ridna had been unrelated to Echidna, yet in their interaction now he'd sensed no clear traces of Echidna. Even though the way she lengthened things was the same as the original. Subaru, for now, I'll try to listen to your story. Moving his back away from the door, Subaru positioned himself to talk with Eridna. Now that he had uncovered her identity she couldn't leave him alive, it seemed safe to assume that the danger of her setting that trap had gone. Subaru sat on the other side of the round table, facing Eridna. Subaru, to begin with, borrowing her body? What kind of situation is that? Echidna, to put it simply, I overwrite my existence in Anna's odd, and I borrow her freely, that's the situation. In this state, I can control Anna's body at will, I can also manipulate Anna's gait, which is defective from the start, and use magic. Subaru, 
What do you mean it is defective from the start? Echidna, you're quite curious, aren't you? I understand the greed of wanting to know something so I won't blame you, but wanting to know so much about another girl and another spirit, won't it make your Amelia Summer and your Beatrice jealous? Subaru, I don't need your concern, even if they get jealous, they'd be cute anyways, so that's fine. Stop stretching things out and tell me. When Subaru tried to slam the round table with his fingers in displeasure, Aridna shrugged. Then, she folded the removed scarf carefully and said Anna is. Echidna, a girl who was born with a defective gait. I think you already know that the gait is an organ that absorbs mana from the atmosphere and emits the mana into the body, but the ability to absorb mana doesn't work quite well in Anastasia. She's someone who suffers from chronic mana deficiency. There is a person who has this defect of not being able to release mana, although you should already have an idea of who I am talking about. Subaru, I don't know if that's bad or not, and I don't know who you're referring to either. Echidna, oh really? That is unexpected. By the way, the one who has the deficiency of not being able to release mana is the descendant of the sword saint. Although in his case, the amount he absorbs is unusual, and it adds to his physical ability apparently, so there is no real harm. Subaru, Reinhardt? Subaru raised his eyebrows in surprise at the words of Aridna. But, on second thought, he also felt that Reinhardt had said something like that somewhere before. Reinhardt couldn't use magic, only in that aspect was he inferior. But instead the power of his gate to absorb was strong, I see, so that was the reason why it was bad for him to approach spirits, including Beatrice. Subaru, well, even without magic, it's not that he doesn't have ways of attacking from a long distance, to begin with, in his case it wouldn't be surprising if he defeated his opponents with the pressure of his sword, so it doesn't seem like a disadvantage at all. But, let's talk about Anastasia. Echidna, I'm not trying to pretend, but it's my habit to want to talk about what I know. So, the conversation. Right, it was about Anna's constitution. When it comes to Anna's gait, its function to draw in is underdeveloped and doesn't work well. Therefore, she can only use magic by absorbing the mana that was initially in her body. If she's exhausted, she would have to use her rod, which is the source of life. I can't let her commit such madness, can I? That's why Anna can't use magic. Subaru, but, that you can use magic after borrowing her body makes no sense. The fact that the mana that originally was in her body was scarce doesn't change. Or is it that you can use the minute amounts of mana? Echidna, dash. Subaru, don't be quiet, answer. Echidna, I couldn't save her life in the first place without cutting down her life, I had no choice. However, the discussion between Anna and me on this matter is over. Someone like you, who has nothing to do with it, has no right to say anything about it. You wouldn't want me to say anything about your contract with Beatrice either, would you? She'd hit the mark. Subaru and Beatrice's relationship, along with their contract, belonged only to them. He didn't want others to intervene in that, and even if they did, he would reject them. If Anastasia and Aridna claimed the same condition, Subaru couldn't say anything. That was an absolute connection between the contractor and the spirit that must not be disturbed by others. Echidna, on this occasion, I borrowed her body out of Anna's own will, it was an emergency after all. You know that a sin archbishop came to the city hall, right? To drive her away, it was necessary for Al Khan and me to use all our strength. It was necessary to make a decision under pressure. Subaru, and what's that about you not being able to get out? Echidna, yes, there's the current problem. At Subaru's words of concern, Aridna clapped her hands and smiled. Although her appearance was that of Anastasia's, her smile clearly showed that her contents were different. What a strange thing, Subaru thought, but he immediately put that sentiment behind. At last, their talk was about to cover the main question. In front of Subaru, Aridna touched Anastasia's thin chest. Echidna, this is not the first time I've borrowed Anna's body this way. It hasn't been many times, though. Anna and I don't have an official contract. That's also because of the problem with her gait, I didn't want to put a constant burden on Anna. Although even among spirits, I pride myself for being someone who consumes little energy. 
When it comes to just being there, I don't need mana from a contractor. Subaru, I see. My Biko wants to hold my hand three times a day. Echidna, two of the times is just because she wants to take your hand, probably. It's all about intimacy, so, about our talk, there weren't many occasions where I borrowed Ayana's body in such circumstances. At most, this must be the fourth or fifth time. My relationship with her has lasted for almost eleven years now, so it's not so surprising, is it? Subaru, well, who knows? Considering that you say it's at a pace of once every two years, isn't that as low as the rate you catch flu at? Echidna, that's harsh. Aridna let out some stifled laughter, her laughter was the same as that of the witch Subaru knew. In that moment, he'd become scared that Anastasia's figure seemed like a double of Echidna's. Echidna's existence left a weight inside Subaru that wouldn't disappear. If possible, he never wanted to see her again, because of Beatrice. In addition to that, it would hurt Julius a lot to know that the real Anastasia had disappeared. He also wanted to avoid that. Subaru, then, what happened, Echidna-san, who's as annoying as a flu? Echidna, I don't know what that flu is you're referring to, but in any case, I don't have much experience. So, without any precedent, I don't know why this happened either. I can't separate my consciousness from Anna's body. As a result, Anna is sleeping deep within her odd. Aridna spoke as she touched her chest, as if the odd were inside her, and then she looked at her scarf lying limp on the round table. As long as scarf donor's consciousness was inside of Anastasia, her scarf should truly just be a fox pelt, but... Echidna, I was able to do pretty well as a puppeteer in the conference room, wasn't it? Subaru, there were many people who were deceived by the impact of your appearance. Though, there were also several people besides me who thought it was strange. Or so he thought. Perhaps only Subaru, who was familiar with artificial spirits, had felt that strange sensation. Subaru, even if you didn't notice it in that place, people who are deeply related to her will immediately realize that you're not Anastasia. Echidna, and yet, only people with a superficial relationship like you and Al Kun could tell. Doesn't that mean that my imitation of Anna went well? Subaru, right now, Ricardo and the kittens are busy with their own problems. Julius too. Echidna, dash. At those words, Scarf Donor narrowed her eyes. In response to her reaction, Subaru made a suspicious face, but Scarf Donor sighed immediately. Echidna, after all, Julius is Anna's knight? From the flow of the conversation in the conference room, I thought it was most likely, but... The authority of gluttony is terrifying. It could even steal my memories, and I am supposed to be an existence that's outside the norm. Subaru, you... What do you want to do with Anastasia? Echidna, dash. Subaru, on the question of whether or not you intended to hijack Anastasia's body, honestly, even if we talk on this, nothing can be done about it, so I won't hound you. I will say it clearly, even if you say it's not like that, I have no basis to believe you, but... That she could not return Anastasia's body... Was unacceptable. For the finest night it meant losing one of his hopes. The spiritual death of a candidate he did not want to use that in the battle for the royal selection. Subaru, I won't give up on bringing that person back to normal, Echidna. Echidna, you can rest assured. I am not so arrogant to think that I can take over Anna's body and live in her place. Faced with the enraged Subaru who moved forward with determination, Scarf Donor said that with pessimism. With a sad expression, she embraced Anastasia's small, thin body. Echidna, you know, I like Anna, the more than ten years I spent by her side without a contract weren't mere observation cravings. I don't know if these are the right feelings, but I have feelings similar to that of a guardian or family, I'm aware of that. If possible, I want her to be well, and more than anything, to be happy. Subaru, dash. Scarf Donor spoke fluently and indifferently as always, but in her appearance as she spoke and touched Anastasia's delicate body in which she now found herself, there seemed to be affection. Just as Puck felt love and affection for Emilia, and Beatrice for Subaru, Scarf Donor may have felt the same for Anastasia. If so. Subaru, so, 
that's your real reason for wanting to meet the sage. Echidna, that's very perceptive of you. I don't care about the people that had their names eaten by gluttony. I just want to know a way to return this body back to Anna. That's why for that I will make use of you all as well. Subaru, is there even a guarantee that the sage knows a way for that? Echidna, there's no guarantee. But, when it comes to the sage which is said to see everything, and know everything, there's a chance. I'll wager on the chance that they can is the most likely, that is all. No words of immediate rebuttal came out from Subaru to scarf Dona's words, full of ironclad determination. Without a doubt, it was a terribly egocentric, selfish conclusion she came to. However, scarf Dona was acting to attain her goal in her own scarf Dona like way. Thus, what Subaru needed to confirm was Subaru, do you really know a way of reaching the sage in the Pleiades watchtower? Echidna, of course. Subaru, you ought to have had a character description saying I have no memories of the past. Why does someone like you know a way to get to the watchtower that no one else knows? It makes no sense. Echidna, I know only what I know. It's bothersome that you ask me for a basis for that, but it's like so. If you want to adorn those words, then it's because getting there is fate, I guess. Subaru, fate? Fate decided by whom? Echidna, my creator, perhaps. Scarf Dona's reply was lofty, but as far as Subaru was concerned, it was the worst kind of reply. If the creator she spoke of was Echidna, then the one who'd scorched the way to the watchtower and to the spirit's memories could only have been Echidna. That meant that there was something related to Echidna and the Pleiades watchtower. For sure, that gave him a bad presentiment and a certain expectation towards the sage's knowledge. Echidna, I wonder, did that convince you? Scarf Dona inquired this of Subaru, who'd remained silent, having come to that one conclusion. Whilst hesitating on whether to agree immediately, Subaru let out a long, deep sigh. Subaru, not that I'm extremely convinced, but at least I do understand. You have your own goals and things you need to do, and it doesn't interfere with our own goals. Echidna, indeed. We both have things we want to ask to the sage. That's why we will cooperate in getting down to them. There's nothing strange about that. Subaru, stop it. You became sketchy as soon as you said that. Echidna, that's rather harsh. It seemed like he'd go crazy if he kept talking with Scarf Donor with Anastasia's form for any longer. In any case, they'd end up having plenty of time to keep each other company whilst they headed off to the Pleiades watchtower. The Augria Sand Dunes, where the watchtower was, were at eastern end of the world map, it was a long journey. Subaru, I'm slowly getting used to you, so give me a bit more time. Echidna, it's it, even if you're done like this. Really though, Natsuki-kun is too cold to ruin such cute girls. You've hurt my feelings. Jiez. Wrapping the scarf around her neck, scarf donor mimicked Anastasia's behavior. Indeed, it was a performance well done, but... Subaru, your intonation of I is wrong. Also, your Kansai dialect is too smooth, compared with the people that I know from Kararagai, it lacks authenticity. Echidna, authenticity. It was an extremely small difference. Scarf Dona rightfully croaked out those words to confirm what Subaru had told her, and eventually let out a sigh as if she'd given up. From Subaru's side, there was nothing he needed to confirm to Scarf Dona. And, concerning returning Anastasia's body back to her, that would depend on the sage of the Pleiades Watchtower's attitude. However, Subaru, don't tell Julius or any of the others about the fact that you're borrowing Anastasia's body. Echidna, I don't mind, but Natsuki-kun's request is unexpected. Subaru, I don't want to cause an unnecessary uproar in this situation that is already enough of a mess. Also, if they find out it was really you, and not Anastasia, that proposed this idea, Ricardo, and some of the others, may oppose it immediately. It'll be a bother for me too if we can't go to the watchtower, albeit the selfishness of it. There was a chance that Ricardo, Mimi and the others would be anxious about Anastasia's body and stop her. In that case, they may be forced to give up their journey to the watchtower, 
even if it was an excellent solution to their problems. That would be a problem for Subaru and his group as well, as they wanted to save the victims of the authorities. Subaru, it would be great if the victims of gluttony, lust, and of course, the issue with you and Anastasia could be solved by the sage. If all goes well, then Ricardo and the others wouldn't be able to complain afterwards. No, even if they do complain, I won't listen to them. Echidna, like Hoshin saying, the account books are balanced in the end. Subaru, I agree with Hoshin-san on that. As expected of Hoshin, who may have come from the same place as he did, saying fine things. Subaru, well then. On that note, their discussion was over for now. In the worst case, if Scarf Donor had intended to exploit Anastasia's body, there would have been the chance that last battle in Pristella would have unfolded here, that it didn't happen made him relieved. It was for that reason alone that that question came at the time which Subaru had let his guard down. Echidna, by the way, Natsuki-kun. Subaru, hm? Subaru turned around just as he'd put his hand on the door to try and leave the conference room. Still leaning on the round table chair, Scarfdone acutely tilted her head like Anastasia would towards Subaru. Echidna, there's someone else, isn't there? Someone else, who you want to ask the sage about a way of getting them back. Subaru, dash. Echidna, one way or another, in Pristella there are people with similar symptoms, right? It's best to take around about one person along who exhibits those symptoms so to inquire on how to get them back to normal. With his hand still on the doorknob, Subaru's throat, Subaru's breathing, froze. Scarf Donia, in the end, continued to look on indifferently at Subaru, whose expression had stiffened, his eyes wide open. Echidna, what would you like to do? This depends entirely on ya, Natsuki-kun, Subaru, I. Echidna, in any case, we're stopping by the Margrave Mathers mansion, right? If we don't prepare for the trek across the Augria sand dunes, we won't get the approval to be able to go to the watchtower. When we do that, your sleeping beauty ought to be there. Subaru, dash. Echidna, I don't think it's a bad thing. We'll save everyone, it's just about who'll be the first amongst them. It'll be okay if Natsuki can allows this sort of luxury. Scarf donor's indifferent voice, for some reason, seemed like a terribly demonic temptation for Subaru. He understood what she was trying to say. And though, without a doubt, he wanted to follow with what she'd said, he wasn't able to reply back to her immediately. Surely that was because. Question mark colon Subaru. Subaru, HK. On hearing his name being called out, Subaru looked up in surprise. Emilia and Beatrice stood in front of Subaru, whose breath had caught inside his throat. The two of them widened their eyes at Subaru's reaction, and Emilia tilted her head and asked him, What's the matter? Emilia, you said you would go and see Julia San, you said that, but since you weren't at the hospital ward, I ended up getting worried. What have you been doing? Subaru, no, nothing really. You know, with that guy, he was pulling such a long face that I couldn't bear to see him for long. So, it wasn't a change of atmosphere but a change of view. Emilia, really? I think Julius has a handsome face though. Subaru, Emilia Tan thinks that too. Emilia, ah, but, Subaru's face is great too, I think it's a fine face. You know, the kind where the more you look at it, the more you like it, or, yeah, I think that sort of thing. Subaru, that follow-up is so painful. Emilia fretfully corrected herself, but the way she said it was an issue too. With a bitter smile, Subaru dropped his shoulders. This time, Beatrice, who stood silently by Amelia's side, had something on her mind. Beatrice kept looking behind Subaru, towards the shelter behind him. Just as if she had an inkling about the conversation that he'd had there. Beatrice, Subaru, if you're going to do something dangerous, you should call Betty, I suppose. If I were to leave you alone and it got dangerous, Betty would be beside herself, in fact. Subaru, that's the same affection I always feel for you. Since you're so cute, I get uneasy thinking about how long it will be before you are carried off by a kidnapper who was looking to steal some candy. Beatrice, 
Betty is not such a cheap-looking spirit, I suppose. Don't make fun of me. Getting rather angry, Beatrice approached up to him to slap him over and over again. As she did, Subaru hoisted Beatrice up into his arms, who let out a surprised fire, and walked towards where Amelia was. Beatrice, re-release me, put me down, I suppose. Ah, but, put me down without scooting off, in fact. Subaru, that's pretty difficult, so you'll have to stay like this for now. Beatrice's body was light, but strangely warm. It was the prevailing view that children have higher body temperatures, but with Beatrice being a little girl, was she also like that? Even though she was a spirit. Amelia, who was by his side, stared at Subaru's face from the side, who was smiling wryly in that manner. As she watched him with upturned eyes, Subaru asked her, What's up? Subaru, is it so unusual that me and Biko are playing? Amelia, no. In this last year, it's no longer unusual at all, but, I think the current you is making a disconcerted face that was pretty unusual for this last year. Subaru, dash. Is that so? Although I can't say that everything is muy bien, most of the problems have been resolved, and for me now, my facial muscles have relaxed well enough, or so I think. Amelia, if you say so, I'll believe you, but... Amelia cast her long eyelashed eyes down at Subaru who was molding his cheeks into shape as if they were like rubber. Then, she slowly continued her words that she'd cut off. Amelia, when you decide what to do, absolutely let me know. And, if you don't find the answer no matter what, make sure to consult with me, okay? It would be nice if you promised me just that. Subaru, a promise, huh? Amelia, yes a promise that Subaru is not good at keeping. You are good at making them, don't you think? Subaru, whoa, that's unusually venomous for Amelia Tan. He received a scathing evaluation from Amelia due to the results of his past promises up until now. Then, Amelia, with a faint grin on her face, held out her pinky finger. Seeing that, Subaru instantly slung Beatrice across his shoulder, and joined his own pinky finger with hers as Beatrice screamed out, What are you doing, I suppose? Subaru, pinky promise, cross my heart and hope to die. Stick a one thousand needles in my eye. Amelia, cross my heart and hope to die. TL note, so, I've anglicized this part a bit more, because pinky promises are slightly different in Japanese. In Japanese, the literal thing Subaru said was, finger cut off, Ten thousand fist punches, whoever lies has to swallow a thousand needles. And Amelia replies with finger cut off. Obviously this would sound like nonsense in English, hence the localization. Their fingers separated from each other's. Whilst sticking out her finger, Amelia grinned at Subaru. Amelia, Subaru, how many needles will it be in total with this? Subaru, well, I don't think it reaches up to ten thousand. Amelia, in which case, make sure you really don't get up to 10,000 of them, okay? Subaru replied with a curt yeah to Amelia's prayer-like words. With that answer, she'd feel an absolute sense of security, such a thing for Amelia would probably be impossible. She hadn't even planned to make the promise in the first place. That's why her promise now was a warning to Subaru. Echidna, it'll be okay if Natsuki can allows this sort of luxury. Scarf Donor's final temptation floated back into his mind. Could Subaru allow this sort of luxury? Could he really allow it? Who would allow that to him? To him, who depended on such things. Subaru, I will have an answer. By the time I return to the mansion, I definitely will. Even so, it is what you would expect from someone who had the same name as that witch. In truth, taking advantage of the weakest parts in people was her forte. Subaru, truly, how odious. Beatrice, you said something right now, I suppose? Subaru, no, with the way I am carrying you, I can touch or slap Biko's bum as much as I want. Beatrice, Kia, in fact. L let go of me, I suppose. Put me down, in fact. Slowly and gently, like you were admiring a flower. I suppose. Subaru, ha 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 ha. Beatrice, stop slapping my buttocks whilst laughing, 
In fact, with Beatrice kicking up a fuss over his shoulder, Subaru set out after the slender back who'd gone up ahead of him. Turning her face back every so often, Emilia seemed like she wanted to join them, although he had been blessed, although he had been saved. If only she were here, he thought, marveling at his own greed. The curtain fell on Natsuki Subaru's battle in the Watergate city. And now, it silently turned to the next story that led to the Tower of Sand.